Hey everyone. Welcome back to another video. Here's part 4 of small changes. As always, huge thanks to all of my Patreons. I really wouldn't be able to make any of these videos without your immense support. As always, the full story is already out over on Patreon for you guys along with a couple other stories as well. Anyways, enjoy the video. Chapter 32, Familiar Wars. Kisuke sighed morosely, absently dangling his leg over the side of the wall he was stationed at. Guard duty was a notoriously dull position to have as a shinobi, for a profession that usually offered excitement and action, guarding a long length of wall was the exact opposite of that. What was worse was the fact that he wasn't even guarding Kusagak or soil like he normally might. No, instead he was in the ass end of Hai no Kuni in a periphery town near the border between the two nations. He wasn't usually the type to have an opinion on the various political shifts taking place throughout the nations but even he didn't see much point in this fruitless war with Kanahagakur. He wouldn't comment though, that kind of insubordination was grounds for discharge or even execution if his opinions were found to be too traitorous. However Kuza had only barely recovered from the Third Shinobi War where the Yellow Flash had decimated their ranks like cutting down blades of grass. Still, he did his duty, sitting up on that wall as he lazily watched the sun begin to set behind the horizon, the next shift would be soon and he would be relieved. It was a good thing too, this dry heat was beginning to affect him, a few minutes ago he swore he saw faint crimson flashes in the forest the town bordered. He heard a scuffle on the stairs and swiveled in his position, a tired smile on his face as he awaited the shinobi who would be taking over for him. However a few moments later when nobody emerged from the staircase leading down from the wall he cautiously stood up, hand naturally drifting to his kunai pouch. The hand dropped limply down to his side though when he caught a glimpse of what was going on in the town though, or more specifically, what wasn't happening. Where before he might have seen Kuza shinobi patrolling the rooftops, keeping the civilians that had barricaded and under curfew, he now only silent, empty streets. What the? His eyes furrowed before flickering subconsciously to the side where this time he was sure he actually saw a bright red flash down a nearby alleyway. His brow creased as he stared harder only to be nearly startled out of his skin by a sudden scrabbling from the stairs. When he saw it was just another Kuza shinobi he lowered the kunai he had drawn, only for his frown to increase when he realized the man wasn't even looking at him. Instead he was clutching his bleeding arm, frantically looking behind him as though he was being chased by ghosts. Ah! He jumped back when he caught sight of Kisuke, only to wince as his injured arm was flung back. Hey, what's going on? Kisuke quickly asked, however the man seemed frantic and uncooperative, glancing this way and that desperately. H he's coming, oh god he's coming. He raved, his words coming out jumbled and barely intelligible, it didn't even seem, like he was talking to Kisuke. What? Who's coming? Kisuke grabbed his shoulders to stop him only to cringe back as his face was suddenly splattered with a warm, red liquid and the man he was holding fell limp. Cracking an eye open he had only a moment to query the strange three-pronged design of the kunai sticking out of the man's neck before a red flash encompassed his vision and his world went dark in a single blinding moment of pain. Naruto stared grimly out over the small border town that his operation had just liberated, eyes glancing down to the two dead bodies by his feet, blood slowly pooling out from their clean wounds. Naruto made sure it was as painless as possible, but that was a hollow statement because he was still forced to take their lives all the same. The operational directives had been clear, no prisoners. This was how Konoha waged war, shock and awe to begin with and then they could worry about mercy when their opposition were in a more negotiable mood. The redhead had never seen the Hokage look so grizzled or grim, his face like stone as he went about assigning the various missions to take back their lost territory and towns. It was as though the burden of leadership was actually visible on the man's shoulders, would that be him in a few years? Sending out men and women to mercilessly cut down the enemies on Konoha, the thought made him feel a little ill. He pushed it down though, he needed a strong facade in front of the shinobi and kunoichi he commanded, he knew they were thinking the exact same things and he needed to let them know all of this sacrifice wasn't pointless. That was why he set his face into a clean, expressionless mask, flicked the blood from his tanto and began walking to find some higher ground. He would have to find his kunai later. Higher Niazan. Higher, Haya giggled excitedly as Naruto caught her in his arms again, cradling her like a newborn. A grin tugged at his lips, almost matching the one on the silver-haired girls as he once again crouched down on the next branch, flinging her up and into the air with all his strength. Her cry of glee caused birds to scatter from their perches as she spread her arms out, for just a moment soaring through the air like one of them. Then she reached the crest of her flight and began to fall again. However unlike most children she wasn't scared, she knew her Niazan would always be there to catch her. 
Sure enough in the next moment a flash of red seemed to engulf her and suddenly she was back in his warm, strong arms, it only made the grin on her lips stretch her cheeks farther. With the grace of a cat Naruto deftly landed on the next branch, keeping Haya safe and secure the whole way down. Then it began all over again as he reared back to throw her once more. Haya definitely couldn't be called a normal child. Where they enjoyed safer, more grounded games where the worst they might do is scrape their knee, she much preferred to have adrenaline pumping through her veins, the wind in her face and the world buzzing by her in a bright blur of colors and shapes. It was the curse of those who could move as fast as her, she just always needed to be moving, the more dangerous and exciting, the better. Finally though even her supposedly boundless energy had to run out and she found herself sprawled on the grass, head resting on Naruto's chest and he lay down beside her. She was unendingly grateful to have found such a wonderful family after being torn away from her clan. Your Hiraiken is amazing Niazan, she exclaimed suddenly, throwing her arms up into the air in a typically childish manner to punctuate her point. Naruto simply chuckled, the reverberations from his chest carrying through Haya and making her giggle. Hiraishan Haya, it's called the Hiraishan. The little silver-haired girl simply nodded emphatically as if that was what she had said all along. Right. And it's awesome. You can go whoosh and zoom and be everywhere at once, she continued to exclaim, waving her hands about to accentuate her sound effects. She missed when Naruto's face briefly turned down. Yeah. Pretty great isn't it, he agreed half-heartedly, suppressing the urge to look down at his hands, he knew he wouldn't like what he saw there. A moment later though and it was replaced with a bright grin as he suddenly swiveled to his feet, picking up Haya in a smooth swooping motion, much to the little girl's delight. Come on then, I bet Anko's cooked us something really delicious. Anything to take his mind off it really. Dark shadows flitted silently through the night, the stars and the faint crescent moon the only light to guide their way. Their target became obvious quickly, a large bridge spanning an enormous gorge. They paused at the tree line, unwilling to cross the no-man's land of felled trees and grass that had been cleared around the perimeter of the bridge. It was obviously to aid the patrolling shinobi station to cross its length in spotting intruders faster. A silent hand gesture was made, answered by a subtle nod, a moment later and a small, fizzling package was flung across the space, soaring in an arc right over the bridge. Just as it was about to fall down the gorge on the other side it erupted into a bright sphere of light, enough to grab the attention of every guard in the vicinity. In that single second though another object was thrown on roughly the same path, however its arc took it a little shorter, landing on the wooden surface of the bridge with a dulled thud. The closest guard had only just turned around when his neck was cleanly sliced through by a well-maintained Tonto, the grim face behind it grimacing slightly. It was his body slumping to the floor that really alerted the rest of the bridge's occupants. However by the time they turned Naruto was already halfway through a set of well-practiced hand signs. Wind release, vacuum scythe, he whispered into his hands, in the same breath exhaling a deadly stream of sharpened air that rocketed down the length of the bridge with nothing but a faint whine to herald its path. The first three it came across were felled instantly, the look of shock on their faces managing to survive the bisection of their bodies. The Kunoichi a little further down was slightly luckier, feeling something coming and ducking down instinctively, it saved her neck, quite literally. However as she scrambled to her feet she found Naruto already in front of her, having already begun to move before his jutsu had even finished forming. She barely pulled out her sword before she was forced to block the clean edge of Naruto's tanto with it. The force of it, mostly from the speed of Naruto's approach, forced her back. In her shock and confusion at the rapid turn of events she managed to trip over her own feet. Unfortunately that was the last straw, she could only scrabble uselessly as a knee was pressed on her sternum and cold steel to her neck. Her last sight was of two stormy violet eyes looking into hers, as if ingraining every detail of her face into his memory. Far from the cold eyes of a killer though she only saw sadness and reluctance in those purple orbs. Sorry. His whisper was the last thing she heard before the sword fell and her world was taken away from her. The redhead simply stayed there for a moment, still kneeling down on her body, watching with dulled eyes as her blood slowly seeped out on the ground beneath them. His hand, braced on her shoulder, could still feel the warmth of her body, now fading in the frigid night air. Then it was gone, he blinked, reset his face, righted himself and joined the throng of shinobi that had been flitting past him. Anko's laughter was like music as they rolled about on the bed, wrestling for control with twin grins. The bed sheets were in a shambles at the foot of the bed, forgotten in their raucous fun and the pillows were looking to join them. Finally though Naruto managed to get on top, adjusting so that his knees were holding down her legs and he had both of her arms captured above her head. Anko made a few more playful struggles, smiling coyly all the while, before giving up, 
she had to blow a few strands of hair out of her face though. All right lover, you got me. She leaned up, licking her lips slowly and nipping playfully a Naruto's nose. Now what are you going to do with me? Her only answer was a foxy grin before her lips were suddenly taken away from her, sealed within a passionate kiss that a moment later she happily joined. Her eyes closed as she tried to press her body flush against his, only to be counteracted by his firm grip, keeping her in place as the kisses slowly trailed away from her mouth, down her jaw and finally stopping at her collarbone. The atmosphere was slightly ruined though when Naruto suddenly blew a rather large and loud raspberry on her chest, the vibrations causing her to let out a sudden and very involuntary laugh. Her body shuddered as Naruto moved further down, still occasionally blowing into her as he moved down her body, moving from sensitive spot to sensitive spot until finally coming to a stop at her stomach. For a moment, with him looking up slyly and her looking down with wide eyes they both froze, Naruto's grin growing at the same rate Anko's face contorted into a look of horror. You wouldn't dare. Once again her answer was not with words but with the biggest and wettest raspberry yet, causing her entire body to squirm uncontrollably at the sensation. At some point Naruto had managed to tie her hands to the head of the bed with a bit of the pillow, she hadn't even noticed. It meant she could do nothing to stop him as he continued his torturously ticklish ministrations. A ah ah a ah oh okay I g give, I give. She finally relented, sighing in relief as Naruto stopped. He quickly moved up her body until they were face to face again, giving Anko a good look at the mischievous smirk on his lips. Oh? And what do I get? Not one to be easily defeated Anko returned his smirk in kind, wiggling her hands and grinding her hips up to his. I don't know, you'd have to untie me to find out. Before she'd even finished her sentence though the bindings holding her wrists were suddenly gone in a flash, making her blink in surprise. It didn't last long though before they fluttered close again as Naruto caught her lips in a searing kiss. When the redhead finally released her though, moving back with lidded eyes and a serene grin, he paused. For just a moment it hadn't been Anko lying underneath him, but that Kunoichi, slowly bleeding out. He shook his head and it passed, but Anko was now looking up at him curiously. Are you okay? She questioned wearily, making Naruto realize that his features had twisted into a look of mute shock. He quickly composed himself and grinned easily, hiding his tumultuous feelings behind a grinning mask. I'm fine, what do you mean? He shot back perhaps a little too quickly, the violet scrutinized him for a few more moments before internally shrugging. It had only been for a moment anyway, she might have been imagining it. Besides, her loins were practically aching at this point, they needed their sweet release that only Naruto could provide. Never mind. She amended slowly, placing a sultry look back on her features as she captured Naruto's head between her hands. Now, you mentioned getting something? Suddenly she turned the tables, flipping them both over until she was straddling his chest, both of their smiles growing as she began moving down his body, hips swaying rhythmically. I think you'll like this. Moments, it was over in just moments, the Konoha shinobi standing on the edge of the battlefield almost couldn't believe their eyes. What should have been a long, bloody and violent battle was over and finished in mere seconds, if that. The field stretching out in front of them bore all the signs of a terrible and catastrophic battle, bodies littered everywhere, blood staining the muddied soil, huge spiraling burn marks scored into every surface. However the true sign of the battle were the unique three-pronged kunai scattered everywhere. The Otto Corp had never even had a chance, one moment they were holding down entrenched Konoha Shinobi, the next a rain of kunai falls over their position and everything ends in a flash of red. Watching it from the outside was even more incredible, the Konoha troops had literally seen Naruto moving through their ranks like some kind of wraith. He moved so fast, blinking between different points and sometimes even the length of the battlefield, that it appeared there were more than one of him. I I've never seen anything like that. A Konoha Chonin muttered, his eyes still wide as he stared out over the carnage a single shinobi had wrought. Beside him his companion just nodded mutely. I know, I mean. I heard stories about the Yondaime but I never imagined. He couldn't find it in him to express the end of that thought, also captivated by the bloody yet entrancing sight of the now silent battlefield. Quiet. He might hear us. A third whispered hoarsely, motioning with his head over to where the redhead himself was sitting on a log nearby. Unlike them he wasn't looking at the battlefield, in fact he was staring down at the kunai in his hands, rotating it slowly between his fingers. But, he's on our side though right? The second Chonin questioned, the sight of Naruto just sitting there, so quiet and calm after what he had done, it was unnerving. Yeah, I really get why they call him the bloody flash now. The first agreed, although it was a bit of a misnomer because there wasn't a drop of blood on Naruto's body, he had been moving too fast for any to hit him. 
Blink of an eye. The second muttered with a gulp, around 50 enemy shinobi taken out in less than the time it took for him to even have that thought. He's really his father's son. The third piped in, an indecipherable look on his features, at that moment all three of the chonin started as Naruto suddenly got to his feet. His hair swayed in the light breeze as he surveyed the battlefield with cold violet eyes before finally glancing over at the small group of chonin. Call in the cleanup squad and get ready, you're moving out to the outpost by Muraku Gai. He calmly intoned, not a single inflection in his voice, it was the tone of a proper shinobi, unweighted by emotion. The three men quickly nodded, anything to get away from the scene of carnage spreading out before them. As they scurried about their duties Naruto watched them, some emotion finally seeping back into his stony, hardened face. It was better that he do this than them, they were just chonin, it was his job as their superior to spare them this kind of bloodshed. Well, aren't you guys a sight for sore eyes huh? Naruto exclaimed cheerily as he spotted Sasuke, Sakura and Emi walk into their old training ground, it is yet to be repurposed what with the ongoing war and still bore a few scars from their training sessions. Blade marks littered a small copse of trees where Emi practiced her kenjutsu as well as scorch marks occasionally marring the grass, now unable to grow back, thanks to Sasuke training his ninjutsu. Tell me about it sensei, it seems like months since the last time we were all in the same place, Emi agreed with a slightly tired smile, there seemed to be a subtle change about her that Naruto couldn't quite pin down. She had grown a bit, beginning to better fill out her red dress, he also noticed she wore her sword with a great deal more confidence than before and had moved on from the one she had trained with, now proudly carrying her sister's old blade. That's because it has been months, dead last. Sasuke quipped with a roll of his eyes, however the half-hearted insult carried no venom and the slight quirk of his lips showed his real feelings. All of them felt a little relieved by this, the familiarity of the old team was a nice break from the monotony and slog the war posed. However Sakura couldn't help but chuckle. Are we sure this is a good idea though? Whenever we get together we only ever seem to attract trouble, she joked smoothly, a bright smile on her face, out of all of them Naruto thought she had changed the most. He heard she had left the main Chonin Corp a few weeks into her rotations along the border, instead opting to join the Med Nin. Her hair had been tied back into a neat ponytail and there were a few extra pouches over her body. I'm sure Kami will let us off this one time. Naruto shot right back with a grin, hopping off the boulder he had been perched on. It really did him some good to see his team like this, healthy and not too weighted down by the burdens of war. He figured it did them some good too to see each other, as a Chonin even teams weren't sacred. He wouldn't be surprised if they had never been rotated onto the same squads throughout their entire time in the war. Well he started with a grin, clapping his hands together and plopping down on the grass, inviting his team to do the same. Who has stories to tell? Emi quickly joined him, a mischievous grin alighting on her face as Sasuke and Sakura made to do the same, but slower. Well, I could tell the one about how Sasuke nearly got sent back to the village while on patrol along the Taki border. She announced in an almost conspiratorial manner, making Sasuke's head jerk up suddenly. You said you wouldn't say anything. He growled, eyes narrowed, however any tension was immediately cut as Sakura bobbed her head, eyes gleaming with mirth. Ooh ooh, I haven't heard that one yet. She piped it, amusement clear in her tone as Sasuke tried to sink farther into his high-collared shirt like a turtle. Emi simply grinned at Sakura, holding her hand out as if asking for money. Quid pro quo Sakura, what do you have in return for this juicy story? She shot back, a true barterer in the making. Sakura placed a finger to her mouth and looked up thoughtfully. Well, I do have one about Okamura Sensei accidentally ordering three crates of Aramanga instead of hospital scrubs. At that the trio paused before each bursting out laughing in their own way, raucous for Emi, giggles for Sakura and a quiet chuckle for Sasuke. No way? How did he manage that? Emi blurted out, quickly descending into a heated discussion with the pinkhead about signing the wrong order forms, naturally Sasuke had his own two Rio to throw in when the topic finally turned back to his embarrassing blunder. All the while Naruto sat back with a content smile on his face, simply enjoying he peaceful company of his students again. He knew he had to make it last as long as he could. It was hard to believe but Naruto could in fact get tired, exhausted even, there were times when he was young, especially after Itachi's abandonment of the village, that he would train himself into the ground and be unable to move for hours. It was rarer as he got older and less reckless like that, but it still happened from time to time. As he jumped between trees in the ass end of nowhere, somewhere north of the Taki border, this was one of those times. 
he had been on a solo operation around the area Konoha assumed to Kigakor to be located setting up a grid of long-distance Hiraishin markers. They were more draining to set up that their kunai-attached counterparts and he had been working on them all day in massive, kilometers-wide radius. Just as he was finishing up though he was contacted by Inoiki and informed that a small tokubutsu squad that Anko was leading had been ambushed while performing a similar scouting mission. The Yamanaka had barely finished relaying their location before Naruto had bolted off, barely a blur as he ran through the trees so fast he was leaving small footprint-shaped craters in his wake. The surrounding forestry became a barely cohesive blur and he even stumbled a few times, almost losing his footing before catching himself to continue his reckless sprint. He probably confused a few Taki patrols as he raced by, nothing more than a vague crimson blur as he bolted past. Finally though he emerged into the general vicinity of the coordinates Inoiki had given him, eyes glancing around wildly. However one sniff of the air made his heart sink into his stomach, the stench of blood was permeating the air. Swiftly following it back to its source Naruto located the overgrown forest path where the ambush had taken place. The sight that met his eyes was. Confusing, to say the least. The unconscious forms of the Konoha squad were placed neatly to the side, propped up as though they were just resting. The ambushing group from Taki on the other hand, they were strewn about the path in varying states, all of them were dead though. After glancing over and making sure Anko's chest was still rising and falling he looked toward the culprits, a small group of four wearing strange renditions of Konoha's traditional Anbu uniforms and equally odd blank masks. What's going on here, what squad are you from? He asked cautiously, stepping into the clearing and grabbing the small unit's attention. They immediately turned to him, gazing at him evenly behind their masks before the tallest, apparently the leader spoke up. Naruto Namikaze, he stated in a dull monotone, not asking so much as confirming to himself the redhead's identity. Suddenly his hand lifted up, creating a signal Naruto didn't recognize from the standard Anbu sign language. Our mission is complete, pull back. Naruto blinked before stepping forward, brow furrowed. Wait, what's however the group had already left, however one had lingered just a fraction of a second longer than the others, regarding him with an ever so slightly tilted head in what seemed like curiosity. She seemed rather young for an Anbu, no older than Naruto's Janan at the moment. However he got little time to ponder that before she darted off to follow her squad, spiky blonde ponytail bouncing along behind her. Before he could make after them though he heard a groan to his left, glancing over he saw Anko stirring and was by her side in moments. Hey hey, easy. Her eyes blinked open in confusion before softening as she saw his concerned eyes looking down at her. Naruto? She chuckled weakly before wincing and clutching her ribs, she hadn't been in the best shape before those weird Anbu turned up. You look like hell. She muttered meekly with a good attempt at her usual cheeky smile, the comment did bring one to Naruto's features though. Yeah, and you don't look much better, at least I can sleep mine off. For the comment he got a playful slap to the chest. How are my squad? She asked suddenly, eyes widening, Naruto just pushed her back down. They're fine, all alive by the looks of things, now stop moving. He ordered sternly, earning a pout from his girlfriend that he promptly ignored. As he went about checking her wounds she glanced around curiously, mostly at the dead bodies strewn across the path. What happened? Did you do this? Even as she spoke her voice was unconvinced, it didn't look like Naruto's handiwork, not clean enough. The redhead just shook his head slowly, pulling off a roll of bandages to deal with Anko's cracked rib. No, I got to this party after everything was over, there was some squad of Anbu here. He muttered, his lips turning down, Anko just stared at him incredulously for a moment. You of all people, were late? At that the redhead's eye simply twitched, his face slipping into a frown, Anko quickly noticed this and had the decency to look sheepish. Ah, sorry. He just shook his head, she was right, he had been late. If it weren't for that squad of weird Anbu then who knew what could have happened to Anko, he couldn't be everywhere at once. He still wasn't fast enough. Are you leaving already? Anko's sleepy voice made Naruto freeze in the doorway of their bedroom before turning slowly to see her lifting her torso with her elbow and rubbing wearily at her eyes. He didn't blame her, it was only 5 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, another mission, I might be gone for a few days this time. He reluctantly admitted, he didn't exactly like being separated from Anko either. However the sleepy pout she gave him had to be one of the cutest things he had ever seen and actually made him consider just crawling back into bed with her. It's not fair they make you do so much. She tiredly grumbled, her eyes already struggling to stay open, Anko was definitely not a morning person, never mind pre-morning. Naruto could only shrug sheepishly though. The more I do, 
the less others have to and the faster this war is over. His answer was a rather obnoxiously loud raspberry that Anko blew into her free hand. It's still not fair, I hardly get to see you anymore, Haya hardly gets to see you. She sat more upright, letting her loose purple shirt fall down one arm to expose tantalizingly creamy skin. It's not as though you have to take the entire burden of this war onto your shoulders you know. I hear people talking, about how you seem to be on every front at once, in every camp, on every mission. You're going to drive yourself insane or become so exhausted you'll make some stupid mistake if you keep this up. Naruto's eyes turned down at that but again he could only offer up a rather pathetic shrug. I have the power to make a difference, if I did nothing then I'm no better than the people who started this damn war. At that Anko could only frown, childishly throwing a pillow across the room, Naruto didn't bother to dodge and simply allowed it to impact harmlessly with his chest. I'm not asking for nothing, just less. Come home more, maybe not take every mission you can. Be a little bit selfish for crying out loud, you have a family. Naruto winced with every accusation but managed to stay resolute, his voice sounding tired and downtrodden. And what kind of person would I be to that family if I let this war go on for any longer than it has to? He replied morosely before simply walking from the doorway, leaving Anko still sat there, both their expressions reflecting the somber atmosphere. Naruto shook his head as he dashed through the trees but try as he might he hadn't been able to get that conversation with Anko out of his head. Even now, crossing into Taki no Kuni's territory it was still rattling around in his skull. It made him lose focus, so much so that he very nearly got his head sliced clean off by a near-invisible blade of wind. He didn't though and rolled right off the branch he landed on, coming to a skidding stop on the forest floor below. Instantly thoughts of anything before a few minutes ago vanished from his mind and with that new clarity he was just about able to make out a faint buzzing accompanied by the gentle hum of wind. A moment later and he jumped back, avoiding similarly lethal sides of wind that scored rather impressive marks into the earth. The humming grew louder as a figure alighted on a nearby branch, green insectoid wings slowing down from their agitated buzz that matched the shade of her mint green hair. Naruto frowned as he recognized the caramel-skinned woman above him, her vivid orange eyes narrowed in an indecipherable expression. Fu, Chapter 33, Familiar Encounters Naruto gazed up in mild confusion, locking eyes with the caramel-skinned girl above him who simply stared right back, an uneasy silence settling over the claustrophobic patch of forest. It was as though the animals themselves could feel the tension in the air and had wisely evacuated. Both shinobi were tensed, their muscles coiled in anticipation for whatever the other would do, however after it became evident neither were ready to attack Fu frowned. I'm sorry about this Naruto. Taking no other cues she suddenly darted forward, exploding off the branch with a blast of concentrated air. It was obviously a slightly more extreme version of her light step technique that Naruto had already witnessed firsthand. Her body spanned through the air like a drill as four translucent wings unfurled from her spine, rapidly buzzing to life and speeding her forward in the same instant. She impacted with the earth with a catastrophic boom, sending dust and dirt sailing over the canopy and into the air. Sorry about what? Came Naruto's reply, not exactly from the position Fu had expected, all she held in her hands was earth, Naruto was across from her, sitting up in a tree. His expression was cool and his tone was even his eyebrow merely raising an inch as he looked down at her, their position suddenly inverted in the blink of an eye. The verdette scowled, her now solid orange eyes narrowing as her body suddenly contracted, crouching into the ground like a tightly coiled spring before releasing with another blast of wind. This time, keeping her baiju enhanced eyes trained on the redhead, she managed to spot it, not that she could do a damn thing about it. At the very last moment, as her hands were poised to close around his throat, his hand twitched and released something into the air. However by the time she realized just what it was he had already vanished in a flash of crimson. He appeared within a millisecond though. Right behind her. With a strangled cry her eyes opened wide as she suddenly felt a strong grip on two of her wings. In the next moment she was spinning, and not in the way she wanted to, it was as though her shoulder blades were attempting to escape from her back. The pain was intense but brief as not a second later Naruto released her, sending her into an uncontrollable dive that had her skidding along the ground like some child skimming stone. As she picked herself up from the shallow trench she had gouged with her body though, it was a scowl of annoyance on her face, not of pain. You held back. She coughed out, cracking her neck as she got back to her feet, not much the worse for wear. You could have sent me right into the ground, I might have even been knocked out. She growled in annoyance, if there was one thing she truly hated with every fiber of her being it was being taken lightly, being looked down on. It might have also broken your neck. Naruto responded easily, 
hopping down to the ground with his expression calm and collected. His posture might have lulled Lesser Shinobi into believing he was open and unprepared, but Fu wasn't fooled. However in the next moment he surprised her by actually lowering his guard, a satin frown pulling at his features. I don't want to kill you Fu. It had the opposite effect than intended though, instead of matching his softened expression Fu's scowl only grew more intense. Don't look down on me. The ground around her seemed to shudder as a vile wave of what could only be described as pure anger washed over the immediate area. The Kunoichi's entire body was enveloped by a coat of sickly orange energy that writhed and twitched as though it had a mind of its own. Her previously crisp and defined wings grew frayed and indistinct, gaining the same hue as her eyes instead of her hair. Her scowl twisted into something far more malicious as two antennae-like protrusions of chakra grew from her forehead. Fu, think about what you are doing. Naruto warned slowly, his muscles slowly tensing as Fu hunched over, obviously fighting to control this new wave of power. Don't let this thing however without a word of warning Fu suddenly vanished from view, the ground behind her suddenly buckling under some unseen pressure. In the same instant Naruto leant back, catching himself with his hands on the ground as a massive scythe of orange-tinted wind screamed overhead. It was as though time had slowed down for a second and Naruto was able to look right up into Fu's eyes, however there was little of the girl he had known in those solid orange orbs. Time snapped back into motion and suddenly both were a whirlwind of movement. Fu's attacks were relentless, what her wings had lost in finesse they had gained in pure power. Naruto found himself almost overwhelmed as she pushed the offensive. Every movement, every kick, every attack was pushed forward by those wings, giving them tremendous power and speed. There was no escaping them either, faint seemed useless with those antennae on her head. It was though she wasn't so much seeing him as she was feeling where he was in relation to her. There was little he could do about it as well, at least right now, attacking would have been foolish when she was in this state. While his blows might have been enough to wind her in this form the cost would be too high, he knew all too well how volatile and poisonous that chakra could be. If he was touched then he shouldn't have been expecting the use of that limb for the rest of the fight, and that was if it didn't just kill him. So for now he dodged, using deft motions to stay just outside of the berserk Kunoichi's range, it couldn't last though and both of them knew it. For however evasive Naruto may have appeared, for how much it looked as though he were on the back foot, the redhead's mind was always working, always thinking ahead the next few steps. His eyes darted craftily about as he began to throw kunai about the clearing, in her enraged state Fu didn't even notice the subtle movements. When his net was complete Naruto gave the Baijuu possessed girl a sly wink before vanishing. The moment she realized her prey had disappeared Fu let out a tremendous roar. It was an unsettling sound that seemed crossed between the staccato buzz of an insect and the growl of a predator. The surrounding forestry shook from the sheer force it exerted however it got her no closer to locating her suddenly missing opponent. The question didn't reaming unanswered long though as suddenly Naruto was in front of her again, a look of intense focus on his face as he suddenly grabbed her by the shirt. This time there was no pause, no slowed moment shared between the redhead and the berserker. Naruto simply grabbed her and immediately threw her up with a grunt of effort, a moment later popping out of existence and revealing himself to be a shadow clone. However Fu's short flight didn't end there as not even a moment later another clone was in front of her, inexplicably appearing in a blight flash before performing a similar maneuver. He span as he grabbed her, using the sudden rotation to throw her further up at the cost of his own existence. This repeated countless times for Fu in a dizzying, disorienting display of flashing acrobatics, always from different directions and always too fast for her to react to until she was far above the canopy. It was only then that she finally noticed the kunai hanging in the air above her, just completing its arc before falling back toward the ground. Before it did though a final Naruto, the real one this time, suddenly teleported into existence, a firm grasp on the hilt of the blade. In a seemingly impossible feat of human flexibility, and with momentum retained from a previous jump, he suddenly twisted his body, simultaneously curling and unfurling his body before lashing out with a tremendously fast axe kick right to Fu's stomach. For a single agonizingly long second the Verdet's entire body curled around his sandaled foot before she was sent flying back down toward the earth. A low sonic boom drowned out the enormous crash her form made upon impacting the ground, a visible ring of displaced air rushing outward. Of course that wasn't enough to keep a Jinchuriki down, or even a truly seasoned Jounin, and after a few moments with her head ringing Fu was able to drag herself out of the sizable crater Naruto had decided to dig with her body. Of course, that was all simply the distraction, a Hiraishin seal she hadn't noticed Naruto plant on her stomach glowed faintly as the redhead appeared in front of her, a frown marring his features. I didn't want to have to do this, it's going to hurt. He intoned with a hint of regret as Fu growled in response, lashing out suddenly. 
however the redhead shifted his entire body around her clawed hands, lashing out with a strike of his own to plant a solitary paper tag on the verdette's forehead. A moment of calm followed before Fu reeled back, her entire body twitching uncontrollably as she cried out in pain. Visible streams of virulent orange energy began leeching off her body, drawn from the tag to the kunai Naruto had steadily planted around the area in a makeshift hexagon. The redhead could only watch in morbid fascination as the Baiju's energy was quite literally ripped away from Fu's form. He had never needed to actually use this particular technique before and it was quite the sight to see. He was in no way extracting the beast of course, that would kill Fu, he was simply siphoning off the energy Fu was attempting to use, diverting it away from her chakra system and into the kunai. It would have likely worked as well, causing Fu to pass out from both the shock, pain and sudden absence of the double-edged power. Would have. Suddenly the stealthily hidden kunai, given away by the streams of chakra connecting to the tag on Fu's head, began to shake and quiver like they had been taken upon by some invisible grip. A moment later and they were wrenched from the ground, hurtling across the forest and into the shadows. In the same moment a flood of what appeared to be plain white tags poured into the small clearing Naruto's attack had created. They enveloped Fu, covering and surrounding her like a cocoon spun by some papery spider. I'm afraid we cannot let you finish that jutsu Naruto Namikaze. A gruff, monotone voice called out from those same shadows. A figure soon joined it as a tall orange-haired man clad in a dark and all too recognizable cloak stepped out of treeline. However what had Naruto freezing in place for a moment was not the cloak he recognized as the Akatsuki's, but the man's eyes. The steel grey ringed sclera that he had only ever heard stories. No, legends about bored into him. That second of hesitation cost him though as the man suddenly raised his hand. Shinra Tensei. No hand seal was made, there was no buildup of chakra, the man simply intoned a command and the world answered. An invisible wall of force that Naruto couldn't have possibly seen coming slammed into his unprepared form, tossing him like a ragdoll away from the clearing. He managed to gain his senses in time to twist his body and land roughly in a three-point stance but by that point the man's strange technique had thrown him hundreds of feet away. He was just lucky not to have hit any trees. However before he could dash back towards the man a wall of paper fluttered into the space in front of him, blocking his route and causing him to skid to a stop. It quickly resolved itself into the form of a blue-haired woman, floating a few feet of the ground with a cold expression and orange eyes not dissimilar to Fu's. She seemed incomplete, her body flaking off in places and seemingly composed of sheets of tightly packed paper. Naruto's first thought was that it was some kind of clone, however that was quickly dashed when she began to speak. I cannot allow you to interfere, you will not go any further than this. She motioned slowly to the wall of paper that even as she talked was beginning to encircle them. The redhead looked about for a second before shrugging and placing his hands in his pockets, if the woman was surprised by this she hid it extremely well behind that indifferent facade. All right then, what exactly would I be interfering in? He asked, eyes carefully roaming the wall for any hint of a trap, he wouldn't believe for even a second there was no tricks hidden in whatever technique this was. The woman merely raised a single eyebrow less than a fraction of an inch, a truly impassive exterior. You do not care for the well-being of the Jinchuriki? If she had any genuine curiosity in the question then her bland, disinterested tone didn't show it. You stopped me from completing a jutsu that, to you, likely looked as though it would have removed her by Juu, thus killing her. You aren't here to do that. His eyes narrowed slightly. Not yet anyway. He took the brief twitch of her hand and crinkle of her brow as a confirmation of that fact. There are two of you and the Akatsuki are known to be comprised of powerful individuals. At the mention of her organization's name the woman's reaction was slightly more visible you are here for suppression, not elimination. You know of the Akatsuki. The woman replied blandly, Naruto took her evasion as another confirmation. You don't stay an Anbu captain for so long without learning about the freelance competition out there. For the first time in the conversation Naruto's gaze hardened, losing its previous carefree quality. The question remained then of why such a powerful and, if rumors are true, expensive mercenary group after a Jinchuriki. It was a concerning notion, if they had been hired then it was tantamount to an act of war from another village. It certainly wouldn't be Konoha, there were known missing Nin within the organization and Konoha did not affiliate itself with such groups. You do not need to know that, you must merely stay here until Pain sama has left. She replied resolutely, however her brow crinkled at the same moment Naruto's raised, both realizing her mistake. Pain sama He repeated with a smirk, a name was a useful thing to know. The woman didn't seem all too eager on continuing the conversation though. Enough. She called, 
sweeping her arm out as a multitude of tags dotting the paper wall suddenly sprung to life, flipping around to reveal a seal all Shinobi knew very well. However as the explosive tags raced toward the redhead he remained unconcerned, staring the blue net in the eye before giving a wink and tilting his head her way as if tipping his hat. Nice talk. It was almost lost among the ensuing explosions but Conan was just able to make out the flash of red a millisecond before the first tag reached the Konoha Shinobi. With a curse she called off the rest of her attack, great paper wings springing from her back as she took to the skies in the direction of her partner. Payne walked steadily through the forest, he was in no rush. Either Conan would keep Naruto busy long enough or, if his reputation was to be believed, the Namikaze would have escaped already. Sure enough the orange-haired man suddenly shot out his right hand, easily catching the sweeping kick that suddenly appeared in a flash of red. With a grip like steel he held the redhead there, eyes narrowing as he turned to meet the Konoha shinobi's gaze. You should have heeded Conan's warning. He suddenly let go of the redhead, palm opening in the same instance to blast him far away. However Naruto was a quick learner if nothing else and was already gone before the attack had time to discharge. Instead, a tree a few meters away was violently ripped out of the earth and sent careening back, smashing a ragged path through the forest. Konan huh? She didn't actually tell me her name. Payne's head lazily swiveled toward Naruto's new location, halfway up a nearby tree. He had not noticed the man throw any of his famed kunai, that was very impressive. However it only made the Akatsuki member take the situation more seriously. You have no need to know of it. What do you intend to do now? The pierced man turned his full body toward the redhead, giving him a great view of Fu's unconscious body slung over his left shoulder. I warn you, if you attack me I will not hesitate to destroy you Kyubi Jinchuriki. Naruto was only surprised for a moment before his gaze hardened once again, these people had suddenly turned from a notable threat to a true danger. Then maybe it's not best for me to engage, for now. Naruto commented, his legs waving absently, once again if the man was surprised by the comment it did not show. Something about those perfectly stony exteriors on these two really irritated Naruto. However, suddenly he was gone, only to reappear a moment later in the same spot, only Fu was now sat limply to his side I will be taking this. Payne's mouth only twitched fractionally before his hand snapped up, palm already splayed. Ban before he could even get another syllable out Naruto was gone, reappearing on another branch standing up. Fu was slung under one arm while the other leant against the trunk of the tree. Ah ah ah, I'm not letting you do another of your tricks again. He called down, as if to prove it he vanished the moment Payne tried to point his hand in the redhead's direction again. Don't think of this as a retreat though. He vanished once more, only irritating Payne further, when he appeared it was behind a tree in Payne's blind spot. Think of this as me having better things to do. Another flash took him away as the tree he was behind was summarily obliterated by an invisible wall of energy. Just to be irritating, the final time he appeared it was directly in front of Payne, if only for a moment. Bye. And like that, he was gone. A minute later Conan landed in the small clearing to see Payne idly turning one of the Horatian kunai in his hands. However even as he watched, the seal decorating the hilt slowly began to burn away leaving nothing but a blank tool more useless than a normal kunai. Soon even that was reduced to scrap metal as pain crushed the offending tool in his hand. Naruto sat across from the Hokage in the small, comfortable antechamber next to his office. His head was leant back and he held the bridge of his nose to stave off the headache he just knew was coming. Fu had been taken into custody by the Anbu and he had been assured that she would be kept comfortable but that didn't decrease his worry. There was also the matter of the Akatsuki, a powerful group that's intentions remained unknown, they were an unknown variable in all of this. This news is certainly troubling, I will admit. The aged cage began slowly, weary eyes looking ahead at nothing in particular as he remained immersed within his own thoughts. I fear this may mark a turning point in this war, for better or for worse. Naruto looked back down at that, a sigh escaping his lips. Either Taki will realize they have lost their trump card and withdraw, or they will only grow more desperate. Naruto surmised grimly, already knowing the more likely of the two. The Hokage simply nodded blowing out a gust of smoke from his pipe as he finally focused his eyes on the redhead. Both you and I know that if Orochimaru has his fingers in this, then the former will be impossible, he sighed, eyes turning to the window overlooking the village. Konoha is holding its ground in this fight and given enough time we can and will end it. There was an air of finality in his words that one could not help but believe, there was a reason he was Hokage. However, he sighed again and Naruto could safely say that he had never seen the older shinobi look his age quite so much we are stretched thin at the moment along the northern border, 
we cannot afford these free radicals in the form of Akatsuki or anybody else running amok while we are weakened. His frown turned thoughtful as the famed mind of the professor continued to work on the problem like it was a puzzle lacking a few pieces. Things are only going to get more complicated from here on out aren't they? Naruto asked tiredly, he hadn't even had a chance to see Anko since coming home and he was sorely missing his bed. However, as if summoned by some higher power with a twisted sense of humor, an Anbu suddenly dropped from the shadows. He leaned over and quickly whispered into the Hokaye's ear and even as he watched Naruto could see the old man's already pale features whiten even further. When the operative vanished once more Naruto simply raised an eyebrow only to receive a grave look from his commander. Shimaku Gai has been attacked. Naruto frowned at that, it was a small village on the northern border and was known for its tin mines but other than that it held no real strategic value. It was also strangely out of the way for an attack, even from Oto Gakur. He sensed there was more though and was quickly proven correct as the Hokage blew out another stream of smoke. Witnesses report the attack was carried out by Kumagakura Shinobi. He intoned gravely. Like a shark smelling blood, a new player had entered the fray. You know. Twin sighs echoed through the still forest as Emi struck up conversation once again, however the girl paid them no heed. Izumo and Kotetsu are always complaining that gate duty is the most boring mission a Chonin can be assigned. She grunted as she shifted the heavy backpack she was forced to carry as they trudged through the frosty landscape of northern Yunokuni. But at least they don't have to carry around weights heavier than themselves. Her only response was a grunt for her stoic Uchiha teammate, at least it was better than the utter indifference Hinata exuded. You know, it might not be so bad if you guys would actually talk for once and answer in more than monosyllables. Or at all. She aimed a pointed look at Hinata's back, knowing that with her Byakugan active the girl could see it. However the ever-aloof Hyuga princess didn't so much as glance her way, causing the Violette to sigh irritably. I miss Sakura, at least she would talk to me. It sucks she got shifted to the Med Corp. Stupid lack of Med Nin. She grumbled in futility as she kicked a clump of half-melted snow petulantly. On missions with Sasuke and Hinata she might as well have been assigned to escort some statues across the country. In each other's presences the scions of Konoha's two most prominent clans were completely intolerable. It made Ami almost thankful she hadn't been born with a dujutsu. Almost, it was still a highly unfair advantage she consistently called Sasuke out on. Perhaps if you simply stopped whining and focused on the mission, it might pass quicker. Came the clipped response from the long-haired Hayuga, there was a tone of distinct displeasure there that Ami took satisfaction from. Anko really had been rubbing off on her a bit too much. Oh so the princess does have a voice, Ami gasped in mock surprise, only to scoff a moment later when Hinata simply continued ignoring her. As if that would ever happen, these treks are about as boring as they come. A few moments of continual silence later and she let out another loud sigh before beginning to hum. There was no particular tune or melody, she was just trying to be as irritating as possible. Sure enough after around a minute of the obnoxious noise Hinata turned back and glared at her, the veins bulging around her eyes giving her a decidedly menacing look. Stop that. She ordered in a dark tone, only to have Ami stick out her tongue in a childlike manner. Instead she looked across at Sasuke, the current team leader much to Hinata's consternation. Make her stop. The dark-haired team merely grunted back, rolling his eyes in a mix of exasperation and amusement. He was a lot more used to Ami's antics and he held no great love for the Hayuga heir so this arrangement suited him just fine. If I could, I would have a long time ago. He muttered unhelpfully only to wince as Ami appeared behind him, slinging an arm around his shoulder and pressing her body far too close to his for his liking. Ah, oh, you know you love me Sasuke-kun. Luckily she let go after a moment but didn't drop her cheeky smile, mostly because Hinata was still glaring at her. I preferred you when you were the useless Dobi. The Hayuga derided with a sneer only to have Ami cock her head in that direction with an easy grin. And I preferred you before your family stuck that massive stick up your ass. She responded, earning a disgusted look from the heiress as she turned to Sasuke. When did she become so crass? She asked in irritation, turning to the rather immature tactic of talking about Emi right in front of her. Sasuke on the other hand merely shrugged. Blame our sensei's psycho girlfriend. He finally responded, only to feel a dark presence as Emi once again wrapped her arm around his neck, this time just a little tighter. What was that about Anko-sensei? Out the corner of his eyes Sasuke could spot Amy's fingers twitch toward the hilt of the sword on her back. A single bead of sweat began to drop down the back of his neck as he noticed the familiar and all too sweet grin twisting Amy's lips. Damn, she had nearly gotten that down to a T, it was positively chilling. 
luckily he was saved as Hinata suddenly raised her hand. Quiet you two, we're approaching the camp. After another squeeze from her arm Emi detached from her teammate and slinked back to the rear of the formation. The formation itself was redundant but they stuck to it out of habit, after all with a Sharangan user and a Byakugan user on the team there was little chance of an ambush. Plus, they were missing the usual fourth squad member due to Konoha's ranks being spread thin. In any case it was just a simple supply delivery to a camp near the border with Shimo no Kuni, Kumo territory. The backpacks they carried were filled to the brim with storage scrolls containing new equipment and food. After a moment though even Amy's usual grin slipped away, Hinata's expression was dead serious and her eyes were straining even more than usual. Her pace slowed and the others followed suit, Sasuke's Sharangan spinning to life in his eyes, however they were not designed for range and he could not make out whatever it was that had put Hinata on edge. What is it? He asked as they came to a stop just below the peak of the ridge that would overlook the small camp. The camp is too empty, I'm only detecting four chakra signatures, she whispered back, her eyes slowly roaming across the camp hidden to the other two. Suddenly though her eyes stopped, her face darkening at the same moment as her gaze became positively murderous. Kumo Shinobi, they've slaughtered the camp. Emi gasped while Sasuke's expression became more thoughtful, he was the squad leader, as honorary as that position was supposed to be for this mission, and it was up to him what they did now. Technically the correct option, the one he would be praised for when returning to the village, would be to gather information briefly before retreating. However there was the small problem that Hinata had already begun to move forward, dashing silently into the tree line that ringed half the camp. Cursing inwardly the Uchiha raced after her, motioning for Emi to follow him at a distance. When he alighted on a branch just behind the Hayuga he grabbed her shoulder forcefully only to have her turn around and glare at him. What do you think you're doing? She questioned venomously, shrugging his hand off her shoulder like it was on fire. He simply returned the glare with one of his own, made more intimidating by the three Tomoe Sharangan rotating rapidly in the sea of red that were his eyes. What are you doing? You'll give us away. Hinata scoffed and turned back to the cam, her Byakugan still blaring. I wanted a better vantage point so that I could read their lips, we need to find out what they're doing here. She shot back imperiously causing Sosk to grumble, inwardly arguing with himself before finally nodding, albeit reluctantly, he might as well make the most of the situation. What are they saying then? He finally sked in a hushed whisper, he suddenly agreed with Emi and wished Sakura was here instead, at least then they could communicate silently through the hand signs Naruto had taught them. Nothing useful, I think they're just the cleanup squad, the main force must be elsewhere by now. She responded, her tone becoming more professional, earning another nod from Sasuke, that would make sense. Can you tell what rank they are? If they were just a squad of Janan then they might be able to capture them, even if they were Chonin they would have a shot. If there were a Jounin among them though. Well, it was enough to say that Naruto had beaten some respect for the difference in ability between ranks. I can't tell, their chakra levels would indicate either powerful Chonin or her eyes widened suddenly before she dived off the branch. Sasuke followed, his Sharingan having caught the two speeding kunai at the last moment and allowing him to dodge them easily. However the way they were thrown, in a strange curved arc, forced them forward into the camp. Immediately they were surrounded by three Kumo Shinobi while the last stayed further away. He had his fingers pressed to the ground and a look of concentration on his face. We take offense to that, we may be fresh but a Jounin's a Jounin Yano? A blonde-haired man that looked no older than 18 started up with a cocky grin, causing both Hinata and Sasuke to tense as both easily slipped into their family stances. Don't get any funny ideas kids. A far more serious-looking man with dark skin and unnaturally gray hair cut in, the scars crisscrossing his body speaking of a lot of experience. Hey, I think this one's the Uchiha kid. The last of the trio piped up, a young woman who also had dark skin and white hair. All three had blades of different kinds strapped to their bodies and all three were now staring at Sasuke intently, most notably at his eyes. He tried to ensnare them in a genjutsu at that moment however the shinobi that had hung back, a tan man with wavy red hair and a blindfold across his eyes cleared his throat. I wouldn't try it kid. He spoke up in a gruff tone at the same moment both Konoha Chonin felt a pulse of chakra travel through the ground, snapping the genjutsu on the three Kumo Nin. Don't look him in the eyes. He spoke with a commanding tone and the three Kumo Shinobi looked a little sheepish for being caught out, he was obviously the commander. The man slowly turned his attention of Sasuke, looking right at him despite the blindfold. What's an Uchiha doing all the way out here, doesn't Konoha have a better hold over its assets? The leader asked in a calm, rough tone, it seemed to imply an age greater than his appearance would suggest. 
Hey, those Sharangan are a pretty rare commodity nowadays. The blonde spoke up tauntingly. My eyes are not a commodity. Sasuke growled, earning him a sour look from Hinata that obviously said don't let them rile you up. However it seemed a lost cause as the cocky blonde continued with a grin. Sure they are, after that Itachi guy went all psycho and butchered the lotto of those things became worth your weight in gold. Sasuke's eyes twitched and his hands clenched into fists so tight that his knuckles became white. The leader of the Kumo group seemed to be sending a warning look to his subordinate but he continued anyway. Sept, I heard he's the real strong one, so I imagine his eyes must be worth like. Three times yours, Yano? That seemed to be the last straw for Sasuke though as he suddenly dashed forward. However this seemed to be exactly what the blonde was waiting for as in a flash his sword was off his back and he'd slipped into an indecipherable stance. He was surprised then when Sasuke circumvented his first, second and third strikes with a deft ease. His eyes span rapidly as they showed him the movement of the katana before the kumo nin actually made them. His glare was burning as he ducked into the man's guard with a blow that would have crippled his temple. However with a strangled cry he was sent skidding backwards towards Hinata, clutching his throat as his eyes watered. Suddenly the kumo squad leader had interposed himself between the two shinobi, the hilt of his sword pointed in Sasuke's direction. Hinata blinked in surprise, not having even seen him move only to cringe as he turned his sightless gaze on them. I do not appreciate people attacking my subordinates. He took a step forward only to pause, suddenly his blade came around in a flash of steel as an ear-shattering clang rang through the desolate camp. There was an incredible moment where Ami simply hung there, suspended by the grinding contact between her blade and the squad captains. However it couldn't last and, eyes narrowing, she used the leverage to flip herself over the man, placing herself between the Kumo Nin and her squad mates. Hinata, take Sasuke and get out of here. Sasuke looked ready to argue with that order but was currently suffering from a case of half-crushed windpipe and could only manage a few weak choking noises. The Hayuga seemed more indecisive, watching hesitantly as Emi took her stance, her expression becoming like steel. I'll hold them off for as long as I can, just go. At that Hinata took one look at the confused but hurriedly reorganizing Kumo Shinobi and the gasping Uchiha at her feet, grabbed him by the shoulder and took off in the opposite direction as fast as she was able. Your comrades have abandoned you. The Kumo captain intoned slowly as he wearily eyed Amy's stance, it was a habit of swordsmen to be wary of styles they did not recognize. How long do you really think you can hold us off, eventually we will simply defeat you and chase them down. However he saw no waver in Amy's expression, it was one of pure determination. I have to at least try. She shot back with a steely tone, the grip around her hilt tightening as his feet shuffled in accordance with his own movements. However the man didn't seem fully focused on her, instead raising a hand and ordering his subordinates to chase after her teammates. Before they could even move Amy's sword sliced through the air like a silver flash. Instantly a small crevice was carved between her and the Kumo Nin, she seemed to have at least caught their attention. Don't ignore me. She growled. You won't cross that line. All four of the shinobi looked at her in interest before all of them reached for their respective blade. If it is a kenjutsu fight you want young Konoha Kunoichi, then you have chosen poor opponents. Despite the taunt from the far more stoic squad leader Emi couldn't but help smirking cheekily. Oh I know, I'll try to go easy on you guys. Emi collapsed to her knees, her body battered and cut all over as she crept backwards across the ground. It was useless though, behind her only lay a high cliff and below that a rather uninviting river roared faintly in her ears. She'd like to think she had put up a fair fight, keeping the Kumo Shinobi at least occupied for a few minutes in what she hoped was enough time for her teammates to escape. However soon enough the others had peeled off, leaving her to face against their captain alone. It quickly became obvious who was more proficient with the sword. She took pride in the small wounds she had managed to inflict. I praise your teacher, he taught you well. The red-haired man spoke as he advanced on the beaten girl, spinning his blade once to remove it of her blood before sheathing it on his back. Emi would have felt insulted at the gesture but honestly, she was only barely able to crawl at this point, never mind launch any kind of assault. She couldn't even speak, the man seemed fond of aiming for the throat with his hilt and despite never giving him a direct hit the repeated attacks had taken their toll. Still, she settled for flipping him the bird as she inched her way closer to the cliff, Anko would expect no less. Cute. The man intoned drolly as Emi finally reached the cliff, with nowhere left to go he slowed his pace, advancing forward with an easy gait. However for just a moment he saw her eyes flicker downwards, his own widening in response as she suddenly used the last of her strength to push herself back. He jumped forward to catch her but only grasped at air as she fell out of his reach and into the swirling waters below. 
he gave the foaming waters a cursory glance before sighing at the wasted potential and walking away. A solitary man slowly walked down the sand bank of a river, hands in his cloak's pockets. It was relaxing to watch the waters ebb and flow endlessly. However something one wouldn't normally expect to find in such a place caught his eye. A young girl, her clothing torn and shredded with injuries littering her body, was tiredly, and with great effort, dragging herself onto shore with what seemed to be her only working arm. From the state of her it seemed miraculous she was even conscious and the man approached carefully. She didn't even seem to notice him until he was almost directly next to her, and that was only because she had rolled herself over and lay there gasping on the river bank like some beached fish. At that point her entire field of vision was taken up by his face, at least it would have been if it weren't for the mask covering it. The last thing she focused before the energy finally left her body was the glint of red she caught behind the mask's single eye hole. Chapter 34, Familiar Reunions Two cloaked figures moved silently through a darkened passage, lit only occasionally by the flickering fires of sparsely placed torches. Their feet made no sound against the dusty, well-worn ground despite one of their number's apparent interest in their surroundings, his head swiveled occasionally, eyebrow quirking at the seemingly uninteresting locale. The other simply strode forward with measured, confident steps, his red eyes smoldering beneath their wide brim sujgasa. So. Come here often? One finally spoke up, breaking the previously comfortable silence, at least in the opinion of his companion. At his lack of response the larger man simply continued on, chuckling lightly to himself as he glanced about the tunnel again. I never realized Konoha was so easy to break into. He placed his hands up by his head, displacing the large wrapped object strapped to his back. Just a nice, quiet stroll down a passageway. He grunted, hands returning to his side. Bit boring if you ask me. He glanced at his companion only to see him continue on stoically. It wasn't like the man to rise to his casual conversation so he was surprised when his dulcet tones graced his ears. Exit tunnels like these are common for Anbu operatives he intoned softly, continuing on before his companion could make a wisecrack, for all of the villages. The larger man nodded with a roll of his beady eyes, grinning to reveal a row of sharpened teeth. I suppose you'd know. This time his partner remained silent and they continued on for another good few minutes in that manner. You know, the larger one started up again, much to the silent chagrin of his companion, I thought you'd have a bit more to say, what with coming home again. At that the smaller one grunted, his features not changing in the slightest. Konoha has not been my home for over six years now, this is simply a mission. He responded coolly, not a hint of emotion seeping into his tone, that only seemed to make his companion even more determined to get under his skin though. Before he had a chance however the youngest of the pair raised his hand. Stop the exit is just up ahead, we will have to be discreet from here on. The blue-skinned of the pair grunted but acquiesced all the same, he suspected his partner just wanted a bit of quiet. They made it up and out of the old abandoned Anbu tunnel just fine with the use of a subtle earth jutsu and quickly concealed themselves in the shadows of the late evening streets. However oddly enough there wasn't even a hint of activity around them, no civilians, no shinobi, the streets were eerily empty. So this is Konoha during a war huh? The bigger one muttered under his breath, glancing about curiously, something seemed. Off with how easy this had all been so far. No Anbu patrols to run into, not even a hint of trouble getting past the barriers, even with his former Konoha companion he expected a bit more resistance. I would not know. Was his partner's only reply. Now quiet Kisame, the Anbu holding cells are this way. The former Kiri Nin waved the Uchiha off as the two slunk through the streets, flitting between shadows without a whisper. Once again they were unnerved by lack of apparent defenses in place around the village, easily slipping into the nondescript building that served as a holding pen for some of Konoha's more sensitive acquisitions. By this point Itachi practically knew something had to be wrong, several Anbu standard orders had been breached with the lack of general security and they should have at least had to deal with a patrol by now. I had the foresight to send them away. A quiet, toneless voice seemed to answer their unspoken queries as a certain redhead made his presence known. Instantly Itachi and Kisame's muscles tensed, although they showed no outward signs of it. Naruto. Itachi acknowledged with a slight tilt of his head, as if they were just old friends greeting after a few weeks apart and hadn't last seen each other at the end of the other's kunai. Wouldn't want to get some poor little Anbu involved in the big boy games after all. The former captain continued on as if he hadn't heard the man he used to consider a brother, his face looking rather bored for facing down two of the most dangerous nukenin to grace the elemental nations. So you're the famous second coming of the Flash huh? Kisume finally spoke up, casually tossing aside his sujgasa to reveal his blue-toned skin and gill-like tattoos. 
I expected you to be bigger. He titled his head with a toothy grin maybe a little bloodier, the nickname doesn't quite fit. The redhead regarded the enormous man evenly, his eyes never straying toward the slowly rotating Sharangan of his former friend. Kisame Hoshigake. He intoned blandly, as if reading a target out of a bingo book, it seemed to be most of a confirmation than an actual acknowledgement of the man's presence. The Jinchuriki is not here, is she? It wasn't really a question and Itachi's tone reflected that. She's. Safe. Naruto finally replied, stepping further out of the shadows of the dimly lit hallway and into a casual, unconcerned slouch worthy of Inara. So. You're a Jinchuriki. Anko started up cheerily, if not with a hint of uncertainty as she stared across the room at the mint-haired girl seated on the couch. Fu's feet and hands were bound and there was a chakra-suppressing collar around her neck so all she could really do was glare at the overly chipper Violette. I heard you met Naruto at his Chonin exams? Anko ventured again, feeling incredibly awkward having to play host to a woman who not a few days ago had tried to kill her boyfriend, yet supposedly was a good friend of his. He had just dumped her on the couch this afternoon, telling her to watch over her until he got back without even telling her why. Fu merely continued her piercing glare, rolling her shoulders to ease the discomfort of her restraints. Wanna play cards? Anko asked, before chuckling sheepishly as Fu's look finally changed into one of incredulity. The verdette glanced down at her restraints before glaring back up at the girl. Right, right. No hands. The two women once again lapsed into an awkward silence, with Anko in the room though it couldn't last for long. So you're a Jinchuriki? I won't let the Akatsuki have her, so this is as far as you go. The redhead stated resolutely, his lazy posture vanishing in an instant as he straightened himself up, a tri-pronged kunai appearing in his hand faster than his opponents could blink. Well. Kisame was cut off from his snarky comment as he was suddenly and violently pulled out the way by Itachi, a flash of silver steel slicing through the space where his neck had once occupied with a visible whine of displaced air. There was a moment of stillness before, in the same moment, a hair-thin slice appeared in the wall behind them and forms of Naruto and Itachi vanished into a red flash and a murder of crows respectively. I see you're as fast as ever Naruto. Itachi monotoned softly, Sharingan spinning calmly to pick out the locations already marked out by the redhead's Hiraishin, there were more than a few. You're still a fan of your illusions as well I see. The redhead responded glibly, sword already sheathed in a movement that only Itachi's Dujutsu picked up. Beside him Kisame rubbed at his neck with a mildly sheepish grin before slinging Seimata off his back with a vicious grin. Itachi's lips only quirked downward for a single instance. You know of the Akatsuki? The Uchiha intoned with less inflection than aboard Nara, trying to buy the pair a bit of time to think their way out of this situation while hoping Naruto still had a bit of a conversational streak with his enemies. Jiraiya decided to fill me in when he felt I was ready to know. The redhead air quoted with a snort, his posture outwardly relaxing in a bluff Itachi knew all too well, Naruto never truly relaxed in these situations. That does sound like the Toad Sage, Itachi agreed, mind whirling as he considered every exit out of Konoha and which would be best for escaping his former friend and teammate. The options were worryingly slim now that Naruto had mastered his father's famous technique. Yeah, and he also told me what he knew of the Akatsuki's current lineup, which is why I knew that pain. Only Kisame showed a hint of surprise at Naruto knowing the name of their leader would send you to retrieve Fu. The redhead's eyes darkened slightly as an almost invisible pressure settled on the corridor. Nobody knows the village better after all. The pressure from Naruto's chakra was nothing to the 2S rank, but the slight shimmer around the redhead's body spoke of his barely restrained emotions. Kisame we should retreat, we are in a disadvantageous position here, Itachi urged quietly, hands already flashing through signs in a hurried but coordinated blur. His grand fireball technique roared down the corridor, singing the walls and creating a partial vacuum in the confined, underground space. It was a fairly standard attack, one he was sure Naruto could dodge in his sleep, however that was not its purpose. He simply wanted to see how ingrained the Hiraishin seals were into their tag medium. He received his answer when Naruto appeared back in the corridor with a rather extravagant crimson flash. Retreat? Kisame seemed genuinely hurt by the comment, even if his sadistic grin said otherwise. I'm hurt you think me so inept Itachi-san. He growled happily, the bundle in his hand suddenly exploding outward to reveal a six-foot-long stretch of jagged and vicious-looking blue scales, a sword in the vaguest sense of the word. I've always wanted a crack at the bloody flash, ever since I heard he took Kushimaru's head. I wasn't. Itachi trailed off when he noticed Kisame was taking no notice of him, already charging down the hallway with a look of childish excitement plastered to his features. 
same auto screeched as the blue giant scraped the unwieldy blade down the length of the hallway. It seemed to chatter excitedly as he swung it in a powerful arc that no normal human should have been able to dodge, at least in such a cramped space. Bit out of your comfort zone hoshigake san Naruto asked curiously, hand under his chin as he crouched on top of Kisame's blade, once again proving he was no normal human by flashing onto the swordsman's famous weapon. He backflipped off almost immediately, simultaneously dodging a not-so-small hail of fire and shrouded shuriken and the spikes on Seimata suddenly thickening in an attempt to skewer his feet. Kisame's grin only widened, if that was possible, as he planted his blade against the floor. Kaki aren't we kid? The former Kiri Nin growled out without the normal threat that laced his voice, if there was one thing he appreciated it was a worthy opponent. He did however seem a tad annoyed Naruto refused to meet his eye, although that was more to do with the fact that Naruto was focusing on the pair's feet. It was the one place on Itachi's body he was almost sure that Uchiha couldn't cast his genjutsu from. It was a bit hindering but his reflexes allowed him to anticipate their movements in a somewhat bastardized form of guy's counter to the Sharingan. Only as much as I need to be. The redhead shot back with a smirk, only to tense as Kisame and Itachi began running through hand seals together. It seemed the two weren't going to try and take him on one at a time. Itachi's technique was first, being the faster of the two with his hand seals, water release, water fang bullet. He called out in his soft tones, the deadly technique rapidly spiraling up instead of at Naruto. It smashed right through the ceiling of the corridor at the same moment Kisame finished his own technique, drawing in a massive breath as he paused on the snake seal. He didn't even call out the name of the technique, simply spouting out an absurd volume of water from seemingly nowhere that rapidly rushed both down the corridor toward Naruto and up out of the fresh hole his partner had created. A few moments later and Naruto flashed onto the roof of the Anbu holding cells, shaking out his now wet hair with an irritated expression. This was why he hated missions to Kirigakur, it was such an inconvenience being wet, it weighed him down and chilled his muscles. He quickly observed the damage only to sigh in relief, with most of the water channeled up the surrounding streets were only flooded instead of destroyed like the pressure might have done otherwise. Pulling a scroll out of one of his pouches he quickly smeared some blood across the seal and threw it into the water. Almost immediately it began to drain away into the scroll like Naruto had pulled some invisible plug. Ah, didn't you like my redecorating? Kisame snarked as he appeared across from the redhead, Seimata lazily resting on his shoulder. He didn't give the redhead enough time to respond though as he suddenly shot forward at speeds that belied his bulky form. However when the Naruto his blade sheared through merely smirked his beady eyes widened. Itachi watched on him passively from an elevated position as the clone of Naruto violently exploded outwards in a familiar technique he himself had taught the redhead. He probably should have warned his partner but it seemed unnecessary when Kisame jumped back from the smoke cloud, only a little singed for the trouble. The Uchiha merely assumed Seimata had absorbed too much of the clone's chakra for the explosion to have done much damage. Damn, your friend is beginning to piss me off Itachi. Kisame growled as he glanced about at their surroundings, the stoic Uchiha was about to correct him when Naruto beat him to it, appearing a few feet away on the rooftop dancing from foot to toot, noticeably dry. That traitor's no friend of mine sushi roll. Both combatants missed the ever so slight twitch in Itachi's eye, too focused on one another as they were. Now move aside, I don't really feel like dicing you up today. His violet eyes drifted in the direction of Itachi, still not meeting the Sharingan's lulling gaze. I was trying to have a nice reunion here with a former teammate. It seemed that was the last straw for Kisame as the large man chuckled lowly, a familiar expression crossing his face that Itachi had come to recognize as the nuke nin becoming serious. Oh yeah, this one's mine Itachi, I don't care what history you have. His grin turned positively savage as he pointed Seimata at the redhead. I hope you don't mind if I make the bloody flash live up to his moniker do you? The Uchiha simply exhaled slowly, knowing nothing he said was going to hold his partner back now, instead he returned to scoping out their surroundings, wondering why no reinforcements had arrived yet, surely Naruto didn't believe he could take them both on, it was too suspicious. They were near the boundaries of the village sure, but still. Kisame, be cautious. He tried to warn, for all the affect it had on the Kiri Nin as the man suddenly blasted forward, swinging Seimata forward with all his strength. Surprisingly Naruto actually parried the blade, catching it between scales with his own Tonto. Itachi recognized it scratch for scratch as the one the redhead had used when they were still both in Anbu, the Uchiha couldn't even remember where he had abandoned his own. The redhead seemed to struggle under Kisame's strength but at least kept the unusual blade from cutting him. Well, you're stronger than Zabuza, that's for sure. He ground out, suddenly vanishing in a crimson flash. 
The sudden lack of resistance only put Kisame off balance for a moment before he swung Seimata around again, deflecting a glancing blow from the speedster. He was ready to counter only to have Naruto vanish again. Itachi could see what the redhead was doing and it didn't bode well for Kisame, he remembered how Naruto would scope out his opponent's strength and reflexes in this exact manner. Hardly a compliment kid, I could beat that muscled up idiot with one arm. Kisame shot back with a smirk, glancing about for any flashes of red that would give away his opponent's position. Move! Itachi intoned blandly, causing Kisame to jump back just as Naruto appeared right where he had been standing, Tonto held in a reverse grip and tri-pronged kunai thrust forward. Not too fast though are you? Naruto grinned, flashing off again so only his voice remained on the roof. Kushimaru was more of a challenge than you, at least he. He appeared behind Kisame, causing the man to swing at nothing as he suddenly appeared atop Seimata again, lashing out with a vicious kick that nearly broke the fish like man's nose could sort of keep up. Kisame growled angrily, flashing through hand seals and slamming his palms down only to remember all of his water had been taken away. Don't get riled up Kisame. Itachi once again offered helpfully from the rooftop, he knew better than anybody just how good the redhead could be at getting under people's skin. It was the main reason Shisui lost a lot of spars against the Namikaze. Thankfully the Kiri Nin seemed to take his advice on board, taking a calming breath before scouting out his surroundings. What is he doing Itachi? He called up, knowing the Uchiha had the better perspective with his elevated position and Sharingan. Itachi merely arched an eyebrow as he glanced down inwardly still wondering about the lack of reinforcements. I thought you did not wish me to interfere? He shot back blandly, only to receive a toothy grin as Kisame's reflexes took over and he blocked a downward sweep of Naruto's tanto. You know me so well partner. He growled out, staring into Naruto's violet eyes with a hungry energy as he pushed back against the Namikaze's blade, easily overpowering him. Naruto flipping back casually, shifting his stance a little as he nodded up to Itachi without actually looking at the team might want to be careful there, he's been known to betray his partners. He flashed suddenly onto Seimata again but Kisame had the foresight to lean back from the sweeping kick. He tried to reach forward and grab the offending leg only for Naruto to flash once again down the street when the whim strikes. Kisame growled at how easily the redhead was closing the distance between them before noticing Seimata squirm uncomfortably in his hand. The blade was drawing attention to the dark seal imposed on its scales which quickly glowed and vanished as Kisame willed the blade to absorb the chakra from it. Oh, you noticed? Naruto questioned nonchalantly, hand entering his pockets as the other sheathed his blade. Shame you forgot. Kisame suddenly felt a blinding pain ring inside his skull as he found a knee encompass his vision the one on your face. The next few seconds felt like they were stretched out into minutes for the Kiri Nin as Naruto proceeded to vanish and reappear what felt like a hundred times, each time landing a vicious or well-placed strike somewhere on his body. When he finally ceased the assault Kisame was still very blue, but a whole lot more black. You're not looking so good there sushi roll. The redhead smirked as Kisame's eyes refused to focus for a few moments. He finally regained his bearings, lashing out with Seimata only for Naruto to flash across the street lazily resting against a wall. Maybe you should slow down. The follow-up slash was once again dodged as this time the Namikaze appeared on Kisame's other side, still leaning casually on a wall. Relax a bit, maybe have a rest. Kisame's eye merely twitched as he brought the full force of Seimata down on the redhead, only for it to hit nothing but the ground, cratering it instantly. Hold still you little runt, or I'll give you something to dodge. He growled, eye twitching sporadically. However when he spotted Naruto up on a rooftop, feet swinging over the edge as carefree as could be, something inside of him snapped. I wouldn't do that. Naruto sang tauntingly, only to flash away as a ton of scaly death tried to lodge itself in his head. I'm warning you. He waggled his finger like a parent might to a disappointing child. It's a bad idea. He jibed in a whimsical tone as he once again infuriatingly avoided Kisame's swing with the ease one might in a spar against a Janan. That's it kid, screw subtlety, Kisame shouted, a vein on his forehead pulsing dangerously as he slammed his hands together. You call this subtle? The redhead chuckled as he glanced about at the ruined street they were fighting in, or at least he appeared to be looking at the damage. Yeah laugh it up, enjoy your last moments. The fish man growled as he completed his hand seals in a combination Naruto recognized and unfortunately for Kisame, had been waiting for. Water release, great exploding water colliding wave. Far from his previous technique a veritable ocean of water spewed from Kisame's mouth, rapidly forming into a tidal wave as it only continued to expand. 
However, as the shadow of the enormous mass of liquid bared down on the redhead he looked unconcerned, even a little disappointed. I warned you. He muttered, lost against the roar of Kisame's technique as he raised a single half-ram seal. Instantly four tags, placed around the street Kisame had been lured into by his enraged assault, glowed as invisible lines of chakra snaked out between them. Uzumaki-style, four-pillar prison seal. Even Kisame faltered as the massive influx of chakra suddenly roared to life, a thick purple barrier springing up not only between him and the redhead, but all around him in an all-encompassing cube. By the time he knew what was happening it was already too late and his technique had completely filled up the inside of the cube. Unfortunately for him it didn't stop there, he had already expended the chakra, there was no stopping the technique. Naruto watched, cringing slightly from outside the barrier he was maintaining as the water pressure within the cube only continued to grow. Kisame, trapped inside by his own technique, convulsed and writhed as his body was crushed mercilessly. Inside the cube the former Kiri Nin found himself actually smirking as his vision blackened and blood escaped his mouth in little pink swirls. He always knew his anger would get the best of him one day, and as he glanced up to the rooftop where Itachi had been watching the fight only to find it empty he sighed, nothing but bubbles escaping his constricted lungs. Figures. And then he saw nothing but black. Itachi never looked back as he quietly strode away from the village, hat returned to its place on his head. However he did pause, for just a moment, as a breeze caught the edge of his robe. It was just for a moment though before he continued on, blazing red eyes set forward and Sujgasa lowered to shade his features. Sorry Kisame, he sighed slowly as he vanished into the shadows of Konoha's famous trees, his voice just a whisper on the wind. Sorry. Naruto. Naruto sighed in irritation as he held up a paper seal to the side of the glowing barrier, watching as the water drained, in his opinion far too slowly, from inside. Did you manage to tag him? He called out to seemingly no one, only for a shadow to slip out of a nearby wall, their presence previously indistinguishable from the surroundings. Sorry Tai Ah, Naruto, he seemed to notice something when I got too close, Komachi apologized nervously, fiddling with one of the senbone she usually kept in her hair. It had been her job to try and sneak up on Itachi and stick him with the same kind of tracking seal Naruto had used on Guren. Konoha needed to know where the Akatsuki was based, even if Naruto had to set aside his personal feelings regarding his former friend. However getting close to the Uchiha sign was like passing under the gaze of an apex predator, even for Komachi it felt like every time she got even remotely close those swirling red eyes were locked right on her. It's alright, it was a long shot to begin with. The redhead sighed, masking his disappointment he knew better than anyone that it was no easy task sneaking up on an Uchiha, never mind Itachi. I'll just finish up here and go report to Hiruzen. Komachi nodded quickly, inwardly glad just to be done with this assignment, despite the failure. However as she left another Anbu seemed to materialize into position, taking her place. If anything the boar masked man seemed even more nervous than her. Ah Namikaze-san. I have some news. Naruto raised an eyebrow, not taking his attention off the cube he was still draining. It's about the Chonin team we sent to the Ta border, your former squad. The Hokage thought it best you know. Emi heard her groan echo around her as she blinked her eyes open, instantly regretting it as the light pierced her retinas like hot pokers. Taking a moment to get used to the swimming sensation in the back of her head and take stock of all the aches across her body she eventually managed to prop herself up on her elbows, taking in what appeared to be a cave through blurry vision. She glanced about, noting the campfire a short distance away from her before her eyes naturally drifted to the man stoking it. Ah! She could help but shriek as she caught sight of his face, or what appeared to be his face in her disoriented view. It looked more like some kind of demon than any kind of man she knew, with a gruesomely stretched grin and a single, evilly winking eye. She jumped back only to immediately regret it, forgetting the demonic visage as pain lanced through her side. It felt like her chest had been caved in, only to be reset and caved in again. Whoa whoa, take it easy. The man finally noticed her conscious state, crossing the distance between them faster than was natural only for Emi to scoot back even more. She pushed the pain to the back of her mind as best she could in order to escape the monster but it still showed on her face. After a moment of confusion the man's single visible eye, a deep obsidian black, widened in realization and he pulled at his own face. Emi realized it was a mask at the same moment he tossed it to the side carelessly, a sheepish grin passing over surprisingly handsome features. Oh, sorry about that, sometimes I forget I'm even wearing it. He muttered, more to himself than to her. It took a moment but Amy's vision did clear enough to get a good look at him. But beyond her initial assessment she didn't learn much. 
Untidy black hair fell about his face and it looked like he had been growing it for a good few years as it tumbled messily across his right eye, obscuring it. He chuckled again, rubbing the back of his head in a way that reminded Emi far too much of Naruto. Don't worry about the mask, it's just something I wear to scare the locals off, he sighed, staring out the mouth of the surprisingly spacious cave they occupied. Sometimes it's a bit too effective, I like my privacy as much as the next guy but. He trailed off, seemingly realizing he had been rambling as he noticed Amy's incredulous expression. But ah. Are you okay? I found you washed up on the beach, pretty banged up. I wrapped you up the best I could but, ah, medical. Stuff, was never really my strong suit. Emmy looked down, noticing her chest and a few of her larger wounds on her arms and legs were wrapped up. Thank you. She finally managed in a somewhat hoarse voice, taking the hint the messy-haired man quickly scrambled across the cave, returning with a flask of water for her. As she drank she noticed a neat stack of her clothes off to one side, only then noticing that she seemed to have been changed into thankfully dry spares she kept with her equipment. Noticing her look she almost wanted to laugh as the man turned a virulent shade of red, averting his gaze. I I didn't look, promise. He squeaked, making Emmy chuckle slightly as she finished her drink with a satisfied sigh. Who are you? She diverted, quick to move away from the idea of any looking or lack thereof. Anko would have been disappointed in her for not at least trying to tease the man over it but she was too sore and too tired to care. Ah. He also looked thankful for the change of subject, grinning nervously as he ran a hand through his dark hair just your friendly neighborhood hermit. He seemed a little evasive but Emi could excuse a little eccentricity from the man who probably saved her life. A rather awkward silence seemed to press down on them for a few moments before Amy's stomach rumbled, echoing uncomfortably in the spacious cave. Right. Food. The man nodded, scrambling up and away towards a few crates to the back of the inlet. Emi sighed thankfully before looking about the space she found herself in, trying to glean just where exactly that river had carried her. She never noticed the man take a subtle glance back at her, his left eye swirling for a moment into a deep scarlet. By the time she looked back though his visage was back to sheepish as if nothing had changed, hand once again submerged in that shock of black hair. Well I have um, fish. Or fish. Chapter 35, Familiar Revelations. Emmy stared across at the man in front of her, ravenously eating away at his skewered fish, it appeared that being a hermit did little for one's table manners. That, combined with her still fuzzy head and various body aches was making her feel a little green and her own fish on a stick went largely untouched. She used the opportunity instead to try and glean anything she could about her rescuer. His long, unruly hair made pinpointing his age a little difficult but he was definitely older than her, by maybe five or six years. He was handsome, as she had thought before, and for some reason a lot of his features reminded her of Sasuke. This of course led to her imagining said teammate with similarly long, messy hair only to nearly choke on her mouthful from laughter. She couldn't imagine the proud and, although he wouldn't admit it, vain Uchiha sign with anything less than his perfect hair. The man was dressed rather plainly and a lot of his clothes seemed heavily worn and patched, but she supposed hermits didn't have a lot of motivation to go clothes shopping. Speaking of which, she thought hermits were supposed to be old, antisocial grouches with too much about the world to complain about. This young man in front of her didn't seem the type, for one he just seemed so. Carefree. There was an energy to his movements, beyond the fact that M.E. could definitely feel the chakra within him, it was surprisingly powerful and, even more shockingly, the only thing she could compare it to would be her sensei. So. He finally spoke up, noticing her not eating her food and finishing up with his own what's going on in the world? Seeing her blank look he elaborated, once again scratching the back of his head in a way that was so infuriatingly. Naruto. Not a lot of news reaches this little part of the world. He smirked to himself as a chuckle escaped his lips, especially round my neck of the woods, he laughed, only to quiet as Emi continued to stare at him blankly. Oh. Ah, uh, that would have been funnier if you knew we were in the woods, he stated lamely, only to look down and grumble to himself when Emi didn't give him so much as a smile. Nobody appreciates good comedy anymore. Emi actually found herself sighing at the almost pathetic sight before her, no grown man should be moping around like that. Is that why you became a hermit, to hone your comedy? She offered dryly, throwing him a bone only to have him grin like a loon. Amongst other things. He evaded, still grinning. Now come on, I think a bit of current affairs is the least you can do for dragging you out of that river. Emi sighed before shrugging, the man seemed harmless enough, and he had saved her. Well, I suppose you mean aside from the war? Upon seeing his raised eyebrow she nearly dropped her fish in the fire. 
you don't even know about the war? He simply shrugged, I don't think you quite understand just how far into nowhere we are kid. Emmy pouted at being called a kid before sobering. That's another thing, where exactly am I? She was surprised when the man procured a map from seemingly nowhere, and not just any map. Hey that's mine. He shushed her, waving his hand at her petulantly before pointing vaguely at a position near the river she had drifted down. Just about here. More or less. Emmy scowled at the man before her expression became more thoughtful, she had drifted nearly half a kilometer away from the cliffs, but more importantly from her teammates, she could only hope that she had bought them enough time to get away. So tell me about this war. The man spoke up, pulling her out of her worried thoughts and back into the present. I assume Konaha is involved? Suddenly Amy's muscles locked up as her entire form became defensive and suspicious. Immediately the man raised his hands innocently. Whoa, whoa, calm down, I saw your headband. He quickly placated, the offending item suddenly hanging from his hands. Emmy quickly snatched the length of cloth and metal away from him, giving him as mean a scowl as she could manage with what felt like a half dozen bruised ribs. Stop stealing my stuff. He just grinned innocently, as a hermit, I prefer borrowed, hoping you wouldn't notice it was gone, it makes me come off a bit better right? His form seemed to slump a little when Emmy just narrowed her eyes. That's stealing. She muttered in irritation, only growing more annoyed when he shrugged nonchalantly. Kunai, kunai, same difference. He shot back with a disarming smile. After grumbling to herself for a few moments about hermits that couldn't respect personal property she acquiesced. Yeah, Konoha is at war with Kuza, Taki, Otto. She admitted, before remembering the circumstances that brought her here in the first place. And Kumo. The man let out a long whistle, looking at the wall of a cave for a moment with wide eyes. Damn, how did they manage that? That's the entire northern border. He didn't notice Amy's eyes narrowing a little at the observation. Well what else is going on in the world? You're a Kunoichi right? What's going on in Konoha? He asked suddenly, diverting the conversation. What does it matter to you? Emmy jibed defensively, nibbling at her fish as an excuse not to answer. I get curious about all you shinobi types you know, a lot of stories fly around about you guys. He shot right back with a grin, when she didn't answer he pressed a bit more. What about teammates? Sensei? Must have been someone good for you to survive the injuries you had. It was more like a reflex at that point for her to shout, of course Naruto sensei is good, he's going to be the next Hokage. In the heat of the moment she didn't even notice the man's eye widen invisible shock. He has a team? He muttered, face cast into an expression of surprise, only to shake himself out of it when faced with Amy's curious and suspicious look. I mean. Naruto Namikaze has a team? Even out here we get a lot of stories about that guy, from what I'd heard he didn't seem the type. Amy's eyes stayed narrowed as she took a bite from her fish, only to grimace, it had gone cold. Right. Emmy drawled before her curiosity overcame her. So what exactly do you hear about Naruto-sensei? At that the man gained an embarrassed grin. Oh you know, the usual stuff for you shinobi types, daring deeds, amazing powers, fastest man alive yada yada. He shrugged lackadaisically before leaning back against the cave wall, rubbing his stomach contentedly. Right, us shinobi types, Emmy agreed slowly, finishing off her fish and placing it to the side at least being a hermit seemed to do nothing to damper one's cooking skills. Anyway, I should be going. She shifted, finding that her various aches and pains wouldn't slow her down too much, he had done a good job on the bandaging. The man appeared to agree, nodding quickly as he lazily pushing himself to his feet. Right right, your teammates are probably worried anyway. When Emi directed a pointed gaze at him he simply grinned, you shinobi do go about in teams right. She only maintained the narrowed gaze at him for a moment before a twinge in her side forced her to look away. As she walked away he waved to her from beside the fire, the dancing light washing out his features for a moment as his visible eyes seemed to flash red. But it was only for a moment and Emmy played it off as a trick of the light. See a kid, come back anytime, my cave's always open. There was a pause before the man began to laugh again. Get it? Because it doesn't have a door? The veal let simply stifled a groan and strode on, suddenly feeling rather happy to be getting away from the strange hermit. However even as she walked, tracing her way back to the river to get her bearings, she considered some of the oddities she had noticed. First of all he was able to read her map, it was encoded in a way only shinobi should have been able to decipher it. Then he used both pronunciations of kunai, civilians did not do that, not ones that she knew of. Finally there was just something in the way he moved, 
with control and precision that non shinobi just couldn't get naturally. However, the kicker came when she realized she had never even asked the man his name, that was unlike her. She had been trained to gather as much information as possible in any situation, why had she ignored that training? She winced, blinking rapidly as she stumbled forward a step. She was trying to think back, to try and discern anything else she missed, however even as she thought about it, it was becoming more and more difficult to even remember what the man had looked like. In a last bid she turned on her heel and jogged back the way she came. Or, at least, she thought it was the way she came. For some reason she couldn't find the cave again, but she had only taken a few steps out of it right? In fact, what was she looking for again? She couldn't remember, at least, until the sound of water reached her ears. Right, the river, she had been looking for the river to find her bearings, she needed to get back to her teammates. Shaking her head of the weird fuzziness that seemed to be clouding her thoughts, she set a determined look on her features and ran off upstream. She winced as her injuries protested the movement, but she had done a good enough job bandaging herself up that she was confident she'd make it back to Konoha. The man watched silently from a nearby tree as Emi seemed to fight with herself before finally rushing off in the direction of the river. When she finally left his vision he nodded to himself once before cracking his neck and dropping to the forest floor. She had been a good source of information, the type of person he imagined he would get on well with, it was a shame. She actually reminded him quite a bit of him. Damn tomato head, you were supposed to take care of things while I was gone, only to go and throw yourself into a war, he sighed, glancing up at the sky and scratching the back of his head before letting out a long exhale. I suppose it's time I stopped hiding huh? He looked back to his cave and groaned, so much good food was going to go to waste. When I had just gotten good at being a hermit too. His groan quickly flipped to a grin so fast it was though some invisible switch had been pulled. Ah well, time to go see how much you guys screwed up the world without me, he chuckled as he adjusted his oni mask so that his single Sharangan eye blazed steadily through the single eye hole, walking with silent footsteps out into the forest. Honestly, gotta do everything myself. Naruto stared at the full sake bottle sitting in front of him, just stared at it as he rested his head on one hand. The couch he was sitting on was his favorite as a child, sitting in his mother's lap as she tried to knit some abomination she called clothing or listening with rapt attention as his father would regale him with stories of shinobi, past and present. It didn't feel so comfortable now, not with the weight that seemed to have settled over his shoulders. The only reason he hadn't touched the bottle yet was because a large part of him refused to believe Emi was actually dead. You only drank to memories and Emi was no memory, not yet. Hell Anko had been MIA for months before they had found her, he wasn't one to give up so easily. That wouldn't make telling Anko or, heaven help him, Yu Gao any easier though. So when he heard footsteps he immediately swiveled in place, catching Anko off guard as she paused at the foot of the stairs, clad in nothing but an oversized shirt. Oh, hey Naruto, what was up with last night anyway? You dumped that girl off on me without warning then just run off? Naruto found his words catching in his throat as he watched her suddenly shake her head, an excited gleam entering her eyes. Anyway that doesn't matter, you'll never guess what, she exclaimed brightly. Anko I. He struggled to find the words for a moment, Emi had been like a little sister to Anko I need to tell you something, it's however he was suddenly cut off as Anko sprung forward, pressing a finger to his lips with a predatory grin. Uh uh, me first. She grinned, taking a few swirling steps backwards, she seemed a whole lot. Bubblier than normal. Finally she composed herself before taking a deep breath and brightly exclaiming, I'm pregnant. And just like that Naruto's entire world ground to an abrupt halt, his words dying on the tip of his tongue. Why you're? He just about managed, quickly earning a happy nod from Anko, in fact he had never seen her quite so. Ecstatic. There really was no other word for it. Aha. Uh-huh. She beamed brightly, he couldn't tell if it was from the news or if she was just enjoying the dumbfounded expression on his face. I'm going to be a father. That was the one, singular thought that was running around his head, as if on loop, however when he finally voiced it he couldn't quite believe his own ears. Yep. Anko nodded helpfully again, her grin only stretching even further across her cheeks somehow. A dad. He managed again, quite eloquently as he would later recall. MHMM, Anko agreed, seemingly losing amusement in his reaction at this point, it didn't seem to matter as much though when the gears in Naruto's head finally clicked together and meshed. His eyes brightened at the same moment he rushed forward, grabbing Anko around the waist, picking her up and suddenly spinning her around. We're going to be parents. The joy was practically palpable in his voice, all other thoughts suddenly vanishing from his mind. He was going to have a son, or daughter. 
or twins, the thought briefly made him gulp before his previous happiness washed over him again. Anko seemed just as excited as he was, grabbing him tightly and wrapping her legs around his waist as she pulled him in for a searing kiss. A million thoughts rushed through Naruto's mind as they just stood there, absorbed in each other's presence. However when they finally separated, Naruto's eye caught a picture frame on a nearby table. It was of him as a young child, his arms draped around the neck of his parents as they hoisted him between them. Cold reality came crashing down on him in the wake of his euphoria. He was going to be a father, there would be a tiny, fragile little life that would depend on him and Anko completely. He was going to be bringing a life into the world, into this world. A world of war, and pain, and loss. Right at that moment, as his expression hardened and his eyes became icy with determination, he vowed to himself that he would always be there for his child, no matter what, nothing would ever tear his family apart, nothing. Not again. Anko seemed to sense his sudden shift, pulling back with a concerned frown, is everything okay? Snapped back into the present by her shaking voice he quickly realized how he might have worried her and smiled warmly. He pulled her closer and placed a gentle kiss on her forehead before wrapping her up and simply holding her against him for a long few seconds. Everything's fine, or at least. It will be. He pulled back away from her and began to move upstairs, Anko rushing after him. Where are you going? She called from the bottom of the stairs, causing the redhead to turn and look down at her from the landing. Don't worry, there's just something I have to go do real quick. He smiled disarmingly. I'll be back in time to share a drin he paused, glancing down at her stomach quickly, to celebrate with you. With that he turned and swept into his office, causing Anko to pout as she moved herself back over to the couch and plopped herself down, arms crossed under her chest in a huff. When she saw him again it was in a bright red flash as he reappeared in the hallway, already making for the door. Where are you going now? She demanded from her place leaning over the back of the couch. He simply waved a hand at her, already striding out the door, be right back, I'm going to go end a war before it starts, he shouted back in an indecipherable tone. Anko just huffed, before blinking as she remembered something. Hey, what was the thing you wanted to tell me? She called out too late as the door slammed shut. The scratch of a pen on paper broke the shallow silence of a small, hidden grove just south of the border between Kaminari and Shimo. A dark-skinned, bulk of a man dressed in a heavily modified version of the Kumagakuri uniform sat on a log to one side. His sunglasses-covered face was screwed up in concentration as he mused out loud, writing in a tiny notebook every so often. Yo, yo that's my flow, you know. He paused, finger against his chin as he stared at the page before frowning and quickly scratching it out. Nah man, that's amateur stuff, not worthy of the killer bee. We? His ears perked up as someone else suddenly invade his little sanctuary, a tall red-haired man he had never seen before but looked oddly familiar. What's up my man? you come with a plan? Are you here to see, the one and only killer bee? Those autographs ain't free, you mean? The man stopped, an eyebrow quirking in what might have been amusement if his expression wasn't so otherwise serious. Sorry, not here for an autograph. It was then that the light caught the man's headband, tied around his bicep over the rolled up sleeves of his jounin uniform. You're Kiribai? The brother of the Yondaime Rakage? The man in question simply grinned as he launched himself to his feet, quickly pocketing the little notebook. The one and only, of the legendary A and B. The man simply observed the muscle-bound man for a few more moments before nodding to himself. All right. The next few things happened faster than most would have been able to follow but it culminated in Naruto pressing his wind-infused Tanto up against two crossed swords practically buzzing with electricity as Kiribai held him back, muscles visibly straining from the sudden assault. Before Naruto knew what hit him he was sent flying back across the clearing, only to flip and land on his feet. He faintly saw something pink slip back behind Kiribai but wasn't sure what it was. Whoa man, you gotta chill out, I ain't sure what this is all about, in order to clear this fog we gotta start up a dialogue, we. Kiribai rapped quickly as Naruto shot toward him again, Tanto drawn and shimmering with vicious green energy. The man was visibly nervous as he dodged back from the initial swing, deflecting the next and ducked under the third. When he swung back up for a vicious uppercut Naruto simply flashed to the other side of the clearing. It had only taken Kira by the initial burst of high-speed movement for him to recognize the bloody flash from the bingo book. Why's a guy like the big bad flash, wanting to go all smash and crash, fool ya fool. He started up during the brief reprieve, only to have the redhead glare at him. I didn't start this, I'm just ending what your brother started before anyone else dies, unfortunately I need you to do that. We might have been friends under better circumstances. 
With that he flashed forward again, however in the lull in combat he gave Kiribai time to collect himself and suddenly found the air around the man littered with swords, seven in all. In obviously well-practiced and deceptively ridiculous movements the Kumo Jinchuriki caught them all across various places in his body. It gave him the look of a metal porcupine with them all sticking out at odd angles. Ah ma'am, whops big budun mo, I pick a sabbatical and he goes and sparps a row. Kiribai grumbled through the sword held in his mouth. Naruto eyed him hesitantly for a few moments, the sword style may have looked laughable but the way the man held himself spoke of countless hours in training. The number of blades alone made him cautious enough to sheath his tanto and instead bring out two of his kunai, something told him he would need the extra maneuverability. Surprisingly it was Kiribai who made the first move, launching himself forward right at the redhead with considerable speed, well above a normal jounin at least. There was a reason he was considered the second strongest man in Kumagakur. That didn't matter though, if Naruto couldn't defeat him then nothing he was doing right now would matter. So instead he dived right at him, kunai shrieking with energy and eyes darting about frantically at each of the swords, keeping track of them all in their high-speed frenzy. Kiribai was genuinely surprised at the first ever opponent to rush him, especially considering his veritable buzz saw of a body. That moment of ever so slight hesitation cost him as Naruto suddenly appeared within his guard, somehow managing to parry three different blades at once with his two kunai. What looked like a fourth, although Kiribai knew that to be impossible, suddenly struck out at him. He leaned his head to the side and only received a light scratch along his cheek for the trouble, or he thought so until he heard something snap and his vision became considerably lighter. My shades, he lamented softly as his sunglasses fell to the ground in two pieces, his dark eyes narrowing instantly. Yo ma'am, mo ip's personal. Anyone that knew him personally would have been surprised when he stopped rapping and understood just how serious he had become. His limbs suddenly came in as a blur of whirring blue light as his swords appeared to multiply right before Naruto's eyes. Suddenly the air around the two became a maelstrom of steel, lightning and displaced air. There were no openings in the man's guard and the sheer number of weapons he was able to bring to bear at dizzying angles actually managed to go a long way in neutralizing whatever advantage Naruto's superior speed and reflexes would have given him. It was stalemated for them, Naruto could block, parry or divert all of the man's attacks but land none of his own. At this rate it was becoming a battle of attrition and between the containers of the Hachibi and Kyubi that was going to be a very, very long battle of attrition. Suddenly Naruto dived backwards to escape the melee of sharp steel, hands already cycling through seals. Wind release, shearing gale. As he exhaled, five long scythes of lethally sharp wind lanced out at Kiribai, forcing the man to bring around five of his blades to destroy them. But then, the plan was never for the jutsu to hit, the millisecond Naruto's feet touched solid ground he was already pushing chakra through his toes. He rocketed forward in a blur of red, right on the tail of his own technique. His eyes tracked Kiribai's weapons, five of them locked down and defending against his technique. One of them was in the crook of his right knee, behind the man and useless. The last was suddenly knocked out from his mouth as Naruto flicked his wind-enhanced kunai at it, the prongs of the small blade catching the suba and wrenching it out from the jinchuriki's teeth. Suddenly Kiribai found himself staring at the business end of Naruto's knee, in what was sure to be a move that would knock him out or at least disorient him, with no humane way to defend against it in time. Naturally Naruto's surprise was immense then as he suddenly found what looked to be an eighth sword interposed between Kiribai and himself. It forced him to bring around his kunai to prevent his head being cleanly separated from his shoulders. The two clashed and in a contest of strength that, with his superior build and Naruto's lack of leverage in the air, Kiribai quickly won, flinging the red head back across the clearing. Man Mr. Nine, that move was too damn fine, you fool, Kiribai exclaimed energetically now that his mouth was free the previous insult against his shades apparently forgotten in his excitement. Naruto quickly grasped why his plan had failed as he saw a long grayish ink octopus tentacle holding a sword defensively in front of Kiribai, apparently the very same one he had knocked out of the man's mouth. It emerged from the man's back but quickly slithered back after replacing the displaced sword. I see I gopa mock IP up a few pegs. The Kumo Shinobi shouted, once again muffled by the hilt he was biting. However Naruto didn't get to ponder the ludicrousness of the situation as a foul pressure began to invade the air. A familiar and noxious chakra began to bubble up from Kiribai's skin, finally enveloping the man in a sickly orange layer of surprisingly crisp and controlled by Juu chakra. Four tails waved lazily behind him as he grinned through the sword in his teeth. Let's see how you handle this. He growled in a mildly distorted voice before rocketing forward at alarming speeds, the ground cratering in his wake. Naruto's reflexes easily moved his body to the side, Kiribai was still slower than him, 
however the lance of pure energy was a bit harder to dodge and he was rewarded with a light burn across his arm. Despite being a Jinchuriki himself Naruto had never had all that much exposure to his own Baiju's chakra. That stuff would be just as dangerous to him as it would be to others, perhaps not toxic, but just as damaging. He had grown tired of engaging the Jinchuriki directly anyway, quickly throwing out a handful of kunai that rapidly multiplied into 50 with a few well-placed head seals. Before Kiribai knew what hit him the tables had been turned yet again and he was swiftly assaulted by what looked to be an army of feet appearing out of red flashes that were gone before they were even fully visible. Even covered in Baiju Chakra the sustained assault, with no way to block it, couldn't be endured for long. With a roar that shook the trees around them Naruto was suddenly blasted back by a surge of particularly dense and foul chakra. In the center of it all stood Kiribai, swords gone only to be replaced by eight blood-red appendages of pure energy. Instead of the semi-translucent coverage the four-tailed state had provided, Kiribai was now shrouded in an opaque red layer that looked more like blood than anything else. Naruto didn't get a lot of time to admire it though as suddenly the chakra-shrouded beast was blasting towards him, creating a small shockwave from his speed. One arm was outstretched and in a blink a full ox skull imposed itself across the bicep, that was level with Naruto's neck. Lariat. Was all Naruto heard as he bent his body back, allowing the charging arm to pass straight over him. He was glad he didn't attempt to halt the raging Jinchuriki as it took around four trees to finally halt his momentum. He turned, revealing soulless white voids that seemed to ask for eyes and a mouth full of jagged, misaligned things that Naruto supposed were teeth. He sighed before cracking his neck, settling back into a loose, comfortable stance as he motioned at the transformed Kiribai with one hand. Mistake number one, fighting a seal master as a massive chakra. Kiribai seemed to grin at that, although it was hard to tell. With a grunt he lined up for another charge, what passed for muscles in his strange form tensing. With a growl he shot off again, this time even faster as the ox skull created velocity rings in its wake. Mistake number two, Naruto called out as he spanned to the side at the last moment, allowing the charging beast to fly right by him unscathed. Giving up the advantage your blades gave you. Kiribai snorted angrily at that, looking even more the picture of a bull facing a matador. He never even noticed Naruto's smirk as the Namikaze ushered him forward once again. And mistake number three, Kiribai noticed the gleam in the redhead's eye when it was already too late and he was a few feet away, unable to halt his own momentum. Thinking this clone was actually me, boom. The explosion that followed rent the trees around the clearing back violently, sending smoke and ash high into the sky that could be seen for miles around. It was enough to say that Naruto had not held back on Kiribai's account. Marui was, for all intents and purposes, having a fairly boring day. Despite guarding one of Kumagakura's more entrenched camps, nothing was happening and likely wouldn't for a while. They were in the tundra of Shimo no Kuni, right on the border with Kaminari where it was just far enough away to not be home, but certainly cold enough to feel like it. He watched the campfire flicker pathetically, not really holding up against the snowy winds all that well. For a second he could have sworn the fire turned red for just a moment but passed it off. Or at least, he did until he noticed the sudden silence that had descended over the camp. He looked up only to see a man standing right in the middle of the clearing, at his feet a very recognizable kunai. It wasn't just any man though, it was a man most would recognize as quickly climbing his way to a flea on sight order in the bingo books. Slung under his arm was a man all the Kumo Shinobi would recognize even in the most bruised and bloody state, which was good because he wasn't far off from it. Naruto threw Kiribai down roughly, placing a foot on his back and his tanto dangerously close to the Hachibi Jinchuriki's neck, so much so that the fluctuating wind chakra actually sliced a paper-thin line into his skin. He glanced around at the assembled shinobi pointedly, as if summing them up with his gaze alone. One of you go message your rakage, tell him the god I'm Hokage wants to talk to him. Chapter 36, Familiar Duels The tension in the air was palpable, nobody daring to make a noise above the slight crackle of the campfire. An attempt might have been made to rescue their captive comrade, but there was something about the quiet intensity with which Naruto stood there, blade never wavering from Killer B's neck, that stopped them in their tracks. Instead they all just waited there, silently, for the half hour it took for the messenger hawk to make it back to Kumagakur. While the wait for the message to arrive was tortuously slow, the response was rather more. Abrupt. Naruto was the first to notice, suddenly taking a step back and dragging Killer B upright, still with the humming blade inches from the bigger man's neck. The Kumo Shinobi acted predictably, each taking a step forward with their weapons drawn in anticipation of action. They needn't have bothered though as a moment later a hulking mass, disguised poorly as a bolt of lightning, crashed into the clearing with the subtlety of. Well, 
The subtlety of the rakage. Namikaze. Standing in a small crater of his own making, the enormous bull of a man that was the fourth rakage glared at the much smaller and decidedly calmer Konoha Nin with all the murderous intent a man of his size could muster. That was to say, a lot. Rakage Dono, Naruto greeted with a small incline of his head, as if he wasn't holding the man's brother at sword point. The level greeting only seemed to infuriate the man further. He was only held in check by the mental maths of whether he thought himself fast enough to reach Naruto and cave in the redhead skull before the smaller man could slit his brother's throat. I was a prideful man, but he wasn't, as some were lead to believe by his brash tendencies, an idiot. He seemed to take a moment to forcefully rein his emotions in, locking them behind a stern facade all good leaders were forced to acquire at some point. When he was done, he was no longer humming with the restrained energy of his signature lightning armor and instead stood at his full, impressive height with his arms crossed. The only remaining sign of his displeasure was the slight throb of a vein on his forehead. Naruto hadn't moved an inch, almost reverting back to his days as an Anbu captain with the extreme control he exerted on his expression. The rakage was truly an impressive man, no so much in his stature, although he was definitely the largest man Naruto had ever seen, but with his presence. Even Killer B, sheathed in the noxious chakra of his full eight tails mode, did quite measure up. Naruto almost wanted to laugh at the fact that, against all odds, he didn't find himself in the least bit intimidated. Here he was standing in front of the man whose speed was even acknowledged by his father, and had only decades to become stronger, and he only found himself excited, giddy even. So, the man ground out through gritted teeth. I heard you had something you wanted to talk about. Naruto nodded. A proposition if you would, to minimize casualties from this unnecessary war. I'm listening, I said, although the glance down at his still unconscious brother added the unspoken, because I have little choice. Me and you, one fight, right here. From the way the rakage's eyebrow quirked Naruto could tell he'd caught the man's interest. I win, Kumo retreats back to their borders behind Shimo no Kuni, immediately, no question, no stalling. Any Konoha prisoners taken will be returned, unharmed and a reconciliation payment will be made for each man killed since you started this invasion. Naruto had rehearsed the offer in his head a hundred times while he was waiting for the man to show up. He had been expecting a number of outcomes, indignant cries, outrage, being laughed off as a lunatic. What he hadn't expected was the grin that suddenly overtook the rakage's features. It wasn't a pleasant expression. And if I were to take you up on this? Challenge. What would happen when I win? Naruto could hear the careful wording there that boasted the man's confidence and had to bite down a snarky retort. Things Anko would say were not on the list of appropriate diplomatic responses, no matter how cathartic it might have been. Kumo would keep any territories they've claimed up until now, we would return all Kumo prisoners currently in our possession, including the same reconciliation payment for casualties I'm demanding. Already he could hear the phantom yells of the clan head in his ears for what he was saying, there would be hell to pay for this even if he won. And. I would guarantee no retaliatory action from Konoha for five years. That was particularly painful to say and was sure to catch him a lot of flack when he got home. Hell, if he got home. After threatening the rakage's brother the man may not be in the most charitable mood. Obviously, the terms were at least enough to make the bulky man think about it, although Naruto was rather banking on the man's reputation of making executive decisions without a great deal of input from his advisors. It would mostly determine if he could pull off this lunacy he was loosely calling a plan. On what authority are you making, or enforcing these terms? The rakage asked after a drawn-out period of reflection. That limp-wrist Sarutobi doesn't seem the type to broker terms so clean-cut. Ignoring the slight to his leader, he had the feeling he'd have the chance to get his own back pretty soon, Naruto drew himself up to his full height, hoping he looked somewhat impressive. As Naruto Namikaze, Godime Hokage of Kanahagakura no Sato. There was another long moment as the full weight of his words sank into the clearing, including somewhat to Naruto himself. He knew what he said to the shinobi when he'd first gotten here, but this was the first time he really meant it. He was the Hokage. Or he would be, if he survived this stunt. And what's stopping me from reneging the moment you take that sword away from my idiot brother's neck? The rakage asked in a surprisingly diplomatic tone, considering the fact that a moment ago he had looked ready to personally bulldoze the surrounding forest and damn the consequences. Well, I'm not going to bandy around words like honor, we're shinobi. Naruto shot back, feeling a little easier now that his claim seemed to have been accepted. But I've heard, at least, that you're a man who respects individual power. That's all I'm doing here, wagering my power against yours. Simple as that. 
I just grunted, still looking vaguely amused. Some classic mono a mono stuff? He inhaled deeply, glancing around his assembled men, none of whom seemed like they had a clue what to do in this situation. It wasn't unprecedented in Kumo to have such challenges, although never with somebody from a different nation, or for stakes quite so high. I suppose I can get behind that. Although why should I accept? Even if I win I could potentially get much more from this invasion if I press on, your village is weak right now, stretch thin. A hard look entered the redhead's eye. Because Konoha, no matter how weakened, will burn you for every inch of land you take. He surprised everyone when the flow of chakra to his blade suddenly cut out, smoothly sheathing it in a fluid motion. And you're a cage. He motioned for one of the Kumo Nin to take Killer B away and, after a hesitant look at his leader, the man complied. Which means you care about every soldier under your command. Naruto knew this was the critical juncture, in normal politics he had essentially committed suicide by throwing away his leverage. But this was shinobi politics, and he wasn't exactly talking to a normal diplomat. There was the tensest and longest pause yet before finally, and with a great deal of internal relief, the rakage grinned. Deal. They had moved to a much more open space in the forest, closer to the border with Shimo so that a light dusting of snow covered the ground while hoarfrost crept up the trees. It might have been rather picturesque if Naruto wasn't about to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a man who could take his head off by flexing his bicep too hard. They stood at opposite ends of the field, surrounded by Kumo Nin in the trees, not to contain the fight, or even as insurance for Naruto running, they just didn't want to miss the spectacle. I fought your old man once, you know? I started conversationally. Apparently, the prospect of a good fight had lightened his mood enough to ignore the fact Naruto had held his brother hostage. I know, I've read his journal. You and B, the lethal tag team. The rakage seemed pleased with that as he shucked his white robe, looking rather like a boxer, grandstanding for the audience as he cracked his neck with an audible pop. Well that's good, with you here I get to prove that I'm more than enough on my own. I hope you're as slippery as your old man. There was no warning, no signal to announce the match had begun, one second, although second may have been stretching it, I was in front of him, the next a crackling, lightning-coated fist was inches from Naruto's face. The resulting explosion as the clone detonated was tremendous but when the smoke cleared the rakage simply stood there grinning, not even singed. Or this will be over too quickly. His only answer was Naruto dropping down behind him, looking unworried by the man's tremendous speed. You done? I thought we were fighting. Before the rakage could even answer Naruto was right there in front of him, hands planted on the ground as he levered himself up into a vicious axe kick that snapped eyes head back. He wasn't done though, avoiding the bigger man's right hook by dropping to the ground and trying to sweep his feet out. The man's legs were like steel posts though and barely budged, forcing Naruto to flip back as the ground he had been occupying was cratered by eyes fist. They took a moment to collect themselves, each weighing the other up. Been a long time since somebody tried to take me on in taijutsu. Naruto smirked slightly. How often do I get the chance to really get into gear? Well kid, if all you have is speed, this is going to be a short trip to the ground for you. We'll see. And like that the two finished their internal strategies and vanished in twin flickers. For the shinobi in the trees it was like watching some kind of light show, with streaks of red and blue crashing into one another all across the clearing, sometimes appearing to be in two places at once. Most were just amazed that any one man could match the speed of their cage, apparently without any kind of technique. From the perspective of the fighters though it was a very different story, and eyes grin as he easily batted away another of Naruto's blows proved why. In this contest of speed there was no question who was superior. Naruto was fast, prodigiously fast. In fact he may have even been faster than his father, but he was human, and no matter how hard he trained his body there were limits a human just couldn't surpass. With his lighting armor activated the rakage had three distinct advantages, the augmentation provided by the technique, the protection it offered from Naruto's hits and the fact that it completely negated the man's own nervous system. His reflexes might as well have been instantaneous and it was taking every ounce of training, year working himself to the bone to squeeze out another step, a faster reaction, for Naruto to keep up. It was a very good thing then that Naruto wasn't solely dependent on his body then. I wore a victorious smirk as he brought his elbow down in a crushing blow that should have knocked the Namikaze silly, only to pass through a red flash where his opponent was supposed to be. He recovered too late to avoid the three clones, each holding a swirling orb, that caught him in place. An agonizing squeal rent the air as pure chakra ground against the protective Raten cloak. The rakage could easily shift the distribution of the armor to protect some areas more than others, it was the founding principle of the lariat. 
however, that left him wide open when the real Naruto suddenly appeared in front of him, riding off a Horaishin tag he had placed on his own clone, and smashed him right in the face with a bright white orb three times the size of the others. Big Ball Rasengan. This time the technique drilled right through the lighting armor, catching the rakage right in the cheek and immediately launching the giant of a man halfway across the clearing, his body digging a shallow trench on the ground. Naruto stayed light on his toes though, not really expecting the attack to put the bigger man down. He was proven right when I staggered out of the trench, his lighting armor fluctuating around him before he shook his head to clear it. Immediately the crackling electricity snapped into place and the man stood as if he hadn't been hit at all, lightly working his jaw. Good hit, I'll have to remember that one. Clearly not good enough. Naruto shot back, not really surprised but still somewhat disappointed it couldn't be that easy. Well, I think I'm done going easy on you. Couldn't have said it better myself kid. I was really beginning to enjoy this fight. The still air was suddenly permeated with the dull thuds of kunai finding their places all across the field, kunai I knew all too well. I was wondering if I'd ever see this technique again, I assure you. Like a bolt of lightning he crossed the distance between the two in an instant, already smirking as his eyes caught the kunai slip into the air next to him. Too much like his damn father. He was already expecting it when Naruto suddenly flashed away to a different marker, but he was still focused on the one flipping through the air next to him almost in slow motion. I learned from my past. He twisted his body in less time than it took most to blink, kicking the kunai so hard that it embedded hilt first into a nearby tree. When Naruto reappeared, Rasengan in hand, he was disoriented, not appearing where he expected and was barely prepared for the sudden elbow descending on him from above. Guillotine drop. Few of the watching shinobi could even follow what happened, amongst the various flashes of the speed monster's fight. For a second, as the dust settled, they thought their rakage had won and were about to cheer. But when the smoke cleared it became obvious Naruto wasn't out for the count yet, although he was cradling his arm slightly, wincing at his own brashness. It had all happened in a fraction of a second as Naruto had realized his mistake, bring his Rasengan up to take the brunt of the devastating blow. He had underestimated the sheer impact of that much Raten chakra focused into a single point, losing control of his technique and blasting both of them back as the chakra vortex destabilized. He had managed to roll to a somewhat graceful stop but there was a decided twinge in his elbow now from trying to take that attack head on. Clearly, he wasn't going to be winning any battles of strength here, time to start fighting with his head. I on the other hand merely seemed disgruntled that his attack hadn't caved in the redhead's chest. Those are some reflexes. I try, Naruto acknowledged casually rolling his shoulder until it clicked, the moment he did he suddenly vanished, making the rakage immediately tense, eyes restlessly searching the various kunai he could see to try and catch where his wily opponent would emerge next. Moments later Naruto appeared at the other end of the field, but it might as well have been right next to the rakage for the time it took the man to close the distance between them. He was so expecting another sudden disappearance, eyes already scanning for the most likely exit point, that he was caught off guard when his lariat actually made contact with something. Not for long though as the clone he'd struck quickly popped. However, this was like no clone I had ever seen before. Instead of smoke, or even an explosion, there was a strange sucking noise. I felt the pressure in his ears change ever so slightly and that was all the warning he got before an invisible pulse of. Something suddenly blasted him back. He flipped in the air and landed on his feet, not much worse off, but the same couldn't be said for his lighting armor. All along his front, where he had been facing the clone, the crackling electricity was thin to just a finger's width across his body. That was all he needed to know what had happened. A wind clone, smart. He growled, glancing around the clearing warily. Vacuum clone, actually, Naruto corrected, flashing to a branch. You might have been able to outrun wind and I didn't want to waste the trick. Well consider it wasted, the rakage said, the lighting armor quickly fixing itself, even thickening slightly in anticipation of any similar tricks. Naruto's only response was a cheeky smirk as four more of him suddenly flashed into being around the bulky man. That was all the warning he allowed the rakage before the melee was back on. Suddenly Naruto was everywhere in eyes vision, putting his numbers to good use as he kept in close to the lighting shrouded cage. Kicks harmlessly bounced off the man's charged skin and Naruto was pretty sure he'd sooner break his fist that actually damaged the man with a punch. But I was so swarmed that he could barely keep up, every time he'd come close to hitting the irritating redhead he, or his clone, would simply flash to a nearby kunai and quickly rejoin the perfectly coordinated dance of arms and legs. Eventually I grew tired of the dogpile, pausing at the center of the melee as he was battered on all sides by mostly ineffective kicks. With a roar of exertion, 
he suddenly amped up the voltage of his lightning armor, having it explode around him like a crackling blue bomb. The four clones were immediately destroyed, filling the air with the sudden gasp of compressed air as huge chunks were ripped out of the rakage's technique. The real Naruto was sent careening back across the field, crashing roughly into a tree and spinning to an awkward stop on the ground. He picked himself up a moment later but was forced to clutch at his side, that had been a nasty hit and he was fairly certain something was bruised, if not broken. I wasn't looking much better though, his armor fluctuating erratically around his body as it tried to compensate for the sudden influx of Fuutan Chakra. Naruto grinned when he saw this, suddenly dropping down into a three-point stance before the rakage could recover and flashing forward. I would have stopped his mad charge if four of the nearby Hiroshin kunai didn't suddenly reveal themselves as hinged clones. They jumped in and grabbed the man's arms and legs long enough for Naruto to deliver a firm palm strike to the larger man's chest. The clones were immediately destroyed, ripped apart by the enraged rakage, but they had done their job and Naruto successfully jumped back, wincing as he felt something shift in his chest. That lightning armor of yours was really irritating you know. The redhead held up a ram seal and the rakage was forced to a stop mid-charge, much to the shock of the watching Kumo Nin. Five Hiraishin markers, one on his chest and four more on his wrists and ankles, suddenly unfurled from where Naruto had finally managed to touch him without the lightning armor getting in the way. Namikaze style, five-point seal. It was a significantly less efficient form of the seal he had used on the resurrected Shodai Hokage, but he had shoved a lot more chakra into it. Even now the rakage was struggling against his invisible bonds, the seals glowing warningly. Naruto only needed a moment though. He brought his palm up, the familiar shape of the Rasengan swirling to life above his hand. Before it was finished forming though, he placed his other hand on top, a look of intense concentration forming on his features as a horrific screech filled the air. Slowly, the rotating sphere of chakra turned white, four blade-like projection emerging from the sides like some ridiculous shuriken. The redhead's hand visibly shook under the sheer effort and focus the technique took. When it was finished, the completed Rasengan hummed at a pitch so high it was almost inaudible. Fuutan, Rasengan, he whispered, fearful that even speaking too loudly could interfere with the incredibly delicate balance of the all-too-unstable technique. He had seen what happened when that occurred and it had nearly cost him an arm. By now the rakage was beginning to strain the limits of his seal but it was too late, in a flash Naruto was in front of him suddenly releasing the dangerous technique with an apologetic smile. I literally had less than a fraction of a second to pour everything he could into his lightning armor before Naruto vanished in a red flash, shortly followed by the rest of the world. All the watching shinobi saw was an enormous dome of white chakra, grinding and screeching away at the land like a compressed hurricane. Even Naruto, from his perch on a nearby tree was in slight awe of his technique's devastation. He was loath to use it most of the time, one, because of the time it took him to set up, and two, because he wasn't quite sure if anything could survive it. It was a testament to the rakage's strength that he felt cornered enough to be forced to use one of his trump cards. Hell, he had only recently learned how to use it without seriously injuring himself in the process, he wasn't sure if it would even be possible without the Hiraishin to instantaneously get him to safety. It wasn't like he could throw the damn thing. It took a few moments for the swirling vortex to finally die down, a few more for the resulting dust to settle. Everyone watching was astonished by the size of the crater, a perfect bowl in the ground marked with concentric grooves. It was as though some cosmic drill had attempted to crack the world and given up halfway. Even more incredible though was the single figure, just barely managing a low crouch, right at the very center of the destruction. Kami man, what does it take to put you down? Naruto asked, flashing onto the edge of the crater and looking down at the rakage with genuine respect. I had clearly seen better days, his pants were torn to shreds, one of his enormous bronze armed guards looked like it had been mauled by a tiger and the other was missing entirely. Likewise, cuts and scratches littered the man's body, giving him the appearance of some macabre voodoo doll. However, he was still standing, if only barely, and just about clinging on to consciousness as he managed to level a glare at the redhead, legs trembling. More. More than some light breeze. Kid. Naruto couldn't help but smile tremendously impressed with the man's sheer willpower not to simply collapse where he stood. He worked his way down the crater carefully, wary for some kind of trick or deception. It was unnecessary, I was truly on his last legs, and contrary to his taunt, a strong breeze may well have knocked the man over. Naruto was almost disappointed, the fight had really gotten his blood pumping and he likely had the broken ribs to show for it. When he finally reached the bigger man, although their eyes were level now thanks to the way I was crouching, an unspoken conversation seemed to take place in a split second. Finally, 
Naruto nodded and raised his hand. Good fight. I barely managed an acknowledging grunt before Naruto flooded his fist with chakra and brought it round in a devastating right straight that had the rakage out before he hit the ground. The dull thud of his body finally hitting the ground marked a long stretch of silence before a shadow fell over Naruto's form. When he looked up he saw the Kumo shinobi that had been watching crowding around the lip of the crater, clearly uncertain of what to do now. A foreign shinobi had just knocked out their leader, in what was essentially a duel for the fate of a war no less, what were you supposed to do in that situation? Naruto just sighed, ultimately it wasn't his problem, but all the same he felt a little bad for putting them in such an uncomfortable position. They were sure to get a chewing out when they got back to Kumagakur, not that he was in for a smooth welcome home either. He straightened up, wincing as he felt something scrape uncomfortably in his side, no hiding it either, that was going to need medical attention. He suddenly flashed up behind the ring of Kumo Nin, surprising a few and getting them to draw their weapons out of instinct. He ignored the swords and kunai and instead motioned down to their unconscious leader. When he wakes up tell him. He looked around at the slightly nervous faces and sighed, someone tell him that I expect him to honor the deal. If not, I'll be back for round two. Somebody must have been feeling confident as from the back of the crowd somebody shouted, can I book my seat in advance? Naruto grinned at the remark, reminded of something Anko would say, gave a small incline of his head and vanished in a flash of red. The only evidence that he was even there were the three-pronged kunai whose ceiling tags were already beginning to burn away. Naruto grunted as Sakura tightened the bandages around his chest with perhaps a little more force than was strictly necessary. That was the sight Haruzen walked into as he entered the small, sequestered hospital room reserved for such discreet examinations. If you're here to chew me out Hokage-sama, I'm afraid my he winced as Sakura patted him on the side none too gently, my cute little student already beat you to it. And rightly so. Sakura complained, the glare she had worn since Naruto had flashed into the hospital unannounced never leaving her face for a moment. Really, you have two broken ribs, severe bruising along your spine, electrical burns of all things. Not to mention the damage to the chakra pathways in your hands. And the worst part is you won't tell me what the hell did this to you. Hiruzen just smiled at the scene fondly, reminded of his own student's gruff bedside manner. If you could just give us a moment Sakura-kun? The pink-haired med nin looked between the two men and huffed irritably, quickly walking towards the door. That's Sakura-sensei to you Hokage-sama, Yakashi Shisho made it official yesterday. Congratulations, the elderly Hokage replied congenially, only receiving an eye roll in response as the young med nin stalked out. He chuckled lightly as he turned back to Naruto. My, she reminds me more and more of Tsunade with every passing day, and they've never even met. Should we say a prayer for perverts everywhere? Naruto offered, shifting experimentally. She might not have been happy with him but he couldn't deny Sakura's skill, she had really come a long way from the fawning little girl he had tied to a training post years ago. Perhaps later, Hiruzen agreed, still with that congenial smile that quickly had a stifling silence fill the room. I know what you're going to say, Naruto said quietly, unable to fully meet the Hokaye's eye. It was a reckless, dangerous, stupid, ill-thought-out plan that could have backfired spectacularly. I was listening to my emotions instead of my head, and I put hundreds of lives in danger. Hiruzen merely raised his eyebrow. Yes, you did all of those things, he sighed, walking across the room to sink gratefully into a plush chair. This was one of those days the man truly showed his age, looking for all the world like the elderly man he felt like, instead of the feared multiple war veteran. But the important question is, would you do it again? Their eyes met and this time Naruto found the strength to keep his gaze level. He had once been told he had the kind of eyes that could look right through a man. Hiruzen had the kind of eyes that stripped everything away and laid you out bare, every minuscule detail out in the open. They were eyes that took steel to lie too, steel that Naruto, exhausted, emotionally spent, injured, just didn't have in him. Yes, I would. He wasn't expecting the smile. Good. Hiruzen's smile only grew when he saw the redhead's confusion. Naruto, how many lives do you think I weigh on a daily basis? How many decisions I make every day that could send good men and women to their deaths? What you did today, while brash, and I would have preferred you come to me beforehand, saved hundreds, if not thousands of potential lives. Just as a flicker of hope welled in the young man's eyes Hiruzen quickly went about quashing it. I'm not saying it was the correct choice, or even a particularly good one. That's a dangerous opinion to have of yourself, he sighed, once again falling back in his chair. The point I'm trying to make Naruto is that as Hokage you will be forced to make a lot of difficult decisions, Kami knows I have. 
it's whether you can live with those decisions that will define the kind of leader you become. He stood, motioning to the door. Now come along, I still need to give you a proper dressing down for acting like a rebellious teenager, but first, we need to run damage control. I can see to it that this appears to have been an authorized mission, nobody can know you acted ubiquitously on this. He groaned lightly. The paperwork. No, actually, you can handle the paperwork. His smile returned, vindictive this time. Consider it training, for your new job. Naruto winced at the implication, already dreading those stacks of paper he'd have to wade through to fix his brash actions. Hiruzen paused in the doorway, as if remembering something. But, I suppose this can wait until the morning, as I understand it you have quite the cause for celebration. The redhead's eyebrow quirked. How did you know? Anko had only told him only. Three hours ago, damn if that didn't feel like days ago. The old Hokage simply tapped the side of his nose. An old man needs his secrets. He shooed the prospective Hokage away, allowing the redhead to go with his consent and earning a smile in return. And Naruto. He caught the younger man about to hop out the window congratulations. Naruto simply grinned, he didn't have to be told that. Chapter 37, Familiar Talks. Naruto couldn't help the smile that grew on his face when he appeared in his living room, only to spot Anko curled up on the couch. He hadn't expected her to stay up for him and usually when he found her like this there were a lot more empty bottles of sake strewn around. He tested his side again and only felt a minor twinge, so he felt safe enough to gently pick her up and started carrying her upstairs. She hated it when he flashed around the house with her, said it made her nauseous. It seemed his efforts were for naught though as she gently stirred while he was climbing the stairs. Hey you, she mumbled, shifting to get more comfortable. You were gone for a while. I came back though. Anko just smiled sleepily, lifting her head as best she could for a kiss, Naruto met her halfway. You always do. There was just something I needed to do. He almost laughed at her sleepy attempt to look quizzical. You get it done? I hope so. Good. She nodded like a child who had been told the monsters had been cleared from the closet. Done like it when you're gone. Naruto could only sigh at that, still smiling. Me neither. Can you believe we're going to be parents? she suddenly said as he moved into their room. Me and you? Believe it? He asked with a chuckle. No way. He quickly leaned down before she could reply. Ecstatic about it? He stole a quick kiss, leaving Anko pouting when he pulled away. Absolutely. She smiled at that, mewling adorably when he set her down on the bed. She immediately grabbed his arm and dragged him down with her before he could move away. I love you. It was Naruto's turn to smile as she kissed him still looking barely awake. He realized something, lying there with Anko at his side, her purple hair messily falling over her face and just the faintest hints of drool at the corner of her lip. It's something he'd thought a thousand, a hundred thousand times before, and every time he'd meant it, honestly. But just then, in the weak moonlight streaking through the blinds, with him covered in bruises, and her an overly large t-shirt, that he'd never thought it quite like this. Marry me. Anko just chuckled in that sleepy way. Sure. Naruto's smile grew, she wasn't taking him seriously. No really, marry me. She languidly shifted her neck, bringing her face level with his, but something about the way he was looking at her must have alerted her as she was suddenly very much awake. You're serious. Never more so in my life. And even he was surprised by just how much he meant that. I did a lot today, but all of it just reminded me that life is short, for shinobi, shorter. I love you. I could never imagine myself not loving you. He smiled, wrapping an arm around her and pulling her until they were flush, this close he could only see her eyes, the eyes that always reminded him of chocolate from the first day he met her. So, marry me. This isn't because. He saw her eyes glance down to her stomach. No, this. He lightly tickled her belly, making her squirm in his grip was because I love you. And this. He lifted her chin until they were eye to eye again capturing her lips and prolonging the kiss until they were forced to come up for air is because I love you. This time he just wrapped his arms around her, letting her nest lay her head into the crook of his arm. I'm asking you to marry me, because I want to marry you. I don't need another reason. He heard a faint sniff and when he looked down Anko was doing an admirable job of not letting herself cry, smirking playfully up at him. Yeah, then where's my ring? The redhead looked up thoughtfully for a moment before grinning, reaching down and gripping her hand lightly, thumb and index finger over her ring finger. Anko felt a tingle and watched as a small, 
thin Hiraishan Shiki wrapped around the base of her finger. I'm sure I can come up with something better, but until then how's? He never got the chance to finish as Anko stopped admiring her new accessory and quickly turned to capture his lips. When she finally released him, he noticed an all too familiar gleam enter her eye. You woke me up. Well, I'm sure there's something I can do to make it up to you. Oh, I have some ideas. However, when she suddenly reversed their positions, straddling him with the hungry glint only growing stronger, Naruto winced. The pain in his side suddenly flared up, Sakura was good, but she wasn't a miracle worker. Anko immediately noticed his discomfort, and its source. A frown swiftly replaced her smirk. But first, maybe you want to tell me what exactly you've been doing? The redhead could only grin sheepishly. Funny story that. So, let me get this straight, Kakashi drawled, spread out over one of the couches to the side of the Hokaye's office, you managed to fight a cage, winning mind you, and a potential war before it really picks up, got engaged to your longtime girlfriend, after finding out she's pregnant, and you get thrown in the doghouse. All in the same day? Naruto wasn't sure why he was allowing Kakashi to mock him like this, aside for some residual respect for him as an Anbu captain, that particular well was very quickly drying up. Same evening actually, he replied, as thought they were talking about an old mission instead of the day before. Kakashi whistled a long note. Damn, you really do work fast, don't you? Naruto gave the man a level stare. Don't you have, I don't know. Missions, or training or something? Kakashi put his hands up in mock surrender, the eye smile giving away his insincerity. Well, I mean, if you really insist Hokage-sama. Naruto bit back a groan, people had been jibing him like that all day. Don't call me that, it's not official yet. As good as I'm afraid my boy, Hiruzen said as he walked into the room, word of your actions yesterday have spread remarkably fast. His eyes crinkled with mirth. I believe the Hyuga are actually rather upset with you for ending the war before too much Kumo blood could be spilt. He glanced around the room quickly, noting the singular Naruto behind what was increasingly the Namikaze's desk, instead of his own. No shadow clones today? What's the point? The redhead lamented. It's not like I have anywhere to be in a hurry, Anko will hold this grudge for a few days yet, so I might as well give all of this. He motioned somewhat morosely to the stacks of documents lining every inch of the desk my full attention. Hiruzen merely smiled as he sank into a particularly plush chair to the other side of the office from Kakashi. Spoken like a true cage. At that point, Naruto had simply had enough and allowed his head to fall forward, smacking into the desk with a rather satisfying thump. Not you too, he mumbled from somewhere between a C-rank mission report, and a stack of requisition forms. Comes with the territory my boy. The elder Hokage jibed without a hint of remorse, nursing his pipe with a malicious grin. Naruto sighed as he sat back up, pulling a sheet of paper from where it had stuck to his forehead. He gave it a quick glance and frowned, it would likely belong in a pile that was beginning to grow worryingly large. Many reports from the grass region that spoke of unusual movements from the Iwa side of things. As they trickled in from border scouts in the area they were painting an increasingly depressing picture. Iwa was mobilizing. What do you make of these? Naruto asked, passing one of the more worrying reports, of an incursion by Iwa scouts into Hai no Kuni itself, over to the older man. Hiruzen barely had to give it a cursory glance before exhaling a large cloud of smoke, his features quickly losing their amused edge. I suspected something like this, although I maintained hope that Oonoki would live up to his title and be a bit more cautious. He stood up and placed the report back in its appropriate pile, choosing instead to stand by the window one of his preferred vantage points to look out over what, for the longest time, he had considered his village. I think that as my old rival grows older, younger, more energetic voices begin to hold sway in Iwa. He took another puff of his pipe, the brief pause allowing him to collect his thoughts. The grudges from the old wars run deep, many having lost fathers, mothers, husbands and wives. They've smelt the blood in the water and, while I hoped Kumagakura's withdrawal back to their borders would stem any rash actions from our northern cousins, it seems opportunism has won out. Another pause. I'm afraid if Oonoki has been swayed to another invasion, it will take a little more than a duel to push back that particular tide. Naruto winced at the subtle jab at his own rash actions before sobering as he examined another report. Iwa weren't even trying to hide their intentions, banking on Konoha's northern border still being stretched thin from the joint assault from their smaller neighbors. With grass locked in skirmishing actions in the northern towns it would be all too easy for Iwa to sweep in, en masse, and bypass the old killing grounds of the Ame region. 
To redraw their forces against such an assault would leave them open to a counter-attack from Orochimaru, and even though Taki had essentially backed off since the capture of their Jinchuriki, they couldn't exactly trust their disloyal former allies to play nice in the meantime. Konoha was running short on men, and even shorter on a far more precious resource, friends. After the invasion trust with Suna was thin at best, the smaller villages had made their opinions of Konoha all too clear, Kumo was now in a tentative position Naruto wouldn't dare begin to rock, and Kiri. Well, despite their re-emergence into the world since their bloody civil war, nobody really knew what Kiri's intentions were. For all Naruto knew they would be the next to try and take a bite out of fire country. You have some time yet to think on this Naruto, Hiruzen reminded him, Oonoki is slow to make decisions and if he has decided on invading it will take him time to organize, he knows he only has one avenue to invade through since Ame closed its borders and there's little love lost between Iwa and Grass. That's if Grass doesn't turn around and reinforce Iwa's invasion. Naruto argued. He was surprised at the ferocity in Hiruzen's eyes when the older man turned. Then we make them pay for it tenfold. He walked over to the map table Naruto had meticulously restored, with a few improvements of his own, it was now a great deal easier to quickly update as information changed. Iwa is not the most fertile country, relying a great deal on food imports from the land of stone, fangs, birds and valleys to the south. He ran a ringer along the line of smaller countries that formed a wedge between Kaze no Kuni and Tsuchi no Kuni. In any prolonged war Iwa knows will cut that supply off by any means necessary. The village itself can survive, but only by taxing food from surrounding towns. Eventually the daimyo of earth will intervene and veto their war the moment it becomes too costly for the country. He shook his head. No, Oonoki knows a protracted war with Konoha, when we are more than capable of feeding ourselves as long as necessary, would be ill-advised. Another puff from the pipe. He will put everything into his initial offensive and try to cut as large a section of our land out as he can, likely hoping to use that to grow food for any further actions he takes in the war. He outlined the rough area that was currently a hotbed of guerrilla warfare with Grass Shinobi. We rebuff that first offensive and Oonoki will be forced to back off. Naruto frowned, Konoha was already weakened and Iwa would have the advantage of first move. That will be costly. Hiruzen nodded sadly. As all wars ultimately are. Naruto walked around and scrutinized the map. There must be another way, maybe a counteroffensive that relies on some advantage we have in the territory, or a preemptive strike. I wouldn't worry yourself over it too much today my boy, I'm still around to pick up the slack, for now, Hiruzen consoled, scrutinizing the map himself, mind going through similar loops as his young successor. As I understand it we may be very busy in the coming months, I would take the opportunity to enjoy the relative peace while we still can. Naruto nodded idly, not sure how he could possibly slack off now of all times. I'll try. He didn't sound all that committed to it. Hiruzen sighed, knowing what the younger man was thinking he had been in the same position many times before. He glanced up, noting that Kakashi had left early into the conversation, talk about war with Iwa must have been uncomfortable considering what he lost in their last conflict. He patted the redhead on the shoulder before moving over to a stack of reports, there was a time to allow Naruto to learn the ins and outs of the position, and there was a time to provide everything he could to help, as was a Konoha shinobi's duty. We'll think of something, god I'm Dono. He was glad to see the small, bemused smile that briefly lifted the redhead's lips. He wasn't sure why his feet pulled him in the direction of the Uchiha compound that night as he made his way home. A part of him knew it was probably just procrastination, to put off dealing with a grouchy, vindictive Anko, although coming back late probably wouldn't help the situation. A different part of him supposed it was habit. He often used to come here, in better days, before Shisui died, before Itachi. Back then it was a comforting place, where he could work off frustration with a good spar, where he could talk through his problems where he knew a receptive ear was waiting. He didn't share everything with Anko back then, some things just had to stay between guys. Nowadays, well, he couldn't quite recall the last time he had been here. The old sturdy gate was just how he remembered it, although the fact that he could just push it open was different. It used to take knocking very loud just to get a passing Uchiha on the other side to come open it up. Inside the compound was disconcerting so empty compared to his memories of a bustling little community with kids, and shops and packs of mothers gossiping about their children's stories from the academy. Despite how long it had been his feet knew the way easily and he was outside of the Uchiha clan head's house before he really knew what he was doing, giving the door a soft rap. A small, rebellious part of his mind hoped nobody answered, but eventually the door slid open. He hadn't even heard footsteps on the other side, 
even decades of retirement couldn't take away such ingrained skills. Ah, hey. He cursed himself internally at the rather lame greeting, but rewarded all the same by a soft, if slightly surprised smile from Mikado. Oh, Naruto-kun, what an unexpected pleasure. The redhead nearly winced, he knew the woman was only being sincere, he had known her long enough to know she barely had an unkind bone in her body, and it was no wonder she hadn't found the shinobi lifestyle to her liking, but it still felt like a stab to the chest to be reminded how much he had been avoiding this exact meeting. Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry for not coming around before. Or anywhere nearly as much as he owed her, the rebellious voice piped in. I suppose. He paused right there before he could make a mistake, no, I really don't have an excuse. I guess I've kind of been avoiding this. Mikito just smiled sadly, glancing back into the house. We all deal with tragedies in our own ways. She brightened up slightly as she stepped aside, motioning for him to come in. What's important is you're here, I assume you came for Sasuke. He's in his room. She bit her lip as they walked further into the house, it was furnished differently than Naruto remembered. He supposed neither of them wanted too many reminders of what happened. Sasuke's been rather upset since coming back from his last mission. I get the feeling he's beating himself up over what happened. Naruto had read the report and was more inclined to blame the Hyuga heir if he was honest with himself, although he knew that was just protectiveness over his students. Nobody was really to blame over what happened and he knew Sasuke had done the best he could, given the situation. I'll talk to him. Mikito smiled fondly. I remember you saying the same thing when Itachi. She trailed off, glancing at a nearby photo of the four of them, Sasuke, Itachi, Mikito, and Fugaku. She bit her lip again and took a deep breath. You were always such a good friend to him and. I wanted to thank you. You don't have to thank me for that, Itachi was just as much a friend to me as I was to him. For as long as it lasted. He was beginning to grow uncomfortable with the old emotions being dredged up here. No, not for that, I could see how happy the three of you and that girl, Anko, were together. She smiled fondly. I heard you two are engaged now, congratulations. Naruto returned the smile. News really does travel fast in this village. Yes well, shinobi go on missions and wives gossip, it's the way of things. There was some humor in her voice as she said it, he was glad for that at least. But no, I wanted to thank you for everything you've done for Sasuke. Naruto grew a little confused at that, he really didn't think he'd done anything more than any sensei would for their student, but Mikado quickly explained. We were both in a very dark place after the incident. I. I tried my best to be there for him, but I was grieving myself for the longest time. When I finally felt ready to be a mother again, to be the support he needed. In a way it was too late. He had already started walking a dark road. She ripped her gaze away from the picture but her eyes were no less sad. I thought I might have lost both my sons that night, and no matter how hard I tried to be there for him, maybe I let him get away with too much, maybe I wasn't strict enough with him, I don't know, he just kept pushing me further away. She managed a small smile as she looked up at the redhead. Until you. I don't. Mikato held up a hand to cut him off. It must have been. Oh, a month or so after he joined your team, after that mission to Nami. He came back in, sat down at the table and for the first time in so long he began to talk to me about his day. She smiled fondly. He couldn't stop talking about how exciting the mission had been, and how surprised with his teammates he was, and how far he had to go to catch up with his sensei. Not because he wanted to kill his brother, but because he'd found someone genuinely strong to look up to. She looked around and Naruto was surprised to find tears percolating at the edge of her eyes. In some ways I got my son back that day and. I don't know if it was you, or his teammates, or maybe he just needed time, but I wanted to thank you all the same, she continued to surprise him by moving forward and briefly wrapping her arms around the stunned teen, and, just for a moment, Naruto nearly felt tears of his own gather as, despite how much time passed, despite the difference in height between them. He couldn't help but be reminded of how his mother used to hold him. He was almost a little sorry when she finally stepped back, although he'd managed to get his expression back under control before she could see, wearing a wide but genuine smile. Always happy to help. Mikito nodded, patting him gently on the cheek. You haven't changed at all, have you? Well, I like to think I've gotten more handsome, he shot back cheekily, happy to elicit a small laugh from the older woman. Well, I can't deny you inherited your father's looks. Mikito admitted with a roll of her eyes, the moment was interrupted though by a soft padding of feet down the stairs. Sensei? What are you doing here? Sasuke asked, 
understandably confused considering Naruto hadn't so much as stepped foot within the Uchiha compound since their team had formed. I'll just leave you to it then, Mikado said. I'll make some tea, if you're staying? She looked to Naruto, only for the redhead to shake his head. Not for long most likely, this was sort of spur of the moment and I still need to get back to Anko. Mikato nodded understandingly and shut the door behind her, leaving Sasuke standing there uncertainly on the stairs. Sensei, if this is about Emi. Naruto quickly put a hand up, cutting him off. Actually, no. He closed his eyes for a moment. I understand you did everything you could, those Kumo Nin were more experienced, you were outclassed and outnumbered and. But I shouldn't have been. Sasuke cut in heatedly, shaking his head a moment later. We shouldn't have been. I should never have let Hinata run off like that, I should have retreated the moment we knew something was off, I should never have let Emi. He trailed off, fist clenched so tightly his knuckles turned white. He nearly jumped when Naruto put a hand on his shoulder. Sasuke, you can't beat yourself up over this. Being in a position of command. Things can't always go the way you plan and sometimes, no matter how much we might hate it, or wish that it went differently. Things go wrong. They wouldn't have, if it was you there instead of me. Sasuke muttered darkly. Naruto had to bite back a wince, Sasuke didn't know quite how deeply that stung, even if it was supposed to be praise. I'm still not strong enough, not for Itachi, and not for Emi. Naruto just squeezed his shoulder. Like I said, you can't think like that. He smiled, although it was a little forced. Besides, it's not like we've given up on Emi, she's strong, you and I know that best. He was surprised to see Sasuke smile slightly. She. She really surprised me you know. All through the academy she was always dead last in everything, just another one of those useless, fawning girls I didn't expect to make it past the first year. But she clung on, even making it to my team. I thought she'd be a dead weight there too, and it irritated me when you said you would treat us all equally. The idea that you could bring her up to my level. To any kind of level. But then she grew so quickly, catching up to me so fast that I actually felt threatened. Threatened by the dead last. The dark-haired teen sighed, looking up at his old teacher with searching eyes. How did you do that? How did you see that potential? Naruto chuckled slightly motioning for the Uchiha to follow him as they made their way outside. You say that as if I have some special gift or something. There's potential in everyone's Sasuke, things that some people are better at than others. Can you honestly say you could ever be as good a medic as Sakura? Sasuke shrugged, there was a lot of memorization involved with medical jutsu, but at the same time a situational creativity that was so uniquely. Sakura. So, what? It's just about seeing the best in everyone? This time it was Naruto's turn to shrug. Sasuke's gaze quickly turned dark. What if it isn't there? His expression lost his intensity when Naruto tripped him slightly, sighing tiredly. I didn't come here to discuss your brother Sasuke, you know that line of thought leads nowhere. That seemed to remind Sasuke of what he'd said before. What did you come here for? I thought. I thought this place had bad memories for you too. Naruto looked around, spotting a vacant shop that he remembered as one of Shisui's favorites because the owner would sometimes sell him fireworks on the sly. There's a lot of good memories here too, but I'm not here to talk about the past, or even dwell on it, he chuckled, still uncertain of what he was about to ask. Quite the opposite actually. They had reached the gates of the compound so Naruto turned, biting his lip slightly. I, don't have a lot of guy friends. I mean, Kakashi was my captain and Tenzo's my subordinate. And I don't really know Azuma, or Genma and them. Kinda miss that chance in Anbu. Sensei, you're rambling, Sasuke deadpanned. Right, he chuckled sheepishly. Well. I don't know if you heard, but I asked Anko to marry me and. Well, it's funny. He rubbed the back of his head sheepishly as Sasuke nodded. I always kind of imagined Shisui and Itachi would be there for me when the day finally came and. Well, obviously. He slumped over, rubbing the bridge of his nose. Kami I'm bad at this. Are you asking me to? Be your best man? Sasuke asked, eyes wide in genuine astonishment. Well, yeah. I mean, not that you're some replacement for your brother or anything, I don't mean that at all and. I'll just shut up now, he finished as he saw Sasuke's eyes narrow slightly. Why me? At that Naruto found he could finally smile genuinely. Because you're my precious student, and I want you to be there for me. He could see Sasuke was confused by the offer and waved a hand absently. Just ah, uh, think on it maybe? 
He was about to turn and leave when an Anbu dropped into the compound, usually frowned upon by clans unless the news was urgent. Taiku, news from the hospital. The redhead just glanced at the operative, finding him vaguely familiar, one of the newer recruits towards the end of his tenure. Go on. It's your student sir. She's back. At that all thoughts of weddings and questions fled from both Naruto and Sasuke's minds as the redhead gave a quick glance at the Uchiha, nodded, placed his hand on the younger teen's shoulder and teleported them both in a flash. It was a few hours before Sakura cleared Emi as well enough to be debriefed in the presence of her team, her sister, and the Sandaime. The girl had been confused when she came through the gates, sprinting back to Konoha from wherever she had been, like a woman on a mission. She couldn't even tell anyone why, just that she'd had an overwhelming urge to get back to Konoha as fast as possible, to Sakura's chagrin. The girl had managed to loosen her carefully wrapped bandages in her haste and Sakura was keeping her in the hospital until she was sure she hadn't worsened any internal injuries. She was equally vague about just how she'd gotten away from the Kumo Shinobi. She recounted everything right up to the moment she jumped from the cliff, a moment that had everyone from her team wanting to simultaneously throttle and comfort her. But details from after that to the moment she stopped outside the massive reinforced gates of the village were vague and disjointed at best. Even when Sakura pointed out that the bandages she was wrapped in weren't the standard issue given out to Chonin teams, meaning somebody must have cared for her, she had no good answers. She looked visibly pained when she tried to think about what happened, nearly causing Sakura to ask everyone to leave. Naruto and Hiruzen were the most disturbed as the signs pointed to a powerful genjutsu and external influence. But if this was another village, Kumo being the most likely, why would they simply return Emi to Konoha? Was it the deal with the rakage? But then why the genjutsu? Hiruzen thanked the girl for the report and left with a troubled look, and after it became clear Emi wasn't in much condition to hold a conversation Sasuke followed him. However, he surprised everyone when he paused in front of Amy's bed, reaching down awkwardly for a stiff, stilted hug before hurrying from the room. Sakura followed him out with a bemused expression, have already made her feelings on Amy's return clear during the time she was treating the girl. Naruto was about to leave too, to let Amy and Yugao talk, when she croaked from the bed. I did as you trained me sensei, didn't I? He paused, coming back to side on the side of the bed and rest his hand in her hair ruffling it gently in the way she hated so much. Yeah, you did, and you did amazingly, more than I could ever have asked. The girl gave a tired smile, already feeling the effect of the anesthetic Sakura gave her. There was a commotion from the hallway before Anko, with Haya peeking over her shoulder, came bursting into the room, clearly about to announce herself exuberantly. With both Naruto's and Yugao's hands over her mouth it came out more as a muffled jumble. The spectacle still managed to draw a chuckle from the girl though, especially when Haya jumped from Anko's back to land on the side of her bed, looking down at her with big watery eyes. Is Emi Nichin okay? Emi was clearly struggling to stay awake at this point, but managed to smile brilliantly for the younger girl. Nothing some rest can't fix. She motioned with her arms and Haya took the cue, crawling up next to the violet as Emi drifted off to sleep, huddled in tight. Strong kid, Anko remarked, unable to do anything but smile at the adorable scene. That she is, Naruto agreed, hiding his concerns for now. She'll be just fine, Yugao finished as all three adults shared a look, before settling down in a comfy spot to watch over the two young girls, it would be a long night. Chapter 38, Familiar Strategies Naruto scrutinized the report for what felt like the fifth time, tossing it back on the pile with an undignified huff. Being in this office for so long must have been doing strange things to his head. It doesn't matter how many times I look through these, they just don't make sense. Hiruzen nodded absently, similarly entrenched in field reports. He was lending whatever aid he could while the potential war with Iwa loomed on the horizon. Already countless plans had been discussed as countermeasures for actions Iwa might take, including a few that took advantage of Suna's lacking border patrols to the north of their desert. However, the picture these reports were painting. I admit this is rather unusual, certainly not Oonoki's usual way of handling things, he agreed, aged brow furrowing lightly as his eyes scanned another document. Different writing, same message. You think there's been a shift in leadership, maybe in response to me? Naruto asked, pushing back from the desk to wander over to the map table. There were now a few icons littering its surface showing some of the larger forward outposts, updated in real time by sealing scrolls his gave to certain members of various teams. Rather ingenious if he was honest with himself, they would flash red if the shinobi pushed chakra through them in a certain way, alerting the need for reinforcements. 
He was hoping to work on them so that the SEALs could relay different kinds of messages for more specific scenarios. Oonoki is too stubborn for that, and our spies in the village haven't alerted us of anything as important as that, Hiruzen mused. No, I think that Tsuchikage will do his best to take that hat to his grave. Naruto grunted, throwing a folder back onto its pile. Then I can't make sense of it. What had them so befuddled were odd reports of certain squads of Iwa Shinobi pulling back to their village. This alone wouldn't have been so unusual, just a sign that the Tsuchikage had decided against aggressive action. The problem was there had already been a few skirmishes, and normally when Oonoki committed to an action he never second-guessed himself, at least in Hiruzen's extensive history with the man. Then there was the manner of the withdrawal, usually such an order would be a unified action across all engaged squads, pulling back roughly at the same time. What they were seeing instead was individual squads pulling back in turn, as though one messenger was being sent on a round trip, a ludicrously inefficient system when some teams were actively engaged while others were retreating. It was almost as if the leaders of each squad had just decided to up and abandon their duty, however, this was no disorganized route. There was a pattern in the order the squads pulled out. Neither Naruto of Hiruzen could make sense of it though. I fear we may not be able to understand our turn in luck, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't take advantage of it my boy. On that the two of them were most definitely agreed. The moment they had reports in of Iwa Shinobi returning to their borders Naruto already had orders on the go to redistribute their own squads. It was time for the decisive action he and the older Hokage had been planning for weeks. It would take some time to get everything in position, but when they were, Konoha would finally be in a position to end this war. Taki was already crippled by the loss of their Jinchuriki and as long as Konoha kept up a strong border between the two countries, they would retreat to their isolationist tendencies, easily brought to the negotiating table. Kuza on the other hand posed slightly more of a problem given the still tenuous situation with Iwa. They couldn't launch a devastating offensive on the minor village, that would be like putting down a welcome mat for Iwa to take the initiative again. Instead they planned to destroy all but one of the major transport routes between the two countries. The small nation was filled with valleys and dense jungle, so were rather reliant on the bridges and roads already cleared. Most of them would be destroyed within the next few hours, leaving them with only one, tightly controlled route in and out of the country. This would also serve to bottle up Iwa if this turned out to be some elaborate ploy. The idea was for their opponents to be distracted with reconstructing the routes long enough for Konoha to launch a crushing attack against Odogakur. There was little mercy in that offensive, orders to capture if possible, but no addendums to go out of their way if it was too risky. Orochimaru would be made to regret fanning the flames of this uprising. Even Hiruzen looked decidedly unsympathetic as he recommended certain squad positions that would ensure a full cordon of the village. The two men couldn't take all of the credit though, the operation was only possible, thanks to the information Tuya had volunteered. That wasn't the facetious volunteer that Aviki might have used either, the red-headed Spitfire had surprised the T&I department a few days after Naruto's visit by, quietly and without struggle, offering up everything she knew about Otto, Orochimaru and the Shinobi under his command in exchange for swapping sides and protection from potential retaliation. Naruto wasn't sure whether this was because of what he'd said, or if she simply didn't believe in Orochimaru like many of his brainwashed underlings seemed to. For all he knew she had some vendetta against the man and this was some final form of revenge, she wasn't exactly the type to wax poetic about her many woes, or even really talk about herself. There had been some concerns with the validity of the information, but a few Anbu scouting parties had confirmed the locations of various bases and outposts without alerting the Otto Shinobi. Likewise, the problem of the girl's curse mark, and the fact that she seemed rather attached to its power, unsurprising considering its addictive nature and the amount of time she had been using it, had been brought up. Luckily Naruto hadn't been idle since he had removed Onkos. That procedure four years ago had been enlightening as to the inner workings of the ugly seal, and when it came time to removing Tuya's he didn't even need Hana on hand. It wasn't entirely the same, granted. He finally learned what the medical aspect of the seal was for, a kind of enzyme that altered the body's physiology and allowed the passive, if not slightly corrupted, absorption of natural chakra from the environment. There was unfortunately little he could do about that, and Tuya was currently in the hospital being treated for the effects of the enzyme on her system. It would be a while before she was in fighting condition again, it was rather like being treated for severe drug withdrawal. He paced back and forth along the edge of the map table, scrutinizing the positions of his forces, anxious that he couldn't be out there with them. Hiruzen seemed to anticipate his thoughts, taking a long drag from his pipe while giving the younger cage, it was all but made official at this point, a knowing look. You should become used to that feeling, as a leader, you will have to learn the stark lesson that you cannot always be leading every charge. 
He glanced down at the landscape the elemental nations, poised for war, with a sigh. Although I had hoped under more forgiving circumstances. No, I understand that just fine but. The redhead struggled with his words for a moment. You don't trust your shinobi to do the job well? Hiruzen offered with a hint of amusement, purposefully baiting the comment. Naruto shot him a quick glare. You know that's not it. He returned to his pacing, it was a bad habit to get into, he knew, but moving helped him focus his thoughts. It's just. If things go wrong I have to wonder if it wasn't because I could have done better. Trust Naruto. You must trust that you have chosen your people well. Trust that everybody will do their job when the time comes. Trust in the will of fire. You really mean that, don't you? Naruto asked, half bemused at the thought. He believed flowery words were all well and good in the academy, to get the students inspired, moral boosting really. But in a theater of war like this? He had to trust in individual abilities, careful strategies and proven capabilities, not nebulous concepts like the will of fire. Every word, since the first day Toborama sensei shared it with me. He gave a long puff of his pipe and looked thoughtfully out the window. What is the will of fire to you Naruto? The redhead was a little caught off guard by the question, taking a moment to wave his hand lamely. You know, the unity of the village, the whole. Brotherhood of shinobi that unite under a common cause. Hiruzen smiled softly. A nice thought, and admittedly. A part of it. He raised himself up to walk over to the window. I see the will of fire in every merchant peddling their wares, in every child playing at being ninja, in every shinobi talking with the regular citizens. It's an understanding, one of responsibility and gratitude. When a merchant sells his goods, the tax he generates goes towards arming and training the ninja that ultimately allows him to sell for another day. The shinobi protect the civilians, and the civilians give the shinobi purpose. So, it's reciprocity? Naruto had never heard the Hokage speak so bluntly about something like this before, he enjoyed hiding behind his half-truths and riddled words. At its most fundamental, it's human nature. The older Hokage explained. The will of fire isn't some special concept exclusive to Konoha, but here. It is our foundation. The other shinobi villages, they prize their military above all else, the citizenry are simply ways to feed and arm their ninja. Here though, the implicit understanding is that the shinobi serve the client, never the other way around. He smiled lightly as he turned, partially framed by the light coming in through the window. There is a reason Konoha is the most popular village, why we receive the most foreign clients. Naruto actually had to process that for a minute. He supposed he implicitly knew all of this before, vaguely in the back of his mind. But to hear it said aloud. You've weaponized human decency. Konoha's most dangerous weapon wasn't its military strength. It was the civilians, the heart blood of the village that allowed it to thrive. Other villages bled the surrounding area dry to sustain themselves, subsidized by their daimyo. In Konoha though it was a community, damn near independent from the capital itself. In fact, if it wouldn't have launched the country into a horrendous civil war, Konoha could have cut ties with the daimyo a long time ago. He would have thought this was transcendent strategic planning on the part of the Shadaim if he also didn't know a bit about the man from Haruzan's stories. As it was, this was all likely a happy accident resulting from an idealistic man with the monstrous power required to put those ideals in place. His brother on the other hand. If anybody could have honed such a concept into such a sleek and weaponized form it was Toborama Senju. We Hokage are not exempt from that will either, the bond of trust has to run both ways. They trust us to lead them to prosperity and victory, and we in turn trust in them to deliver it. So basically, you're telling me to stop worrying so much, Naruto summed up with a weak smile, he felt like a house had been dropped on him. Oh no, by all means worry away. Hashirama-sama was a wonderful warrior, he nearly paced a groove into the floor of this very office every time he sent people on tough missions. I'm asking you to simply trust in yourself. That you have made the right decisions. Hard to do when you don't know the result. Hiruzen just gave that knowing smile again. Quite. He glanced down at the map. Although in this case I understand if the sensation is a tad more. Personal. Naruto tried to hide it but Hiruzen easily caught the flicker of his eyes moving down to a small icon on the map, a ways west of Odogakur itself. It was the site of one of Orochimaru's more valuable research facilities, apparently housing many of his captive bloodline prisoners he used in his experimentation. When Tuya was asked which base Orochimaru was most likely to reinforce personally if threatened she had pointed to this facility without even thinking about it. There were some irreplaceable subjects housed there that the man would be genuinely pained to lose. 
which made it the ideal target of a feint, designed to draw Orochimaru out of Odogakur for the duration of the operation. Kami knew that if the man was allowed to meet the attack himself it had a much high probability of failing. Konoha just didn't have many shinobi of his caliber, Kakashi came close, but the older Sanin would still get the better of him. Guy might stand a chance for a while, but there was a great deal more to Orochimaru than his taijutsu prowess. There were maybe four ninja who could put the man down. Jiriaya was off. Somewhere, unreliable as ever. Tsunade was a non-factor as far as Hiruzen was concerned, although Naruto personally described it as acting like a petulant child. Hiruzen was already in the mindset that he was no longer able to keep up with his wayward student. And Naruto was stuck here, coordinating, he was currently the only person able to operate the various sealing mechanisms that signaled when Orochimaru had left the village. That's what had Naruto so anxious, he felt like he should be there to deal with his fiancé's old teacher. The more logical side of his mind assured him that if it was just leading Orochimaru on a merry chase for an hour or two, Kakashi was more than capable. That's what he was forced to do, remind himself over and over that everyone was where they were because they had to be. There were roles necessary to end this war right here and as was in this room, where he had the most expansive view of the situation. It's painful, I know, Hiruzen consoled softly, but there will be opportunities to flex your legs in the future, you can be sure of that. The fact that Orochimaru would definitely survive all of this went unsaid. There were still monsters in the world that needed put down, whether it was him, the Akatsuki or something else. He now had to be a scalpel, a precision instrument, a trump card, he couldn't just be thrown into every situation. That would set a bad precedent. There was a reason Cage only showed up to fight when things got bad. A knock came from the door and Emi walked in without waiting for a response. Naruto bit back a smile at the sight, he had almost forgotten he had given his Janan an open door policy when they had shared a team. He supposed technically he had never revoked it, although he could tell Emi was being cheeky by abusing it. Sensei, you said you would be training us today. She knew that, again technically, Naruto wasn't her sensei anymore. However, there was something of a precedent for Hokage keeping on their old teams together for a while longer than normal. Toburama kept his through a war, right up to his final sacrifice, the Sanin had never really stopped being Hiruzen's students, despite their scattering, and Kakashi still only thought of one man as his teacher. I don't remember saying anything of the sort, and you're supposed to be on leave. Naruto shot back, somewhat glad for the interruption, his thoughts had been going in a bleak direction. Emi always managed to lighten his mood. Yeah you did. She replied without hesitation, ignoring the accusation. I asked if you would train us yesterday and you said, she held a hand to her throat for a moment, a trick he knew came from Anko when the woman wanted to do a particularly eerie impersonation. Ooh, um. The redhead blinked, that was a pretty spot on impression of the noncommittal answer he'd give when distracted. Well, I'm a little busy at the moment. Oh, please. By all means, Hiruzen said with a treacherous smile. Nothing should be happening here for a few more hours yet. Enjoy some time with your students. Naruto turned but found himself cornered on both sides, especially now that Emi was beaming at him, he couldn't fight that smile. His shoulders slumped theatrically but he was still wearing a small smile. Well, how am I supposed to argue with that? See you at the training ground, Emi called, secure in her victory. It was an old joke for Team 7, the three students would always say it, knowing Naruto would likely beat them there regardless. The redhead was about to follow when Hiruzen caught him by the shoulder. Naruto, be careful. The teen just stared at him in confusion. I know you went through a scare, with young Emi. But don't allow yourself to become overprotective, they are your students, but they are also shinobi of the village. He released Naruto with those cryptic words, returning to the table to tweak a few of the unit positions. Naruto tried to put it out of his mind as he flashed to the training ground but something about the words stuck. He wasn't coddling his students, was he? He understood there would come a time when they didn't need him anymore, when they were strong enough without him, it's just that time hadn't come yet. Until then he would do everything possible to ensure they survived that long. He nodded to himself as he appeared in the old training ground, distracted just enough that he barely leaned back when a sandaled foot cleaved the air in front of him. Obviously Sasuke was expecting the dodge as the talented Uchiha was already using the momentum to twist, launching a barrage of kunai. Naruto had no real difficulty dodging them, no ninja worth their salt ever did when fresh and rested. But apparently, a single step back was all Ami needed as the girl suddenly launched herself from the shadow of a nearby tree, turning the step into a stumble with a deft movement from the back of her blade. There was no way she had beaten him to the training ground, 
so the ME in the Hokaye's office had been a clone. Now when had Anko gone and taught her that? Although that did mean his cute little students had been planning this ambush from the beginning, admirable. That meant at any moment. Yep, he felt the edges of his vision waver slightly and the next time Sasuke came in for a taijutsu melee he made sure to dodge slightly more than was necessary, unable to trust his depth perception. If the Uchiha was irritated the Genjutsu wasn't helping him he didn't show it, instead flipping back while rushing through a well-worn string of hand seals. The real reason for messing with his vision became obvious when Emi suddenly appeared in his now limited periphery, already brining her blade around in a wind sheathed slash that would enhance the fireball to actually dangerous levels. Well, dangerous for most opponents. It was an admittedly smoother version of the combo they had used in their Chaonin exams, but well coordinated or not, Naruto was the sensei for a reason. With almost languid ease the redhead kicked up one of the discarded kunai Sasuke had thrown earlier. Another kick had it tearing through the air to impact the very edge of Amy's blade. It was barely a tap, but it was enough to throw off the girl's aim just enough that the blade of wind went wide of the fireball. Instead, it sheared right through the base of the tree Naruto assumed Sakura was hiding in as he almost casually sidestepped the roaring ball of flame. In the brief lull as Sakura did indeed jump out of the collapsing tree he broke the genjutsu, pulsing his chakra twice to be sure, Sakura could be a tricky one. Sure enough, Sasuke and Emi suddenly changed positions, that was likely meant to catch him off guard with some sort of plan maneuver later. He was just a little surprised then when a pair of gloved hands suddenly grasped his ankles, attempting to pull him right into the ground. They got him down to his shins before he pulsed his chakra, disrupting the earth technique. But, as with all of their plans so far, they had gone in with the expectation of failure. Emi was suddenly rushing forward, blade poised, but at the last minute he noticed a slight discrepancy with her stance and pulsed his chakra. Instead of a blade aimed at his throat he found two feet wreathed in flame streaking towards him like a javelin. Sasuke was getting creative with his elemental manipulation, and Sakura even more paranoid if she was beginning to triple layer her illusions. Deciding to reverse the situation Naruto suddenly sank into the ground, hoping to catch the pink head off guard. Apparently, they'd planned for that too as he suddenly found himself staring at an already lit explosive tag. Anko was really going to have to stop telling Ami all these insider secrets, it was ruining his teacher mystique. He slipped out of the ground just as it detonated, spreading dust and random clumps of dirt into the air. Nothing too damaging then, which meant. Ami from one side, sword already level with his neck, Sasuke from the other, hands wrapped in flames. He turned to face the more pressing threat of a blade only to realize too late that at some point Sakura had swapped all the directions on him. He was about to flash to the kunai he had surreptitious dropped amongst the others at the start of this little ambush only to feel his connection to it severed. Just out the corner of his eye he could spot Sakura grinning as she held up the kunai, ripped clean in half. That girl was getting scary. Not scary enough to have noticed the one he'd left underground though, which had promptly been scattered by their explosion. Amy's blade sliced through nothing but air as Sasuke flicked his hands to remove the flames, a vaguely irritated scowl pulling at his lips. Naruto held up his hands magnanimously as he reappeared a few feet away. Come now, I couldn't let you guys have a win that easily. I'd be a terrible teacher if he took a step forward only for the ground beneath him to explode rather gloriously. From the outside of the near column of flames the twenty-something tags hidden just beneath the ground had created, Amy watched with a hint of worry. You don't think it was too much, do you? Sasuke simply grunted as Sakura alighted next to them, the pinkette looking equally worried. It had been her job to place the stacks of tags where she thought it most likely their sensei would appear, so it would be on her head if he got injured. Their worried were replaced by irritation when the dust settled, revealing a slowly dispersing cloud of all too familiar smoke. Just a clone, Sasuke muttered, clicking his tongue as his Sharingan raked the training field for any sign of their teacher. There was no need though as he appeared a moment later, completely unharmed, sitting up on a sturdy branch of a tree. Well, now I'm starting to think I trained you guys too well. That was mean and sneaky even by Anko standards. Emi had the decency to quash her victory fist pump. Still only managed to get your clone though. Sasuke grouched, his irritation ebbing at the praise. More than most can say, Naruto countered, giving the three a good look. They really had come a long way in such a short time and he had to crush a deep welling of pride before he gathered them all up in a massive group hug that would have been monstrously unprofessional. Maybe worth considering if he ever wanted them properly mortified though, something to think on. Your teamwork is excellent, even after so long apart. He gave a sideways glance at Sakura. Your genjutsu are superb, 
but you could have left the disorientation a little later if you wanted Sasuke's maneuver to properly catch me off guard. He turned to said Uchiha. The trick with the fire is neat, but when you're trying to be stealthy it gives away your position. I could feel the heat even through the genjutsu. Finally, he turned to Emi. You're too cautious to engage, some of those opening shots designed to trip me up could have been pushed a bit further. A combined assault from you and Sasuke might have seriously harried me. His expression relaxed as a bright grin spread his whiskered cheeks. Now, I believe I was called here for some training? All three of his students brightened at the prospect and the redhead felt something warm spread through his chest. Naruto gently stroked Haya's hair, the seven-year-old long having dozed after almost an hour of Naruto Niikin doing nothing but reading boring old pieces of paper. But Naruto felt he could be given this small indulgence, a boring moment after all this anxiety and chaos was a blessing. The war was over, or as good as. The operation was a success, mostly. Kakashi had given the snake a good run around, but Orochimaru was a clever man and quickly realized he was being played. Luckily Kakashi was good enough at his job that Orochimaru only returned to a sufficiently harried and cowed Odogakur. The attack had been swift and ruthless, with known squads outside the walls, that had been discreetly followed for the past few days, being taken down almost simultaneously, many now finding a home in the cells below the Anbu headquarters. The attack on the village itself was less an invasion, or an outright siege as it was a surgical strike. As one, multiple key installations in the village had been demolished by carefully written seals designed specifically for each situation, a luxury only a few like Naruto could bring to the table. When the dust settled a good quarter of the village was in ruin, Konoha Shinobi were already pulling out and Orochimaru was only given their dust to glare it on their way out. There had been casualties during the retreat, especially when the Sanin arrived on scene but a few of the braver Jounin held him off long enough to get the majority of the operatives out of there. Apparently there was a new story for Konoha's green beast to boast about in the Dangoya. The important thing however, was that a message had been sent to the other minor villages. No not piss off Konoha. As suspected Takigakur had retreated in on themselves, cowering under their tree until Konoha inevitably sent out the diplomats. Kuzo was trickier but they understood that any further action would meet with vicious reprisals, and likely see their country turned into a staging ground for an Iwa invasion. Anyone who had read Ame's bloody history clearly didn't want a repeat of their neighbor's murky history. Aside from negotiating the terms of the village's concessions in surrender, which he was leaving to Hiruzen as, for now, the man was just better at all that politicking, Naruto's part in all of this was done. In the war that was, because now came the cleanup. Konoha might have won, but not without casualties. As it was, the hospital was currently overstocked with injured patients, some of whom might never be shinobi again. He knew as much from both the reports he received from Yakushi sensei the current head medic, and Sakura's first-hand accounts. Team 7 now regularly met up every other day for a few hours to train, talk and catch up. Emi was officially grounded from missions while she recovered, with the occasional trip to the Yamanaka clan to try and help her confusion over the whole episode. Sasuke was, rather politely, not taking missions until she did, throwing himself into some kind of secret training, likely a new technique if Naruto knew the Uchiha. Sakura was the busy one now, but even the Pinket made time for her team between shifts. Still, Naruto knew they were all growing agitated, confined as they were, Ami was one to enjoy activity, Sasuke wasn't the type to restrain himself long and while Sakura didn't say it out loud, he knew she rather enjoyed the field work of being a med nin as opposed to being stuck in a hospital all day. Luckily, now that this mess was winding down, Naruto was certain he had something for all of them to do. The assault on Odogakur had outlined a dire weakness when it came to high-level shinobi. Currently Konoha only had a few counters, one an old man and another himself. Jiraiya, while absconding around the nations, was at least doing semi-useful work with his spy network. More than a few Anbu missions had only come out successful thanks to his information. The last of the Sanin on the other hand, that was a different matter entirely. Naruto looked through the myriad of wounded reports, shinobi who had lost limbs or died because medical attention came too slow, or just wasn't good enough, and decided that Konoha's best medic had been given long enough to mope around, trying to drink and gamble her way into oblivion. He wouldn't be asking. Chapter 39, Official Returns There was a comforting familiarity to seeing his team waiting for him at the village gates, looking just as expectant as their first C-rank mission. With the distraction of the war and the revelation that he would be a father he hadn't had time to consider just how much he missed this. It seemed his old Janan, Chonin now, a lot of them, felt the same way, although not everything was the same. They were all older for one, 
with both the girls beginning to grow into their bodies. The red slip of a dress that had looked so ridiculous on Emmy when Anko was first trying to boost her confidence, now showed off some developing curves. Sakura looked every bit the medic nin she was trained to be, with a professional ponytail keeping her long hair in order and her old dress swapped out for a shirt, shorts and a pack strapped to her waist. Sasuke continued to honor the style of the Uchiha, with their high-collared shirts proudly emblazoned with the red and white fan. However, he no longer looked like a kid playing dress-up, trying to emulate the adults around him. Now he looked the part of the hardened Uchiha shinobi, even adopting a long nadachi from his family's armory. He wouldn't be a match for Amy's swordsmanship anytime soon, but with his Sharingan reflexes he was still a menace with the blade. Hiruzen hadn't been too vocal about it, but Naruto knew the old man wasn't too keen on this excursion. Whether it was sentimentality for his wayward student, Tsunade had been allowed to wander around unopposed this long for a reason, or because of how recently Naruto had come into his role as Hokage, the redhead couldn't say. He could understand the last point, the inaugural celebration had been only the other day and already it appeared that Naruto was absconding from his duties. Still, Naruto trusted the village to run under Hiruzen's steady hand for the few weeks he might be gone. Besides, he really didn't trust anybody else would be able to bring the wandering Sanin back, not because he didn't trust his ninja. It was Tsunade he didn't trust. From what her knew of the legendary medic, she didn't take kindly to unwanted news. After a war, he couldn't really afford a couple of Anbu limping back to the village with broken bones. Hey sensei, Ami called as the trio spotted his approach, only to smirk theatrically. Oh, sorry. Good morning Hokage-sama. Sakura slapped her arm in exasperation at the teasing, but even the pinkette was smiling slightly. You know, I technically have the power to demote you now? Naruto shot back as he joined the group, nodding a greeting at Sasuke. Amy's eyes widened almost comically as she floundered for a moment, it was nice to see Anko hadn't gotten her hooks in the girl completely. Ah well, anyway, looking pretty good sensei, very. Hokage. Her two teammates just looked at her incredulously. Very Hokage, Sasuke repeated, his deadpan somehow managing to sound both amused and scathing. Sakura was grinning. And might I add the sky looks very airy today, wouldn't you say Sasuke? The Uchiha nodded a smirk pulling at his lips. And Konoha seems just a bit. City. Briefly ignoring Amy's indignant defense of her rushed choice of wording Naruto stole a glance down at himself. He still wasn't quite comfortable with his new look, even though Anko had insisted. What's wrong with the way I look? Naruto asked, feeling a tad affronted as he glanced down at his clothes. The Jounin jacket, improved to hold a lot more than it used to, was extremely practical, and the lightweight pants and sleeveless vest allowed him full mobility. His knee-high sandaled boots were an affectation of his father's youth, resized, of course, and the simple arm guards connected to the back-plated fingerless gloves completed the look. In lieu of anything to sew it on too, he now wore his hit I-8 on his forehead again. Admittedly he had considered getting something like his father's iconic Harry made, but he wasn't just a clone of his father. No matter how awesome the damn coat was. Nothing, I think it makes you look rugged, Anko consoled lightly, running a finger up his exposed arms that sent a shiver down his spine. I'm just saying you look too much like. Well, a jounin. Naruto's eyebrow rose. I am a jounin. He thumbed the olive jacket to that effect. No, you're the Hokage, Anko reiterated, poking him in the chest for good measure. Which is why. She reached under the bed, taking something out of the secret panel Naruto knew about but ignored for her privacy I got you this. She handed him a large, flat box with a bright smile. He eyed it warily for a moment, gifts from Anko could go one of two ways, but after a moment he decided that the slightly anxious smile she wore was too genuine to be a prank and opened it. He was a little surprised at what he first took to be a shirt, but when he opened it up it turned out to be a hari. It wasn't nearly as long as his father's, only going down to the top of his legs, and it was longer in the sleeve, just about covering his elbow. More importantly it was a vibrant red, not quite the deep bloody color of his hair, but the bright, joyful red of the Hokage hat. He somehow knew they were supposed to be worn in concert. After a moment of just admiring it he realized Anko was still waiting for a response. I, I know it won't really go with the flak jacket. Red and green and all. But it's got more pockets than I think even you could use, I made sure to give the guy the specification for those bigger on the inside seals you like so much so. Plenty of room. It's made out of the same material as the Anbu uniform so it's want tear easily, although I've got a couple spares for when you inevitably find a way. I mean, I know you didn't want everyone thinking you're copying your dad, 
but I thought it was different enough, but still enough to honor him, and. Naruto thought it was the most adorable thing in the world when his fiancée rambled, but he finally put her out of her suffering by silencing her with a kiss. I love it, he whispered, holding her for a moment before letting her go to try the thing on. After shucking his flak jacket he found it was a great fit. He had to admit it gave him something of a distinguished look, he supposed that was somewhat important for a Hokage. Well of course you do, Anko asserted, recovering admirably. I picked it out after all. Her look immediately took a sultry turn. Now where's my thanks? Admittedly, he didn't wear the Howry for very long that night, but there was something to be said for waking up the next day and finding it hanging there right next to his father's. The word legacy couldn't help but spring to mind. The Hokage had did in fact compliment the Howry quite nicely, as he had found out when Hiruzen had handed it to him and he had cheerfully slung it on his back. He didn't remember everything he'd said to the awaiting crowds from up on the Hokage Tower, he'd had this whole speech planned about successors and the will of fire. But in the end he was too caught up in the excitement and adrenaline of the moment to remember it. They had cheered fairly loudly though, so he couldn't have botched it too badly. Sensei? He started when he realized Emi was tugging on his sleeve, it was still rather novel he had a sleeve to tug. Sorry, zoned out a bit. He glanced up and took note that they had started moving. He recognized the stretch of country road they were on instantly, he had used this route out of the village too many times to count, and estimated they were about five minutes out of the gates. That was about enough to reach the threshold where the village stopped frowning on Shinobi moving too quickly. Time to pick up the pace. He grinned and took up a light jog, slowly increasing his speed. His students threw glances at one another with thinly veiled irritation, they knew what was coming. He was rather proud with how well they kept up with his punishing pace, some green Anbu recruits would have balked an hour ago. He really had trained them well, even Emi and Sakura, who used to be exhausted by a brief sprint through the village, were only breathing heavily by the time he wound back down to a more manageable pace. They didn't even complain about the slight sheen of sweat. Was that really necessary? Sensei? Emi gasped, already using the techniques he taught them to quickly regulate her breathing and promote recovery we don't even have. A solid location on Lady Tsunade. Maybe, but that means we'll just have to search harder and faster. I want this mission over with as soon as possible. Although he knew that was slightly optimistic. Tsunade was known to wander in what appeared to be a random pattern, but she was far more skilled at avoiding detection than her occasional drunken rampage let on. How else was she able to escape all her various debtors so often? Still, no use wasting the time he had with his students. Last known sighting was Ebazura Guy, up in the north. We still have a fair way to go so I figured I'd teach you each a new technique. He'd been anticipating the sparkle that entered their eyes immediately, younger shinobi were easy like that. We won't be stopping often, so I expect you guys to learn on the go. He could already see that wouldn't be a problem from the determined look they each adopted. Sakura, I know how much the med corp stresses dodging in the field, ironically because of the very woman they were now tracking down, but sometimes that just isn't an option. He ran through hand seals purposefully slowly, both to show them often because this wasn't a jutsu he used often. When he slammed his foot down a thick wall of stone rose up in the middle of the road. Doten, Doryuaki. He checked to make sure the pinket was paying attention. Useful for blocking routes to your position, and if made strong enough can even stop a few jutsu before breaking. He casually wound up a rasengan in a hand and shoved it through the wall. It's not indestructible, he warned. Pride welling up as Sakura nodded seriously. She'd figure out the strengths and weaknesses of the technique for herself, she was a smart girl. Sasuke. He nearly chuckled at how the Uchiha straightened, Sharingan already spinning in anticipation. I noticed your fondness for the little flame hands trick of yours, so I thought you'd appreciate this. It was one of the few pure fire manipulation techniques I was able to scrounge up. His hands entered the rat seal and after a moment's focus, twin streams of fire erupted from each of his hands. A moment later they intensified and shrank until he was holding two white-hot knives of fire in each hand. Draining, but they can cut through damn near anything. He tossed the Uchiha a pair of thick gloves from one of his many new pockets, thank you Anko, and gave the younger Chonin a level stare. Be careful learning and using this technique, it's not only dangerous to your enemy. Again, he waited until he was sure the warning had been taken on board. He had such good students. Finally, he turned to last of the trio. The violette was nearly bouncing with unrestrained excitement. She had been a bit harder to plan for. While the utility of the other two's techniques were apparent, Emi was a bit more straight-laced. She was a skilled Kenjutsu practitioner, that much was obvious, but
but it wasn't all that defined her. She was creative, often the brains behind some of Team 7's crazier, but no less effective, strategies. Really what she needed was a versatile tool that she could work into her own unique blend of skills. It was a good thing Naruto was so well-traveled then. This one might be a bit trickier I me, as I can't really profess to know the technique myself, I've only seen it in use and reverse-engineered what I could. Fu wouldn't be happy with him, but then, she was already a prisoner of the village. And it wasn't like he'd stolen the technique or anything. It was a credit to Ami that the Violet didn't seem at all put off by his hesitance. As far as I can tell the Kunoichi who uses it applies a thin layer of wind chakra to the soles of her feet, sort of like the water walking exercise, but as a nature transformation. Then you expand and contract the chakra to the timing of your movements, and... His eyes narrowed a moment in concentration as he slowly began to bounce on one foot. Slowly though, it wasn't the ground he was bouncing on as he rose into the air bit by bit. Finally, he lost focus, he hadn't really spent a lot of time trying to learn this before realizing he had better ways of moving faster, and dropped back to the ground. Well, you get the idea. The only reason he'd gotten as far as he had with the Taki Jinchuriki's signature jutsu was his extensive experience with Fuutan Chakra during his work on the completed Rasengan. Helpful for maneuvering around a battlefield, or escapes if need be. He regretted adding that last note as he noticed some of the enthusiasm drained from Amy's posture. Too soon perhaps. Still, when you master it. And he had no doubt that she would, given time you'll have a means of moving incredibly fast, silently and unpredictably. Kami knew it had given him the run around the first time he was forced to deal with it. With that little reaffirmation, Emmy nodded, turning to look curiously at her feet. Right, now you've all had a chance to recover. He took a moment to savor the sweet horror that entered their eyes let's get going, Ebizura guy isn't getting any younger. How hard could it be to track down somebody that famous anyway? He should have known better than to tempt the gods. Tsunade was a wily one, even with her rather distinctive description, she was able to completely elude all of her pursuers with what had to be practiced ease. It wasn't hard to pick up a trail on her, he just had to flash a photo and most of the people in the various gambling dens they searched could remember her. He could only imagine why. It was following the leads that proved nearly impossible. Tsunade seemed to have a habit of leaving in the middle of the night, without informing anyone at the hotel she stayed at. It made figuring out where she was going. Problematic. The only advantage they had going was their speed. Tsunade meandered around at about a civilian pace, according to whatever whim drove her. They, on the other hand, were able to zip between towns in a fraction of the time. Unfortunately, this meant their only solution was to try and nail down a timeline of the slug Sanin's visits by going to every nearby town in turn, then repeating that process while hoping she wasn't getting even further away. After a few days of this Naruto was even beginning to figure out the beginnings of a pattern. Tsunade had a tendency to visit larger towns when she could, better gambling dens and finer alcohol, and only made for the smaller, fringe villages when the heat from her various debtors became too much. Right now, despite their own pursuit, Tsunade hadn't caused much trouble in a while, so she was a lot more likely to head to the bigger, flashier casinos. So, when they slowed from their grueling pace at the outskirts of Maizu Gai, the red-headed Hokage was feeling optimistic. After a few moments to give his team time to recover, they were needing less and less of that as the week progressed, they ambled into the town with all the nonchalance that only trained ninja could properly muster. There appeared to be some form of festival going on, although that wasn't too surprising. Every town had their own traditions and special days and they were all looking for any excuse to attract tourists and bump off a day or two of work. Sundown was still a few hours away so only a handful of people were perusing the stalls, most of which were still being set up, so the shinobi quartet didn't draw too much attention as they threaded through the streets towards the seedier area of town they were sure to find the gambling halls. It took another hour of scoping out Chohan games, knuckle bones and a number using Karuta, before they struck lucky, sort of. They were passing their fifth gambling hall of the evening when they heard a commotion from the other side. Before they could even investigate a man's head suddenly broke through the wall looking suitably dazed for somebody who had apparently just headbutted a few inches of plaster. His eyes widened in horror a few moments later as the rest of his body promptly joined him in a shower of dust and wall fragments. He was promptly followed by a fretting young woman with short, dark hair who, for some reason, was clutching a pig. I'm so sorry about this, she's usually much better at restraining herself. Naruto and his team took all this in with a quiet sort of a bemusement. The redhead noted that the village's records of Shizun Kato were wildly out of date, she had grown up a lot from the young girl Tsunade had absconded with just before the Third Shinobi War. 
as if by clockwork the young woman's master was quick to join them, climbing through the hole she had made with a drunken elegance that was only counteracted by years of hardwired shinobi reflexes. She still managed to trip over a bit of loose debris. The Sanin. Wasn't what Naruto had expected. Hiruzen had warned that she had a tendency to change her appearance around to throw off pursuers that weren't well versed in genjutsu. Still, he had been expecting a woman of middling years bearing the proud stature suitable of somebody with her storied past. He should have known better than to put stock in such legendary figures, Jiraiya was exhibit A on that front. Instead, Team 7 saw a woman who didn't look much older than Anko stumble out of the gambling den. That's Jiraiya's teammate? Emi asked, bewildered at the sight of the young woman berating the battered man with a drunken slur. She was trying to reconcile the image she had of the toad Sanin with the bombshell blonde before them. The woman who was supposedly Tsunade wore clothes that would have made Naruto's fiancé proud, with a revealing white top and red skirt over mesh underclothing. The only thing that properly identified her was the iconic blue diamond on her forehead and the jacket draped over her shoulders that bore the kanji for gamble on the back. Shizune finished healing the man just in time for Tsunade to launch her now empty bottle of sake at his head, getting him to sprint away like he had glimpsed hell itself. Naruto chose that moment to make their presence known. Tsunade send you? Shizune took notice first, her eyes going wide and panicky as they flickered between the Konoha team and her mentor. Tsunade lacked even that much situational awareness as she took a few moments to turn ponderously, it looked as though any faster would have caused her to fall over, and glare at them suspiciously. Who's asking? The tone was more than a little confrontational. Naruto's gaze flickered between the two women in the hole in the wall where, even now, patrons from the hall were beginning to peek their heads through to watch the confrontation with a kind of morbid curiosity. There was also the owner of the gambling hall lamenting the destruction of his property, but he was going largely ignored. Perhaps we could move somewhere a bit. Quieter, Naruto suggested, earning a surprisingly grateful look from Shizune. It took a fair amount of coercion from her illogically older ward, but they eventually managed to get Tsunade situated in the far booth of a nearby bar. Apparently, all it took was the promise of more liquor, if that was the case then getting the woman back to Konoha might not have been such a problem. Unfortunately, the moment he brought the idea up. fa -a. Naruto had to compare the sound the blonde made to a large piece of fabric being torn in half a few times. You shouldn't be finding this funny, I'm very serious. It's time for you to come back to the village. He thought his voice conveyed that quite well. Tsunade seemed to disagree. Or what exactly? She declared with all the swagger afforded to her by her blood alcohol content. Naruto had a certain tolerance for people taking advantage of his goodwill, or even the occasional joke at his expense. If he didn't, Anko would have been found strangled in her sleep years ago. That tolerance wasn't without limit though, so when his eyes narrowed slightly and an unidentifiable pressure settled over the booth, his student quickly snapped out of their goggling, over Tsunade's reputation, drunkenness or bust varied between the three of them, and subtly shifted away from their sensei. Or you'll be branded an S-rank missing nin under the authority of the god I'm Hokage, like you should have been years ago for your flagrant dereliction of duty for over two decades. You could have heard a fly gasp in the silence that settled over the bar, at least until Tsunade let out an undignified snort, nearly knocking over her drink as she banged the table. Oh, oh, it's too funny when the young ones try to front up. Naruto sighed and leaned back in the booth, the noise rushing back into the room like the return ripple from a particularly violent splash. You're clearly too drunk to talk to, we'll be back when you've sobered up a bit. Tsunade just jeered at him, sloshing her drink expertly so that she didn't spill a drop. Yeah, good luck with that. Naruto stood up and made to leave, already planning how he'd position his team so that they could best watch the potential exits from the town. Tsunade wasn't getting away after all the trouble they had gone to tracking her down, only to pause as the woman quietened. She was staring into her saucer of sake, idly tilting it this way and that and watching her reflection shift and distort. So, the old goat finally stepped down again, who's the sucker who was stuck with that shit show? Naruto took a moment to debate the worth of continuing the conversation before sitting back down. You're looking at him. The blonde snorted childishly at the fact he'd called himself a sucker before tilting her head up to look him over. You don't look like much, what's with the dumb coat? She managed to get a twitch out of the redhead for that, especially considering the howry she was wearing wasn't dissimilar to his. I suppose you'll be the one sending the goons after me when all this goes official. Naruto tilted his head, she didn't seem all that concerned with being on the run. He supposed it wasn't all that different to the life she lived now. In fact, he could see her point 
Given her famed power and her experience evading people there probably weren't many that could take her in. Jiraiya, the sentimental bastard, would probably refuse on principle. Instead, Naruto leaned across the table with a vindicative smile, placing a hand on the woman's shoulder so that she was forced to meet his steeled gaze. I assure you, if I do put that order through. And I will. I'll be the one dogging your trail every step of the way. The blonde met his stare without fear, grinning right back as she downed another swig of sake straight from the bottle. Seems like a lot of work for the incumbent Hokage, don't you have some paperwork to go and drown in? Work? Depends on how attached you are to that coat, he shot back as he settled back into the booth. Tsunade gave him a confused look before glancing at her shoulder, just in time to watch a Hiraishan tag swirl to life. It took her alcohol haze of a mind a moment to recognize her own uncle's technique before she sneered, quickly shedding the coat and throwing it at the redhead's face and standing up. There you go, enjoy the show while you can. She sidled out of the booth, pulling Shizun with her, because next time you track me down I'll start by breaking every bone in your arm. She absently crushed the sake bottle in her hand. And there are a lot of them. Tsunade-sama, please. To everybody's surprise it was Sakura who called out, deftly climbing out of the booth to stand in front of the legendary medic. There are so many in the hospital who could use your help, so many medics who could be that much better with your teaching. The blonde gave the girl a searching look, taking in her neat, clinical appearance and the telltale signs of medical equipment in her pouch. You get your kids to fight your battles now? Tsunade asked, not even turning to address Naruto. You're fitting into your position already. She shouldered past the disillusioned Pinkette easily, only pausing again when Naruto called out. It doesn't have to be this way, Hiruzen is basically gifting you the hospital. Free run of how things work, entire overhauls if need be. He wants his student back just as much as the village needs you. To her credit, Tsunade did turn back, if only to flip the redhead off. On second thought, maybe you're not such a good Hokage, the sweet talk is supposed to come before the threats and negotiation. Naruto had risen to meet her, undaunted by her narrowed eyes. Yeah, well I was always more of a doer than a diplomat. I'm still learning that part. Besides, I've read all about you, what the village took from you, what you've lost. I didn't think you'd come back just because a few bounty hunters were after your head. It was mostly for the old man I even bothered. So, are we done here? Tsunade growled, already turning to leave. What I had heard though, was that you were a gambler. Tsunade stopped in her tracks. What of it? Well? How about a wager? Are you alright? Sakura asked as Tsunade's apprentice, Naruto's three students, and the pig, who had been introduced as Tantan at some point, stood at the edge of the small garden. You don't look too worried about all of this. She motioned vaguely to Tsunade and Naruto, who had taken up in the middle of the garden across from one another at a large stone slab. Oh, I'm just sort of resigned to it at this point. Indeed, the young woman seemed to be fretting in a remarkably controlled, practice manner. Tsunade-sama, does what she wants and I'm just sort of here too. Well, I'm just sort of here. Emi frowned from the other side of Sakura. That doesn't sound right. Shizun's eyes widened as she instantly began backtracking over her words. Oh, don't mistake me. Tsunade-sama is a wonderful woman, I learned more from her than I could have imagined. She only really gets this way when the memories become particularly bad, otherwise she can be quite lovely. Yeah, but what about what you want to do? Emi soldiered on, with all the tact that Anko had forced out of her. Shizun simply took on a wistful smile at that as she glanced back to the main event. What about your sensei? Naruto seems like a remarkable man himself, to challenge Tsunade in a contest of strength like this. Sakura and Emi shared a look at that. Sasuke might have joined in but he was somewhat busy scrutinizing the pig sitting in his lap with a perplexed expression. Why is this pig wearing a pearl necklace? Yeah, that's Naruto-sensei. Emi answered, ignoring Sasuke completely. Unpredictable as ever. But do you really think he can win? Shizun asked, glancing back at the pair. Somehow the poor bartender had been roped into all of this and was doing an admirable impression of a rabbit stuck in front of a fire jutsu. I mean, I know Tsunade-sama has a reputation when it comes to gambling. But an arm wrestle? Emi and Sakura shared another look before shrugging at the same time. It's Naruto-sensei. Sure enough, the two in question were just squaring up their arms on the table, the nervous bar owner glancing between them furtively. You ready to have those arm bones crushed earlier than expected Namikaze? Tsunade asked, wearing a savage grin as she clenched and unclenched her hand experimentally. 
Naruto on the other hand looked quite neutral about the whole affair. Just as long as we're still clear on the rules. Yeah, yeah, best two out of three. You win. Her eyes betrayed just how likely she thought that was I go back to the village and take up as chief medic. And when I win, Konoha pays off my gambling debts and leaves me the hell alone. Naruto nodded his affirmation and motioned for the bartender to do his thing, locking hands with the grinning Sanin. The barkeep placed his hand atop theirs and, after a quick muttered prayer, began counting down. 3. 2. 1. G. The slam of Tsunade's hand hitting the stone table could have made the daimyo's court silent. For everyone watching it was as though both their arms were upright one moment, then flat to the side the next, at no point occupying the space between. Both Tsunade and Shizun were staring at it open mouths while Naruto's students looked on smugly from the sidelines. Fast. The Sanin recovered quickly, glaring across at the redhead. You cheated. Naruto stared right back, now sporting a smirk of his own. We're shinobi, there's no such thing. Tsunade reset her features and put her arm back up. Well it won't work a second time. And Naruto could see that it wouldn't, the muscles in her arm were already tensed when they locked fingers. Luckily that wasn't the only trick in his bag. 3. 2. 1. G. This time the last word was drowned out by the sudden flare of power from both shinobi. A thin aura of yellow enveloped Tsunade, clearly hoping to overpower Naruto in an instant just as he had her. But the Namikaze was holding on admirably, his skin starting to turn red as he unlocked the first three inner gates. It was a technique he didn't like using, thinking it too short-sighted and damaging for the advantage it gave. Still, he had explored a lot of avenues for increasing his speed when he was younger, currently three gates was as far as he could go. He would have to do something to thank Guy when he got back, maybe give him some way to track down Kakashi? It still didn't seem enough though as, inch by inch, his hand was forced down. Three gates were a lot, but against the Sanin's raw, unmatched strength he might as well have been doing nothing at all. It seemed inevitable when his hand finally touched the stone table, cracking it slightly under the pressure of their combined aura. Both let go instantly, Naruto quickly locking his chakra back down again as his skin returned to its normal tanned hue. The gates huh, nice trick, Tsunade said, with all the swagger of somebody who thought victory was already theirs. And not my last, Naruto shot back, putting his arm back up without hesitation. It took them a moment to realize that nobody was coming to adjudicate the contest, as the bartender had passed out at some point during their last exchange. Instead Emmy bounced over, cheerfully putting her hands over theirs. Kick her ass sensei, she declared, quickly moving on before either could react. 3. 2. 1. Go. Through exuberance alone was her voice heard over the sudden wave of barely restrained energies the two powerful shinobi released. Naruto instantly unlocked all three gates again, but Tsunade simply let her hand stay where it was, taunting him with her immovability. She didn't even try to push him down, meeting his eye with a victorious smirk. The moment she did though he made sure she regretted it. In that single moment of distraction, he went through the first two steps of creating a Rasengan. In the hand that was currently clasped against Tsunade's. In the time it took the signal to travel from her hand, that her grip had been almost forcibly loosened by the sudden outpouring of spiraling energy, up to her brain, Naruto had already forced her hand down onto the table with the dull thud of a tomb being sealed. There was one, long moment of utter silence in the little garden before the slab of stone they were using as a table gave a suffering groan, and split clean in two. I win. Chapter 40, Official Trouble. Tsunade was surprisingly gracious in defeat, only trying to escape once during the night. Eventually though, after a great deal of childish resistance, flailing, complaining, as well as name-calling, although that was mainly Amy's input, the strange group began their trek back to Konoha. It was a significantly more sobered Tsunade who suddenly found herself on the receiving end of an inquisitive Sakura. It was quite the novel experience for the older woman, as she was used to Shizun's quiet acceptance of whatever it was she had to teach. Sakura on the other hand grew up in an environment of questioning being encouraged, both by Naruto and her superiors at the hospital. Having the world's greatest medic nin on hand was an opportunity she was never going to pass up. Naruto watched the exchange bemusedly towards the rear of the group, where Shizun was trailing along quietly, clutching her pig as if it were a lifeline. Hi, we never got to be introduced properly, he greeted suddenly, shifting his eyes from the bickering medics to the startled woman to his side. Naruto Namikaze. He held a hand out and, after a moment, Shizun accepted it, 
receiving a disgruntled expression from Tantan as she was jostled during the exchange. Nobody had worked up the courage to ask about the pig yet. At least not in front of said pig. Oh, I know. Tsunade-sama might act distant and uncaring but even on our travels, word reached us about the new Hokage. She gave him a strange smile he couldn't quite figure out. Shizun Kato, it's nice to meet you. She seemed about to turn her gaze forward again but thought better of it, looking down at the road. I can't imagine the kind of responsibility for somebody so young. The redhead grinned sheepishly, used to the platitude, if it wasn't congratulations it was usually something along those lines. To be honest, it's not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. Sure there's a lot of pressure, but I have Hiruzen to ease me in, and it's mostly just making sure all the right decisions get made, or making sure that I'm the one making the wrong ones. Paperwork mostly. He glanced forward, noting Sakura and Tsunade seemed to be in some intense debate over one thing or another. It's your responsibility I'm not envious of. Shizun didn't even have to follow his gaze to catch his meaning. You and Tsunade-sama got off on the wrong foot, but I'm sure with time she'll warm up. Despite appearances she's not one to hold grudges. Both instantly, and unaware that they were mirroring each other, thought of a certain snake. Most of the time. Her smile brightened slightly. I think this trip home will be good for her. And you? The unofficial Kunoichi nearly tripped over her feet at the sudden question. W what do you mean? Just a thought, Naruto mused. This whole trip was about bringing Tsunade back to the village, nobody asked what you thought about all this. Shizun seemed conflicted about that. I go where Tsunade-sama goes, I'm her apprentice. The redhead just hummed thoughtfully. Squirming slightly under the sudden lull in the conversation Shizun was forced to incline her head. I admit. I'm quite excited to finally come home, it's been so long since I've seen the village, she chuckled quietly into her sleeve. I'm sure it's changed so much since I was a girl. Naruto matched her smile. One, soon to be two whole heads. He glanced up at the sky. But you would be surprised. No matter how much it changes, or grows, or is rebuilt. There's always something uniquely. Konoha, about that village. I think I could be gone for a hundred years and still know it by sight. You have a lot of fond memories then? My whole life, in one way or another. It must be nice, to have a place grounded in feelings like that. She nearly jumped when he patted her lightly on the shoulder. Well, if all goes well, and Tsunade doesn't pull a runner, you might too. Shizun smiled at that and Naruto silently affirmed his belief that Tsunade wouldn't be the only one benefiting from a return home. This poor girl had basically dedicated her life to her master, mostly because she'd known little else. While he wouldn't denigrate their relationship, he could see it was a deep one, giving Shizun some freedom to choose for a change would do her a world of good. And if it got Tsunade to grow up and stop acting like a child, all the better. Although, Glancing forward and spotting the young-looking blonde throw a stone petulantly at the back of Sasuke's head, he wasn't holding out hope on that front. Remind me to introduce you to Anko when we get back, I think you two might be able to get on. A friend of yours? Fiancé actually, she's pregnant with our first child at the moment. At that, Shizun's smile grew a lot brighter. Oh, I love babies. And, as though some magic word had been spoken to the gods, Sakura and Emi were suddenly in front of them burying Shizun in baby talk. Naruto had to smile at the sight, his mind drifting to what his lover was doing at the moment. So, Anko began, absently tossing a kunai up and down as she leaned back in her chair. Some would have said that was a dangerous combination for a pregnant woman, they'd never met Anko holding a kunai. We didn't exactly have a stellar first meeting, granted. Fu simply glared at her from across the table. Look, no need to give me that look, this is supposed to be a friendly chat. The purple-haired woman finally seemed to realize what she was doing and deftly returned the kunai to an undefined location on her person. See, friendly? Okay, I get it, you're a prisoner. Sort of, in an enemy village, so you're doing the whole stubborn silence bit. I understand. But really there's no need, the war's over. She extended a hand over the table. How about we start over? Fu simply switched her glare to the hand. I don't give a crap about all of that. Taki can go and suck one. They abandoned me here when they got spanked during this whole ill-advised war, then ran off with their tails between their legs. Have they even asked for me back? Before Anko could answer she continued anyway. Me, not their Jinchuriki. Anko's mouth closed with a snap. Thought so. No, I couldn't give two shits about my village, cowards the lot of them, no, 
What I'm trying to figure out is how the hell Naruto settled for you. You could have dropped a coin in the room and it still would have been smothered by the oppressive silence that suddenly seemed to radiate out of Anko. Her hand hung there for a moment, still extended for a shake, only to close slowly into a fist and draw back with painstaking precision. When Anko was finished counting to ten in her head, an exercise Sakura had recommended to her if she ever felt unduly stressed, she let out a long breath. You. Are very lucky that I'm pregnant, or you'd be learning if your hair tastes as mini as it looks. Fu just rolled her eyes. Can we get through with this already? I was told I'd have some Jounin chaperone for a month or two to settle me into the village. Wasn't that how this whole exchange is supposed to go? She acted nonchalant, but the sickly sweet smile Anko was giving her was beginning to creep her out. Sure, why not? She made vague gesture and a nearby section of wall opened up to reveal a tall blonde-haired man with an easy smile. This is Inoiki Yamanaka, his family has agreed to sponsor you, for your probation tenure. My daughter's actually quite excited to meet you, apparently something to brag about to a friend of hers. Oh great, Fu drawled. I've been turned into a life-sized accessory. She's also very interested in studying the psychological impact of long-term attention deprivation and the effects it has on a Jinchuriki's psyche, with hopes for treatments through graduated acceptance therapy. Both women blinked nearly simultaneously while Inoiki smiled. Normal teenage girl stuff. Fu shook her head to clear out the potentially disturbing imagery there and turned back to Anko. You know, I half expected Naruto to be here. Anko's eye twitched slightly at that, reminded that if her fiancé, and boy didn't it just make her giddy thinking that, wasn't out looking for the slug Sanin, he probably would be here. Yes, well, luckily. I mean, currently the village has laws that prohibit the Hokage from getting personally involved with any shinobi transfers. Fu leaned back in her chair at that, sighing with an expression caught between bemused and disbelieving. So he actually did it, huh? She looked back down, a slightly more genuine smile on her face once she understood that even if she riled these people up they weren't going to snap at her. It felt comfortable knowing that a fellow Jinchuriki was running the show, it at least offered a glimmer of hope that she wouldn't just be used up and tossed away like a sharper than normal kunai. So, when's the wedding? Her only answer was Anko slamming the door shut behind her, leaving the verdet alone with Inoiki. He was still wearing that carefully measured smile that somehow put Fu both at ease, and on edge. If my daughter asks to look in your mind, no matter how insistently, please refuse. Fu blinked. Um, sure. I think I would have anyway. Inoiki's smile simply shifted, suggesting he knew one of those terribly amusing things that shouldn't be shared in polite company. You say that, but she has. Away, with people. But she's still not ready for a Jinchuriki's mind. Right, Fu said slowly, already wishing Anko would come back. She would rather have simmering anger than whatever this was. Naruto let out a long, relieved exhale as he sank back into his chair. He had thought it impossible, but he had actually missed the wood-paneled office with its comfy, plush chair and desk polished by the wrists of four different Hokage. He hadn't missed the stack of paperwork innocently sitting off to the side, but that was what shadow clones were for. That, and messing with people. And exploding, because that trick never got old. So, I've haven't missed anything catastrophic then? No. Hiruzen smiled amusedly, nothing so awful as that. Although if you could officiate your sojourns out of the village to be a bit more occupationally appropriate next time. Don't worry, I'm pretty sure that now I'm back something will pop out of the woodwork that requires my attention, it always seems to work like that. Hiruzen's eyebrow simply quirked. I'm not quite sure I know what you mean. Really? I've just gotten back from a mission bringing Tsunade back. A story I very much look forward to hearing by the way and nothing went wrong in my absence, something is going to happen soon. At least, if being the Hokage is anything like being an Anbu captain in that regard. I think you're being a bit pessimistic my boy. I'm afraid as Hokage you might have to get used to long stretches of relative peace and quiet. Yeah, but that's the stickler isn't it, Naruto argued, waggling a finger knowingly. Relative peace just isn't the same for me, everyone knows it. I'm a trouble magnet. If you say so my boy, Hiruzen said, clearly looking as though he simply thought Naruto was a bit tired after his trip. Although, as if just to prove him wrong, an Anbu faded into the room and quickly handed over a thicker-than-average report that had all the trappings of being a skip-the-stack kind of document. Naruto took a moment to waggle it at the former Hokage for emphasis. I'm sure it's just a field report, a coincidence at best. 
Although his conviction wavered as Naruto thumbed through the report, expression growing more troubled as he read. The Sanbi has destroyed a fishing village on the east coast. He slapped the sheaf of papers down, sucking his teeth. Well, now I don't feel like saying I told you so. Hiruzen quickly shared his expression. By Juu are always political nightmares. Technically the Sanbi belongs to Kirigakur, and this could be anything from an attack. He glanced at the map table, specifically the tiny village south of the land of waves that was now a lot smaller although unusually placed, to an accident. I'm more inclined to think that, given the result of their civil war, we're not dealing with a Jinchuriki. A wild by Juu then, even more problematic. Quite. This was actually something that fell outside of Hiruzen's extensive experience. Uncontained by Juu were rarely Konoha's problem, save for the one very obvious exception. Even now, Naruto was fighting back flashes of slitted red eyes surrounded by fire and unbearable screams. Suffice it to say, he remembered that particular night all too vividly, and the thought of similar destruction forced his fingers to tap restlessly against the desk. Hiruzen must have gleaned something from the look in his eye as he immediately sighed. I would advise extreme caution in the matter, we're dealing with exceedingly delicate international matters here. Naruto nodded in an absent manner that didn't exactly fill the former Hokage with confidence. How long would it take to organize a political envoy to Kirigakur? It was to his credit that Hiruzen was barely phased by the seemingly random turn in the conversation. A few days at most, given the current climate in Mizu no Kuni. He had already figured some of what was running through the younger redhead's mind and, for once, was glad he was acting with a bit more forethought than simply rushing into the problem headfirst. Wagers didn't tend to work on by Juu. I think Kiri has had long enough to recover, and we're in the rather unique situation of being rather lax on allies currently. With Kiri shoring up their coastline, it would certainly discourage Kumo from any more ill-advised action, or at least give the rakage pause. Likewise, since the shaky situation with Sunagakur's invasion, their trade in more exotic goods had run a bit dry. Having access to Kiri's recovering sea trade would be a boon. Getting a toe in the door for Konoha's spy network wouldn't hurt either, the island nation had been a black spot on their radar for decades and in the lull of their internal victory they might not notice a few extra faces in the crowd. Naruto was magnanimous most of the time, but he could still think like the leader of a shinobi village. The more he thought about it, the more it seemed like a good idea, and with a final nod he stood and made for the door. I'll let my team know, it'll be good for them to get a crash course on politics. He was forced to stop when Hiruzen stepped in his path an expression on his face that Naruto recognized when the man was offering advice he thought non-optional. If I might recommend a softer touch. He placed a hand on Naruto's shoulder when he caught the Hokaye's narrowed eyes. I'm not suggesting that spending so much time with your team is a bad thing Naruto, or even that they might be unsuited for the task. He inclined his head. They need to find their own paths Naruto, as a teacher you need to understand this. I know you care for them, and I admit you have done a wonderful job with their training but you also need to step back every now and then and let them expand on their own. Let them take a few missions with their peers, relax in their roles. Oversight is a handy tool, but in excess it can be smothering. No offense, but I've seen the effects of hands-off teaching firsthand, not a fan. Hiruzen's eyes became flat at that. None taken, Orochimaru will continue to be a stain on my tenure as Hokage for as long as that monument stands. But my point stands, you cannot be there for your students all of the time, Sometimes the best way we can protect the people we care about is to make sure they can protect themselves. Naruto clicked his tongue, mulling it over for a moment. I can see your point, and Sasuke would probably complain about the mist anyway. Emi has been looking for an excuse to hang out with her sister more and nobody knows better than me how much Sakura is needed in the hospital. I'm sure I can hang back a bit more. Hiruzen smiled at that, glad at least Naruto wasn't simply capitulating and was at least examining the merits of the idea that's for the best as. He spared another glance at the Sanbi report, aside from the occasional unique case, you will be spending a lot of time in the village. Your team will still need to go on missions, often without you. Fine, fine, Naruto drawled, waving his hand as he walked back to the desk. I understand. But that just means I have to train them twice as hard when I do have them around. The point was punctuated by a particularly vicious smile ripped right out of Anko's book as he sank back into his chair. Hiruzen recognized the look all teachers wore at some point or another. I certainly wouldn't deny you that. Elsewhere three Chonin suddenly felt a chill pass down their spine. I'll make sure the diplomatic envoy is ready to head out as soon as possible, now if you'll excuse me I have my own student to catch up with. 
Naruto nodded, already tuning the rest of the world out as he returned to the backed up paperwork he'd be wrestling with for the next four hours. She's at the hospital I believe, said something about getting her new domain straightened out. Hiruzen could only smile fondly. I'm sure she is. Who the hell filed these patient forms? It's like searching through shit in a pig pen for all the good it does. She slammed the cabinet shut with a clang that pierced through even the general din of the hospital. I thought you lot would be a little competent from the look of the pinkette back there, but it's clear I'm working with amateurs. She stuck an arm out and grabbed a fistful of the nearest scrambling orderly. Where's Yakushi sensei I I. I don't know Lady teased Tsunade. Do you always stutter like this? She asked, loudly, her face about an inch from his. And no? Are you asking me or telling me? Telling? The de-aged Sanin let go of his scrubs forcefully, corner of her mouth curled up into a sneer. He just seemed to hover there before Tsunade rounded on him again. Well? Go find Yakushi sensei already. The orderly was like a rabbit that had been thrown in the middle of a busy road, suddenly darting off into the madness that had been the hospital since Tsunade's unannounced return. The blonde watched him go for a bit before turning back to the general maelstrom of the ICU. Gradually her grimace slipped into the smallest smirk. I can work with this. Her musing was quickly interrupted by a rather unwanted sensation. She looked down to see a young woman with her purple hair pulled up into a ponytail that fanned out behind her head. That wouldn't have been so unusual if the woman wasn't also gently poking one of her breasts with an odd expression. Holy crap, if anything the stories were under-exaggerating these bad boys. She seemed blissfully unaware of the vein slowly throbbing on Tsunade's forehead, even as she met the woman's eye without a shred of shame. What the heck do you eat? Behind her a different woman wearing a thorn-patterned dress was staring at her friend with disbelieving eyes. Tsunade was about to knock the obnoxious woman through a wall, only to glance down and notice the telltale beginnings of a bump. She was rather glad to have noticed before she heard a pregnant woman. It was at that point that she noticed the woman hadn't actually stopped prodding her, and they were beginning to draw a crowd. Mostly men. Stop that. She growled irritably, slapping the violette's hand away. Sorry, the woman replied sheepishly, rubbing the back of her head and not looking all that apologetic. It's just. She motioned to the Tsunade's chest with a flourish, finishing with an eyebrow waggle that suggested all that needed to be said. For a second Tsunade feared she was looking at a female Jiraiya. A Jiraiya she couldn't hit, the thought was genuinely chilling. Yes, I have big breasts, you have eyes. Was that the diagnosis you were in here for? Without violence Tsunade defaulted to sarcasm, it managed to be nearly as biting. Big? Lady, you graduated from sweater puppies to full-on sweater wolves. They're not just bongos, you've got the full percussion section in there. I'd motorboat them, but I don't have the money for a yacht. You can't even call them knockers anymore, they're more like gongs. If they were ski slopes they'd be double black diamonds, parachute required. I mean geez, when you cross your arms does the ground get pulled up by their gravity? Far from the previous bustle of the waiting room, a dead silence had managed to creep in sometime during her rant. Tsunade did in fact cross her arms and, to her credit, the woman appeared somewhat disappointed. I guess not. Are you done? The violette simply shrugged. I was trying to think of a fruit bigger than melon's butt. Yeah, no. Yeah, I'm done. Lovely. The sonning drawled. Outwardly she was disgruntled by the whole exchange, inwardly she was somewhat impressed. Most people wouldn't have the spine or balls to say all of that to her face. Well, they certainly wouldn't after they'd said it. Oh, sorry. That was rude of me. She suddenly stuck out her hand. I'm Anko. Tsunade just sucked it up, reminding herself over and over this woman was pregnant. I had thought you might be. She vaguely remembered Naruto describing his fiancée on the trip back to Konoha, it certainly explained a lot. You in for the baby? She motioned to Anko's stomach only for the woman to wave her off with a laugh. What? Nah, that's all sorted for now, I'm here to see somebody. Feisty redhead with an attitude problem. I don't know what room they're in. Tsunade just snorted. It's called the Hokaye's office, you're in the wrong building for that. Anko shared her grin for a moment. Funny, but no. She's called Tuya Uzumaki, Naruto asked me to check in on her. Being treated for. Nerve damage and some kind of withdrawal I think? Tsunade had stopped listening at Uzumaki, suddenly grabbing the nearest nurse with all the subtlety of an elephant learning to dance. Where are the patient files for long-term care? 
It took the poor woman a few moments to gather her bearings before shakily pointing into a room behind the main desk. Tsunade released her and immediately vaulted the counter, quickly rifling through the admittance records before grabbing a particular sheet of paper and rushing off into the hospital corridors, only pausing to glance back at Anko. Well, are you coming? Anko glanced back at Kurenai with a grin, the woman having been speechless throughout the entire debacle. Wow, Naruto was on to something bringing her back, the service here's gotten way better. She quickly followed the older woman, navigating by the tide of shocked hospital staff the blonde had left in her wake. Kurenai just gave a suffering sigh, pinched the bridge of her nose, and quietly followed on. Well how was I supposed to know she would be asleep? You would have if you had followed normal hospital protocol. I would have, if you hadn't suddenly gone all gung-ho, charging through the damn hallways. I got distracted by the sudden knowledge I still have some distant relatives, sue me. Besides, it's my damn hospital. Distracted? You want to talk about distracted with those chesticles bouncing all over the shop? Anko, is this really? The shadow waited until a solid five minutes had passed from the door quietly snapping shut, before letting out the breath he had been holding. The conversation between the three women had been amusing enough, but with every second they stayed he risked exposure. The Hokage was distracted with his preparations to leave the village again and hadn't got around to assigning a new guard to the recovering Uzumaki's room. This was his best shot, if he waited much longer the girl would be alert enough to at least draw attention if he tried anything. He had worked in this hospital for so long now that opening the windows from the outside was child's play, despite being reinforced against intrusion. It had been a sabotage long in the works, but the building was practically his now, even with the recent shift in management. The return of the slug Sanin had been a bit of a surprise, something that was becoming an irritated norm since Naruto had taken up the big red hat, but the chaos from her arrival he could certainly work with. He spared a glance down at Tuya's sleeping form, red hair splayed out over her pillow. He had to confess this felt like a tremendous loss, he had always argued for Orochimaru to use the girl for more than just guarding a gate. Certainly, they had the other girl, and Karen showed far more of the traits that made the Uzumaki feared and respected. Still, he would have killed for a chance to get this one on the operating table and have a poke around inside. He'd certainly done more for less. It's nothing personal, you understand, Kabuto muttered absently as his hands lit up with the pallid green glow of his chakra scalpels. In a few minutes the nurses would come in only to find the girl had suffered a rather unfortunate brain hemorrhage, a terrible aftereffect of the enzyme they didn't catch in time. Even the famed Tsunade wouldn't be able to do anything before the girl died. He felt Orochimaru would appreciate the reminder to his old teammate just what Konoha tore away from people. And there was him taking vindictive pleasure in the act. Oh, I suppose it is after all. His glasses glinted slightly in the light streaming through the window as he leaned forward and turned her head, narrowing his eyes to locate just where he would have to make the incision. However, when he brought his hand down to finish the job he found it stuck, as though the air around him had hardened into concrete. He struggled harder but found his body moving in the opposite direction, slowly settling into a slumped posture that had cold sweat percolating on the back of his neck. MHHM, troublesome. When Iviki informed me that you were the likeliest suspect I knew the facts lined up, but I must be getting sentimental. A perfect record, invaluable asset to the hospital to the point where even your many attempts at the Chunin exams could be overlooked. It'll be irritating to lose such a useful piece. Shikaku hummed thoughtfully, barely having to concentrate to maintain his technique. But then, capturing a silver general always carries risks when playing against a good enough opponent. Kabuto didn't panic, Shikaku Nara was a powerful shinobi, but the shadow techniques of his clan were far from infallible. If he considered him just a well-placed spy he may be underestimating him. But then, if Shikaku was here, the rest of the Ino Shikacho wouldn't be far off. That was fine too, Kabuto hadn't spent years as Konoha's deepest mole without learning all he could for this very eventuality. He'd studied the various formations of the legendary team by rote. Shikaku was keeping him facing the wall, likely to hide the positions of his teammates. But Kabuto knew Kuza would be at the door, covering the main avenue of escape. In a moment Shikaku would modulate his technique, pretending to lose control of it to lull his captive into a false sense of security. Naturally he would expect Kabuto to make for the window, where Inoiki would be waiting to take over his mind. The Yamanaka weren't perfect either, their technique took time to travel and if he could just duck quick enough it would only be a mindless body he'd have to avoid. Sure enough, he felt the technique weaken for a split second and pulsed his chakra at the perfect moment to destroy it, hopefully throwing Shikaku off guard with the precision of the cut. He turned immediately, 
already hunkering to duck under the expected mind-body switch technique. He was somewhat caught off guard then, by the clawed hand that caught him right in the face. Sume easily slung the unconscious spy over her shoulder with a grunt. Well, that was easier than expected. Thought this one was supposed to be something special to go undetected for so long. Shikaku simply shrugged, already skulking off now that his part in this was done. He was, but it doesn't matter how far you can see ahead, when you're already standing on the wrong path. Sume blinked before glancing over at Kuza. Translation? The large man grinned. He let his expectations get the better of him. Sume didn't exactly look pleased at the explanation, it didn't really answer anything. So, where's Inoiki anyway? Thought this was more his thing. Kuza waved to the window. Busy with his houseguest, I've heard his daughter's giving her quite the experience. Sume let out a bark of a laugh. I bet. From what my Kiba tells me she's quite the talker. She shifted the weight on her shoulder absently, wondering if she could get away with handing him off to Kuromaru. Still, happy to fill in. Kuza just smiled in that congenial way of his, she had yet to see anything that riled the jolly man up. Maybe Wood could make this semi-permanent, always nice to run with a new pack every so often. Maybe? Kuza offered, with a glance forward to his friend. We could call it the Sushi Kacho. Shikaku coughed into his hand. Don't push it. Chapter 41, Official Negotiations. Naruto had only been to Mizu no Kuni a few times before, and never in a friendly way. It was similarly difficult putting together a retinue familiar with their eastern cousins. A Byakugan user was a must, Konoha had learned not to fight Kiri in their own mists without some kind of long-range detector. Naruto was a decent sensor, but he was no natural, having Byakuya Hayuga along allowed him to focus on other matters. Such as what he was going to say to the Mizukage. He remembered their last conversation at the Taki Chonin exams and the way she so naturally seemed to fit in that chair. She was confident, cunning, and wasn't above a bit of light manipulation. But, back then he wasn't a cage, they should be on equal footing now in that regard. Although whether or not she would see it that way remained to be seen. He was the younger cage, in both age and tenure, but the latter was only by a few months. She may have lived through and won a civil war, but Naruto wasn't bereft of experience either, and he had one of the wisest advisors you could ask for in Hiruzen, even if the older man wasn't with him now. Already the power games were in full effect as Naruto and his party were forced to wait at the very outskirts of the village, to be escorted in. He knew the Kiri Nin were aware of his presence, Byakuya had confirmed they were being watched towards the edge of his Dujutsu's range. They stayed there, in the damp of the waterlogged forest, for about 20 minutes before a small entourage of Kiri Jounin arrived to escort them forward. Enough to try their patience, but not enough to convey offense. Nearly textbook, Hiruzen would have likely thought of several ways to turn this on its head by now. But Naruto wasn't Hiruzen, he was more than willing to wait out these little games. He was the visitor here, so already he was in the weaker negotiating position. Whatever May had to do to reinforce her confidence was fine with him. His main advantage was that she had no idea why he was here, and the fact that she had been perhaps a little too hasty in accepting his offer of talks. That eagerness was telling. Kirigakura was a beautiful village what it lacked in Konoha's bustling rustic charm, it made up for an elegant, twisting architecture done in a white, almost metallic stone that shone with the condensation clinging to the walls. It also seemed more planned than Konoha's sometimes random street designs, more like an extended military base instead of the almost organic growth his own village had underwent. Although on that point he figured that Hiruzen might have been a bit too secure in the idea that other villages couldn't cotton on to Konoha's success. The signs of the recent civil war were still evident around him, in the hastily patched up buildings and the more recent additions that didn't quite match the traditional aesthetic. The village was beginning to show some of that patchwork beauty that would have been so intensely familiar to any leaf nin. Likewise, he could see the bustle of activity, from both shinobi and civilians alike intermingling. Mei Terumi wasn't the proud type then, above learning from her rivals. That was useful to know. The Mizukage building was impressive in its own right, as scorched as it was by, if the bingo books were accurate about Terumi's abilities, lava. It might have passed for some kind of arena from the outside, if not for the many aqueducts sprouting off its circular form and spreading out through the village like a system of stony veins. The waterways were also apparently used as some kind of converted highway system as he and his retinue were lead right up one, using paths built on either side of the water flow, and straight into the heart of the building. Based on the aesthetic of the village he might have expected a very spartan, bare stone sort of effect inside. Instead, 
Everything was rather lavishly decorated with pastel colors, warm tapestries and rich imported woods that banished any thoughts of the dreary weather outside. Even if the Yondaime Mizukage was a genocidal madman who threw his entire country into the bloodiest period in shinobi history since the clan wars. He had wonderful taste in decoration. This time, the Mizukage eschewed any more mind games and had him come right in, minus his entourage. That was fine though, they had their own orders and it wasn't as though even with his retinue around they stood a much better chance of surviving aggressive action. The large window that dominated one side of the office was done in such a way that it cast the light streaming through the mist outside into entrancing rainbow patterns that danced across the walls distractingly. Sitting there in her plush, high back chair with all the elegance of a true leader, May Terumi managed to look even more beautiful than he remembered. Although that may have been the few extra inches of skin on display, this was a woman who played for keeps. Why Hokage Dono? She started, somehow making those first few words drip with a primal magnetism I must admit that it was an unexpected pleasure to hear you would come calling. Naruto pulled together all of his training to keep a comfortable but non-deferential smile on his face as he settled into the decidedly less comfortable chair opposite her desk. The two of us partaking in such a private sojourn together, my, the other cage must be scandalized. Should they be Mizukage Dono? Naruto shot back easily, silently reminding himself over and over that he was the Hokage. After all, these are just friendly talks, are they not? May somehow turned the slight quirk of a lip into a sultry expression Anko would have killed to mimic. Oh, of course. She leaned forward slightly, accentuating the depth of her neckline. But you see, it's all about appearances with them, they likely balk at the idea of. She drew herself in slightly, as if remiss to even speak it out loud what we might do together. Naruto leaned forward as well, humoring her. Such as? At that the auburn-haired woman leaned back with practice nonchalance. Oh, you know, trade monopolies, armament packs, truces. She dropped her eyelids a fraction of an inch alliances. Again, Naruto humored the idea, waving his hand as if weighing some invisible scale. Well, such a block would be fearsome, they would have every right to be worried. He let that thought hover for a moment, before adding, even if the idea is far-fetched. The Mizukage's smile didn't waver. Of course. They continued in this manner for a good few minutes, lightly trading veiled barbs and tacit agreements. All of the actual negotiating was in the realm of the implied, nothing said outright, as was only proper for the leaders of ninja. But those agreements were no less ironclad and enforceable as the most legalese-infused concords between daimyo. It was all fairly simple stuff to begin with, the usual trade agreements and non-operation pacts that were always ignored with the implicit understanding that the other side would ignore them too. The dialogue only took a turn when Naruto lightly slipped in the subject of former Mizukage and his prior. Status. Even you must admit that Kirigakure, despite their many accomplishments and well-deserved fame, are not well known for their fuinjutsu. Save, of course, what they plundered from Uzushio Gakur alongside Kumo and Iwa. But that was a different generation and Naruto held no grudge for the woman in front of him. Or perhaps, Hokage Dono, you raised the bar too high on yourself. Your family's predilection for the art is well known. Kiri has managed just fine in the past with Arjunchuriki. On that, they both knew, she was lying through her teeth. Although they were very dignified, pearly teeth, and the lie slithered through as opposed to being forced. The Jinchuriki of the Rakubi had been AWOL for years now, even before the Civil War, and Naruto had a stack of damage reports on his desk back home attesting to the freedom of the Sanbi. May seemed to catch on to this when Naruto made no move to push the subject. The Bijou have always been a delicate subject around here, especially given the status of our former leader. The may he rot in hell went unsaid in this case. I can assure you that stringent efforts are being made to keep the situation. Domestic. Naruto just smiled. I thought, in that regard, Konoha might be able to lend some aid. For hefty concession, I must imagine, may returned without missing a beat. The redhead just waved a hand airily. The Baiju are every nation's concerns, the damage they can wreak, even accidentally, is monstrous. There was something powerful in what went unspoken, the thought that Konoha might be willing to do an actual favor for another nation. Not the typical you owe me favor either. We would certainly consider such aid, May said after a lengthy pause, the biggest concession she had made to letting something genuine slip through her tightly controlled facade. As for now, I would be thrilled if you accepted Kirigakura's hospitality for the evening. I would personally recommend the sushi bar on the main street, perhaps we might even share a bite together sometime? Naruto knew it was still part of the game, 
that it wasn't really him and me speaking, but the Hokage and the Mizukage. How could I refuse? The subtleties only ended when they both stood, somehow leaving their personas in their chairs as they shared their first genuine appraisal of one another in those terse few moments. Finally, May cracked a smile, more genuine and ten times more radiant than anything the Mizukage could manage. I must say, you have played havoc with my expectations of you. The redhead nodded at the implied request. I feel we've said enough to call me Naruto. Naruto. She seemed to taste the word for the first time, apparently enjoying it by the smirk on her lips. Then I would be remiss if I didn't offer the same courtesy. The offer seemed a whole lot less layered than it did during the Chonin exams and Naruto felt a lot more comfortable accepting. Then I can say the same for you, May. It was as though a hundred unsaid things were passed between them in that moment, a mutual understanding, not so much between themselves as it was between leaders. We're both young leaders, her eyes flickered to the corner of the room where Naruto knew Ao had been hidden for the entirety of the negotiations, and we face mounting pressure on all sides. It is pleasant to know that there is a direction we might. Lean. Naruto didn't say anything, just extending his hand for a shake. The negotiations were far from over, but he felt the better part of the groundwork had been laid for something more solid. When she accepted his hand, a rare gesture in the world of Shinobi when there was the implicit understanding that they could probably kill one another with less contact, he allowed a few teeth to show in his smile. The sushi, was it? Naruto found himself rather fond of the accommodation he and his party had been put up in. He could barely see the thick white stone the building was made of through the various plush furnishings that gave the hotel room a soft, comfortable atmosphere. He didn't dwell on it long though before doing the mandatory check for surveillance seals and any listeners in. He found a few, but that was to be expected as a foreign dignitary. They became redundant all the same when he placed down a pre-prepared seal that mimicked the one permanently set in the Hokaye's office. A clever construction of the Nidime, it didn't so much block sounds leaving the room, as it did distort them. Likewise, it made any images inside the confines of the room. Fuzzy, for lack of a better word. It was excellent for disguising hand signals for anybody who might be watching in. When he was sure he was secure for the moment he tossed a Hiraishin kunai into the center of the room. A moment later, and with a yellow flash that was almost nostalgic, four people appeared in the room. Three of them vanished almost as soon as they appeared, taking Byakuya with them and leaving a perfect doppelganger in his place. Komachi had been chosen to be dropped off by the Yondaime's old bodyguard because of her rather excellent hench, one of the best in Anbu. Rather nice place, isn't it? Naruto asked, just in case Kiri had some other method of listening in. The real conversation was happening in subtle hand signals. Status report. Doesn't quite compare to home, they can only hope to emulate the quiet dignity of the Hyuga compound. Target moving up the coast, 8 to 7 minutes. Yes, well, I imagine that familiarity would have the residents here say otherwise. Good, rendezvous with surveillance team and await further instruction. Komachi sniffed haughtily, and if Naruto didn't know any better, he would have said she was enjoying the ruse. They can believe what they like I suppose, just because they've finally wrapped up that barbaric civil war, doesn't mean they can start pretending otherwise. Orders understood, additional note, possible code sunrise. Naruto had to quickly suppress a frown, Akatsuki could be trouble. By all their intelligence it was too early for them to be making a move, had something changed? We're the guests here, and I have to admit, the place has its own charm. Continue as normal, do not engage, dismissed. Komachi sniffed again, imitating the typical Hyuga pride with practiced ease. Before she could even lower her nose she was gone and replaced again by the real Byakuya. You should see to your own room Byakuya, I intend to sample Kiri's hospitality for at least the night. The real Hayuga nodded imperceptibly, acknowledging the true order to scout the area as much as possible. Of course, Hokage-sama. Alone again, Naruto walked over to a nearby window, hiding his thoughts behind a veneer of curiosity at the mist-swept panorama that sprawled out beneath him. It was a wonderful view, but the young Hokage had little time to appreciate it as he considered the new information. The fact that the Akatsuki might interfere was concerning. Naruto wasn't afraid of them, especially since dealing with Kisame, but in that instance he could count on Itachi staying out of the fight. 2S class missing Nin would be a tougher pill to swallow, especially if it was the pair who had tried to kidnap Fu. Still, if things went according to plan. He was only made to wait 10 minutes before there was a knock at the door. He wasn't surprised, he had thought they would send somebody to check up on him after whatever surveillance system they had failed. What was surprising, was finding the Mizukage herself outside his door, 
looking a great deal less official without her wide-brimmed hat. How are you finding the accommodation? It wasn't hard to switch out the surprise on his face with bemusement, the small breach in protocol was promising. Pleasant, if missing the comforts of home. May somehow made her amusement as sultry as if she had simply walked into the room already shedding her clothes. Oh, I can imagine, from what I've heard you're quite the family man. Technically news of Anko's pregnancy wasn't supposed to leave the village, but it would be naive to expect the other cage not to know something like that. The fact that May chose to bring it up though, it was acknowledging that aspect of their game was shelved. I was particularly interested in the seals on the windows, I assumed to keep them water repellent? He wasn't, he knew they were likely spoils from the fall of Ozushio Gakur, but he was keen to switch topics. Shouldn't I be the one asking you? One of the youngest seal masters in history is certainly one of your more impressive titles. The redhead's lips quirked. Seals? Seals were comfortable. Seals he could talk about for hours. The funny thing about Fuenjutsu, is that no matter how much you think you know, there's always more. Not unlike any field of study then. May added, pouring herself a drink from the decanter that had been left in the room. Naruto had yet to touch it, probably wouldn't have if she wasn't demonstrating its safety, another calculated show of trust. The woman was clearly working towards something. Unfortunately, Fuenjutsu has always been a limited aspect of Kiri's past, in favor of more martial pursuits. And the difficulty of the last few years has only worsened the situation. So that was how she was choosing to phrase the civil war, a difficulty. In other words, tacitly stating their weakness without suggesting the village had lost its bite. I'm sure what we may call seal masters would barely register as dabblers in the art to somebody like you. He could tell she was skirting around the subject and decided to push it a little. A metaphorical deficit in supply then? That seemed to stall the older woman for a moment but she caught herself brilliantly, giving a noncommittal wave. Perhaps more of an over-demand, for the moment. Well then, I would be a poor leader if I didn't point out that Konoha might be in a position to weigh in on the matter. Oh, they would then? How very. Forward. May pushed her chest out slightly, but it was mostly empty play, she had clearly given up on trying to use that approach in her negotiations. And what would be your counter-offer in this metaphorical matter? Well, on something as nebulous as Fuenjutsu that could vary a great deal, but that's what negotiations are for. Unless the matter was time-sensitive. He could almost see the woman's eyes harden slightly, some of the pretense slipping away as he made his position as clear as could be in the silky trappings of shinobi talk. If you choose to go this way, a high price will be exacted. May moved back, gliding across the room to lean against a nearby armrest, she made a show of examining the room as she considered it. Naruto chose that moment to drop in the caveat. Of course, Konoha has always been kind to her allies, the leaf is eager to forge closer ties with those she calls friend. His meaning was once again crystal clear. There might be a steep price, but you need friends, and Konoha is the best you could make. He could see the gears grinding away behind those pale green eyes. He couldn't predict the outcome as he still hadn't made a proper read on the wily Mizukage. He could however, bank on what he did know. Kirigakura was recovering, and by the looks of it undergoing extensive remodeling in the wake of their recent difficulty. It also looked as though May had chosen Konoha as the image to rebuild her village in. If the ideology ran stronger than a simple strategic move, there was something to work with there. Eventually he could see she had come to a decision. Would you care to take a walk with me Naruto? Naruto recognized that look all too well, and for the first time realized that he wasn't the only leader who agonized over their decisions, even after they were made. It depends if we're walking towards a certain Baijuu. If May was surprised by the bluntness of his question she didn't let it slip, apparently resigning herself to her choice as she set her shoulders and gave a coy smile. Must you ruin the surprise? The efficiency with which the small coastal village had been evacuated was commendable, clearly it wasn't just the shinobi of Mizu no Kuni that had gotten good at dealing with sudden attacks during the civil war. It was a good thing too, even from the steep rise a few hundred meters from the village wall Naruto could see the damage was extensive. Most of the buildings and structures near the water were little better than kindling, the rest had been compromised by the flood waters reducing the soil to a soupy muck. What dominated the vista though, was the enormous creature thrashing wildly just off the shore. Currently it was being harried by a group of Kiri Nin, if harried was even the right word. Mildly irritated might have done the scene better justice as water jutsu that would have easily drilled through solid rock splashed harmlessly against the Sanbi's enormous shell. Simply turning in place caused great swells of water that threatened to level the rest of the increasingly sorry-looking village. Quite a sight, 
Naruto muttered, already repressing images of a different night 15 years ago. The Sanbi couldn't compare to the sheer malice or suffocating power of the QB, but it was still a Baijuu. One I'd hoped never to witness again if I'm allowed a rare moment of honesty, May admitted, reminding Naruto that she had been the one to take down Yagura and had likely faced this beast before. His respect of her abilities as a kunoichi rose a few notches. Any advice before we start? May just motioned to the ongoing fight that was happening below, pointing out a Kiri Anbu that had been slapped aside by one of the beast's great scaled tails and sent skidding across the water like some overlarge skipping stone. Mind the tails. Naruto allowed him one last grin at the flippancy she could manage in the face of such overwhelming power before setting his face into what Emi had taken to calling Hokage mode. He threw a Horishin kunai into the dirt at his feet and in three quick flashes a small team of Anbu had been dropped off in front of them. His father had been onto something when he granted a select few people the ability to perform the Horishin as a group. He would have to think on refining the process later, for now. Taka, North. Buta, East. Saru, West. Inu, South. He handed them each a large scroll twice the size of the normal ceiling variety. Set up and begin connecting. Don't attempt to complete the seal until I've set the foci. When he received four professional nods he waved them off, quickly pulsing his chakra to signal another drop-off. Instantly, Tenzo was in front of him and Naruto could practically feel the grimace beneath the man's mask. You know what to do, herd, don't restrain. Asking the fledgling Makutan user to restrain the three tails would have been a bit much, but the man could certainly keep it in place long enough for the others to get in position. He seemed to shore himself up a bit before nodding and flickering off to join the others. Naruto glanced across at Mei only to find the woman staring at him with a calculating gaze. It's almost as though you had planned for this Hokage Dono. The redhead shrugged, his mind was already half taken up by the various on-the-fly calculations he was making. It pays to be prepared in our profession, and as I said, the Baijuu are every nation's concern. Mei simply hummed, glancing back down to where the Konoha Anbu were beginning to take up their positions amongst their missed counterparts. I will inform my shinobi not to interfere and protect your men if possible. You understand if I won't have them throw away their lives though. I wouldn't ask the same, Naruto acknowledged, running through a few lightning quick hand seals. A moment later an enormous scroll, perhaps a little smaller than a summoning contract, appeared in his hands. He slung it over his back, it was the keystone of this entire operation and carefully measured his shot before throwing a single kunai as hard as he could towards the beast. Dropping his mask for a single instant, long enough to wink at the Mizukage, he said, see you on the other side, before vanishing in a flash of red. What a curious man, Mei mused before dashing off at her own pace. Haranbu would need all the help they could get keeping the Sanbi in one position. She knew from experience. Komachi cursed her luck as she faced down the fury-filled glare of the Sanbi. The enormous beast seemed to have taken a rather personal interest in crushing her flat as it once again flailed its tails. It didn't help that every turn of its body caused the water to roil and bubble as waves bigger than she was attempted to fling her back onto land. All of this might have been manageable if it didn't also feel like her lungs had been filled with boiling lead and her arms weighed down by anchors. The Baiju's presence was just oppressive, no easier way to say it. Its hatred was like a physical waves that radiated out and rolled over her in thick, hot pulses that threatened to have her legs turn and run with no input from her brain. All of this, and she had to focus on the complicated seal floating on the water in front of her, because if she didn't all of this would have been for nothing. Her only solace was that the other three Anbu across the cardinal directions were also feeling this and they hadn't wavered either. She caught a red flash appearing way up on the sandbeast shell and felt a little of that smothering malice lift as the Baijuu refocused on the new nuisance riding it like the world's largest rodeo. Komachi could almost smile behind her mask as she saw her Hokage give her a cheeky wave from atop the beast before hastily rolling to the side to avoid one of its great chitinous tails. She knew he would be busy for the next few moment placing the anchor seals that would ensure all of this worked. How he could stand to be that close to the beast was beyond her, the fact it looked as though he was having a great time ducking and weaving across its shell was mind-boggling. Cage were crazy, a lot of them. And as if to prove her right the Mizukage suddenly slammed into the side of the beast like a meteor shrouded in a pale mist that caused the Baijuu to give a deafening shriek of pain and anger. The Anbu, Kiri and Konoha alike, could only watch in and wonder as the mist visibly ate into the shell that their most powerful jutsu could barely scratch. Not to be outdone and ever the competitive spirit, Naruto chose the moment when the Sanbi focused all of its attention on Mei and made it regret it. He suddenly appeared before the creature's face holding a Rasengan bigger than its eye before flashing away, 
there for less time than it took to blink. The moment the jutsu was bereft of its creator, it expanded rapidly, engulfing the beast's head in a shrieking, grinding sphere of chaotic energy that saw its bulky tails fall limp behind it, stunned. Naruto chose that moment to appear beside her, nearly causing her to lose focus. She should have gotten used to such displays back in Anbu, but it was easier said than done. The anchors are set, get ready to begin the sealing, he said, face stony but with a spark of adrenaline alight behind his eyes. I think the Mizukage will help me keep it distracted, but I'm not counting on it. I'm going to relay the others to start closing the trap, so things are about to get rough, boo. She never got to hear what he would say next as he suddenly threw himself in front of her, taking the brunt of an explosion that appeared out of nowhere. When the tinny whine in her ears finally subsided, the Anbu masks helped in that regard, it was replaced by the beating of enormous wings. Don't get what all the fuss is about, he wasn't that tough. You sure that was the same guy who took out Kisame? She peered up through the clearing smoke at the two silhouettes bickering atop an enormous white bird, one tall and lanky, the other squat and hunched over. Both wearing the recognizable red clouds of the Akatsuki. Don't be so complacent, he may have been young but he is a Hokage nonetheless. Your worthless art won't have taken him out of the fight so easily and we still have a job to do here. Komachi tried not to panic. The Anbu had been briefed about the Akatsuki and their known or suspected members. Yeah, yeah, time is money and all that, it's a good thing my art works just as well in a flash. Then again, she never thought she might be facing any of them, especially ones that could catch Naruto off guard. That's Kakuzu you fool. I simply don't wish to keep leader Sama waiting. So hurry up and deal with the trash while I see to the beast. The Anbu took a calming breath, resigning herself to what would likely be a last stand making sure the ceiling went uninterrupted. She let it out as a sigh of relief when somebody else stepped up in front of her. I'm afraid you have more pressing concerns Akasuna no Sasori, May stated calmly, her voice carrying above the violent waves and the pained roars of the sand bee, and. The woman turned slowly to the lanky blonde whoever you are. Komachi wondered if it was a trait all cage shared to make their subordinates feel just as safe and secure as if they were back home in a training field. She almost wanted to grin at the irritated expression the other S-class Nukenin wore as he stomped his foot angrily atop the strange, lumpy bird. It's Datara, yeah? Learn it, you sorry excuse for a Mizukage. I want to introduce this one to my art, Sasori Dana. The hunched-over missing Nin grunted irritably, saying, You have your orders, go. I'll deal with the woman before hopping down off the bird to stand across from the Mizukage on the turbulent waters. Datara clearly looked pained for a moment before scowling and directing the bird to fly off in the direction of the other Anbu. Komachi wondered what she was supposed to do, she was right next to a potential fight between S ranks, her teammates were in trouble from another and they were all still in the middle of a Baiju ceiling. And where the hell was Naruto? <laughs>